All right, so this stream is going to be starting on my bank alt in Stormwind, as so many of them do. And this time, I thankfully don't have a ton of prep work that I need to do, partially because I finished the rogue speedrun a little while ago. The outlaw speedrun, that is, relatively recently. And a lot of the stuff from that run is going to be pretty transferable, so I'm not going to have to dig too deep to get all that prepped. Hey, Kuan, good to see you. Uh, one thing I am going to get done really quickly before I forget is I don't know if I actually have dagger heirlooms, at least ones that have elemental force. So I'm going to double check that. I think I have like... A dagger heirloom with life stealing that I used to use a very, very, very long time ago. But I don't actually think I have any. Because, I mean, these days, the only specs that use daggers are assassination and sub. So. Um. Actually, I don't even have my old life stealing dagger anymore. So I will get that put together real quick. Hello, Kent W. Good to see you. And did I mail over my... I did mail over my leather stuff. Perfect. All in one easy-to-find place for the heirlooms. It's the nice thing about being organized. And let me quickly double-check the stat priority that I want for assassination. I've already figured out my talents and stuff. I've kind of... I did that a while ago for both sub and um, assassination. Just, like, figuring it out ahead of time, because I wanted to see, is there enough interesting stuff there to justify doing a speedrun? And I decided there was, which is why Assassination got its own run in the first place. So it looks like Assassination Rogues want primarily Mastery, and then Crit Over Haste. So anything Mastery that I can get would be good. Crit Over Haste for that. And, okay, yeah, so Droid Pirate Ring with Mastery, and then I would want one of these rings with Mastery, either one works, and it would need to have another Mastery enchant on it. Because whenever Mastery is the top stat that your spec wants, generally speaking, you just want to get as much of it as possible, because it's the one that you really are never going to find on Heirlooms. There's, like, a tiny bit of crit, or a, a, a tiny bit of verse on Heirlooms in some cases. Almost all of them are crit haste. Makes sense. And yeah, in that case, uh, see, having a tiny, tiny bit of verse is never a terrible idea, just because, you know, you want a balanced amount of stats. Presumably, yeah, that should be fine, especially because I can't get, like, any mastery. This is haste, which I mostly want crit. Right? I think I'll just go with this one, actually, getting crit haste. And I'll get, like, a tiny bit of verse off, like, random greens or something, most likely. There's inevitably going to be some item that I buy with a socket that has verse on it, and that's probably going to be better than whatever I have. Okay, so I think that's everything as far as armor goes, or at least enchanted armor, etc. Uh, now I just need the daggers. And so I send this over to... Uh, character. This would be the bank character. And then I think I have some alt somewhere that I do enchants with. Um, forget which one I've been using. Was it this one? Let me double check. Uh, Nick Altjel said, Greetings from Ecuador. Frustrated new player, um, but you love the WoW experience coming through my videos. Keep them coming. I'm glad you enjoy them. Okay, yeah, no, this is not the character then that I was using. I guess I can since it's already by a mailbox, so I'll just send over some gold. Because you need to have, like, a low-level character to apply, to apply enchants and stuff like that. Um, okay, so obviously I'm gonna try to get setup stuff done as quickly as possible. Generally, I'd like to... Oh, there's new Blizzard blog posts. Cool. I'll have to read that later. Um, 
generally speaking, I like to get through this just really quickly, get onto the meat of the run. But, you know, it's something we've got to do. Uh, that said, uh, fairly recent information that is kind of interesting, or at least I just heard about it recently from the Wowhead post. There is a new expansion leak. And this one I actually pretty firmly believe. So if you go to Wowhead, I mean, you don't have to look at it if you don't want to. But if you go there, there is information of a new expansion leak that got posted through multiple sources, but mostly on Reddit. And I want to be honest, I've seen a lot of copium of, well, if you look at XYZ thing, you can clearly see that this is actually a fake leak. It's a real leak. Like, they, I, all I'll say is if that is not a fake leak, then I am fucking scared for the future of AI. Because there are two possibilities. One, that is a very obvious fake leak. Or two, AI, like, art generation is so much further along than I ever thought it was. Because that is so believable that I am sold. I am convinced. I'm like, yeah, that is 100% the next expansion. If it is not, I will be genuinely shocked because that that is like next level and like people are looking for the strangest reasons i think that is the thing that i found the most funny about it the people looking for reasons as to why it's actually not the new expansion and why if you like carefully look clearly the reason why these pylons in the background are designed that way is because they base their leak off a you know, tweet that Blizzard put out showing them constructing uh, decor for, like, the World of Warcraft BlizzCon displays. And it's like, yeah, okay. So it's a fake leak because it matches decor the WoW team is building, and that demonstrates that the leaker decided to subtly put an art asset in the background that mimics something that Blizzard is actually doing. That is, like, the most... I, I, I don't even know, but that is an actual thing that people are saying. That it, I'm just like, how how are you that dumb? Like, no. I just admit that it's real. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I actually I think I kind of want crit daggers. Because I've already gotten a decent amount of haste, and I don't want it quite as much as I want to stack crit. And actually, yeah, I'm just going to go upgrade those heirloom daggers. Why not? Usually, I don't upgrade... Um, probably be easier to get there in my month. I usually don't upgrade heirlooms like that I rarely use just for the sake of it. But if there is an heirloom that I think is even remotely useful, I might as well upgrade it. It's nice to, you know, have the collection built up. But it's there are certain things where I don't even remember I I some for some reason I went to Ardenweald last night. I put this on my bars, I teleported to Ardenweald, I forgot why I was here, and then I passed out. <laughs> I genuinely don't remember why I came here. Uh, but anyways. Can dollar on hearth. Uh, hello all fellow rogue players. Hello Umbral Corvus, I hope you enjoy watching the rogue run. Wait, there's a memory leak? Huh? Kent W, I think you're baiting me. I don't see anything wrong. Uh, was there, yeah, and if there was a memory leak, then it should have, um, fixed itself. Or it wouldn't have fixed itself, I mean. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, if there is, and other people are, like, having issues with the audio, please let me know. But I'm seeing nothing on my end. And every time there is an actual memory leak, I can very clearly see. Am I gonna run time walking? No. Um, this run is going to be 100% on the PTR. So... What I'm actually going to be doing here, my voice was dropping. Was it like dropping mid-sentence or was it like me cutting out while I was like laughing or something? I might have been like stopping, pausing for effect. I, I have no idea. I don't think it was actually cutting out though. Unless anybody else was running into the issue. Could have just been like um, actual lag on the side of YouTube. Your voice and audio is great? Okay. Yeah, it could have just been YouTube then, right? Like, I, I believe you, Ken W, that you ran into that issue, but I 
don't think it was on my end. So if anything, it was just a server connection issue on YouTube's part, which, you know, happens. Unfortunately, that I have literally zero control over. Okay, so this is upgrade level one out of six. So I would need to fully upgrade it. Yeah, like, for instance, I see absolutely no reason to ever um, upgrade, like, Venerable Mass McGowan. Because any spec that can use this thing can use... I, I'm pretty sure there is no spec in the game that can use maces, but cannot use fist weapons or something like swords or whatever. And I have the fist weapons for agility, and I have um, whatever that other sword is, like the strength one-hand sword. I'm pretty sure... Yeah, actually, well, this one is just agility. Yeah. Pretty sure every single spec that can use this can also use this. So. Uh, no reason to, to do this one. Uh, what is my favorite class? Overall, probably monk. I think I would say monk. Um... Mostly just because I really enjoy both Windwalker and Brewmaster. I think they're both very fun. Though, Demon Hunter is definitely a close second. That said, I, I don't know. It's like, I, I enjoy Havoc. I just... Havoc at a high level, I don't enjoy quite as much. Havoc is, like, really fun. I really do... I really like doing leveling runs as a Havoc Demon Hunter. Havoc, when you're just kind of, like, pressing buttons and, like, blasting through mobs, is actually really fun to play. Havoc, when you're trying to, like, min-max its damage... At like, you know, in raids and shit like that. That's when I stop really enjoying Havoc. I don't really think it is a very interesting playstyle for like maximum damage optimization at endgame. Uh, Windwalker, though, I really enjoy the playstyle, both while leveling and at endgame. I really like the whole like you alternate your abilities and it feels really involved, but in like an intuitive way. So I've always quite enjoyed Windwalker as a damage dealer. Uh, okay, so what am I doing here? I need to upgrade it all the way. Which means I need to buy this, this, this. I think I have enough gold on this character. Oh yeah, I have plenty on this character. Definitely fully upgrading one weapon is kind of expensive, but... That item is not a valid target. What do you mean? Does it start at like zero out of something? I guess maybe... Is it... I think I've already used this particular upgrade. Because at some point I already went through all of these. So then I could just refund it. You do think the Havoc rework helps with that? Yeah. I mean, I'm sure it probably does. Though keep in mind, I mean... I, I don't hate Havoc, right? Like, I should also say... I, I'm talking about comparing which one is my favorite class. When I say I don't think the Havoc rotation at Endgame is super fun, I more mean relative to, like, some of the other DPS specs that I do really enjoy, like Windwalker. But it's still good. I do not hate Havoc at all. Like, if I need to play Havoc for, like, a Mythic Plus key or something, I don't mind it. If I... Like, the few times when I have actually had to do raids and stuff as Havoc for an extended period of time, I've not enjoyed it a ton. But playing Havoc every now and then, it, it's not the worst thing in the world. Whereas there are certain specs that I just, I hate at Endgame. Their rotation just bores me to tears. Mostly casters, I'm just... Um... Okay. Look, I, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna say no, no politics like that. Uh... Yeah, that, that's a little bit weird to put in a World of Warcraft stream. I, I don't want that shit here. Especially really, really, really like divisive subjects at the moment. Just please, let's let's not do that. That's just a little bit weird to just randomly throw into a, the chat of a World of Warcraft stream. So you're not banned, but I, I timed you out. Because that, yeah, that's just odd. Uh, okay, there we go. Um... I think, uh, yeah, I think that that fixed it. Either way, uh, let me just go ahead and get these two daggers enchanted. You're in a giant steel building, Faraday cage problems. Ah, I see. Um, and then, yeah, so what I was going to say for the run itself. Um, this run is going to be 100% on the PTR. So I'm not going to do dungeons. I'm not going to do uh, time walking, obviously. 
it's just going to be purely on the PTR. I thought about doing uh, like a a 50-50 split, kind of what I did with Outlaw. But honestly, I think just starting it purely on the PTR is better for these types of runs. In fact, honestly, I kind of wish I had done that before with Outlaw. The main reason why I didn't really care is because I did a little bit of Outlaw leveling in the past. So I've already showcased generally like low-level Outlaw play uh, a few times now. And I don't think it would have meaningfully changed anything, especially because I did look ahead. And the one thing that I regret is I missed that Roll the Bones became baseline. So I looked ahead at Outlaw talent builds, and I'm like, yeah, at low levels, the talents don't really change a whole lot. There is like some slightly improved pathing stuff, but for the most part, it's exactly the same. Oh, I already bought Elemental Force. I can just apply it. Cool. Uh, there's some very mildly improved low-level pathing things. Uh, honestly, Outlaw as a whole, I don't think got that much significantly better, aside from, like, Roll the Bones being baseline. But that is one thing I did miss before I started the run. So I think in hindsight, at least showing how to use Roll the Bones at a low level could have helped. You know, it's whatever. Like I said, I don't really think it takes away from the run at all. I don't really think it meaningfully changes anything. But... Definitely going forward for those types of runs, I'm just like, yeah, I'm doing them 100% on the PTR, especially because Assassination does have a handful of things I noticed at low levels that I um, think is worth discussing. In fact, since this character actually is a rogue, purely coincidence, this is literally a random ass, you know, uh, actually name placeholder character, and I'm just using it to enchant low level heirlooms. But there's a lot of like, weird stuff in the talent tree early on that you're forced to take and like i'm pretty sure shadow step isn't even in this uh talent tree i'm pretty sure it's in the rogue tree let me double check that because i was looking at all this earlier but i just want to make sure i'm not I, I can actually have it side by side at least in my other window to directly talk about that um assassination 10.2 ptr yeah shadow steps not even on here and while Shadow Step isn't bad, having to, like, take a mobility thing to path into other options, the assassination tree feels significantly better on the PTR um, than it does on live servers, which is, like I said, one of the reasons why I felt it was worth doing this, uh, this run from 10 to 60 in the first place. There are a few things, like, I wish Improved Shiv was... Like, not where it is. It still is here on the PTR. It's not a bad ability, but while leveling, you just really don't get a ton of use out of this. Because while later on, when you get stuff like Poison Bomb, your nature damage is going to be much stronger at higher levels. But at low levels, you don't really have access to a lot of that. A lot of your damage is going to be like instant physical stuff. So... This just kind of does nothing for a huge portion of the leveling process. So putting it up here is a little bit weird. Not a huge deal, like I said, but it is a weird little pathing thing. And then there's just some other, like, better improved options that really make a low-level assassination feel a lot better, I think. And the midsection of the tree especially has gotten cleaned up. The bottom section, I think, is even better uh, one of the issues with the bottom section, I might as well talk about this now while I'm talking about it. Uh, I'll kind of discuss my builds when I hop into the PTR and you can actually see the new talents. But I'll be picking up Crimson Tempest fairly early on. And anything that's like Fan of Knives synergy related, I'll grab that. I'm mostly going for like Garrote and Fan of Knives stuff. And then after I've picked up all those major like uh, like modifiers for those two abilities... I'm going to be grabbing poison stuff, because instant damage, especially when you get later synergies like Poison Bomb, are very good. The thing is, on the actual talent tree right now, the two big things that you want to take is Indiscriminate Carnage and Poison Bomb. These two talents in your capstone area are very strong. You can only pick really one of them while leveling up here. Uh, one thing that you'll notice on the PTR when we hop over, the pathing is so much better. The bottom section of the tree for Assassination is leagues better now than it or in the next patch than it is right now in live servers you can take 
Poison Bomb, it, I think you go Shrouded Suffocation. And yeah, it's Shrouded Suffocation, paths into Poison Bomb. There's like a line and it goes down here. And then Indiscriminate Carnage is like connected to Poison Bomb directly. So you can just go boom, boom. And it's also connected to Kingsbane, which I don't... Yeah, Kingsbane is still down here. But you don't even need to take any of the other crap. Um, like right now, you need to take this ability and Venom increases your critical... It, this is not very good for level like this does nothing for you you don't need to take that you can go straight from shrouded suffocation poison bomb indiscriminate carnage which has now been changed now instead of an activatable ability it's when you break stealth and for 10 seconds after breaking stealth it applies up to multiple targets so now you can get multiple uh, aoe groats and it's uh you're able to do it like pretty easily with anything that lets you enter stealth uh which is very 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 nice i don't know if it's going to be worth taking shadow dance just because of those synergies hard to say i probably won't be doing that in this run and i don't know enough about like the next patch theory crafting to really comment on that but what i can say is for leveling the bottom section of the tree you get all of the capstones you want not a single point is wasted which is not the case for the current version you see right here so that is one thing where outlaw didn't benefit a ton i think i talked about that where there were the outlaw changes well I'm sure perfectly fine for max level. You know, the I've heard a lot of very happy outlaw rogues at max level are really, really excited about those. Okay. Um, yeah, let's... Uh, this is definitely a weird... Um, a weird approach honestly it's it's better than people spamming the n-word but it's yeah sorry the one of course right as i tab out um this people being fucking weird uh but yeah overall much happier the rogue tree nothing really changes uh compared to the outlaw run basically all of the same changes that benefited uh outlaw rogue that we talked about in that run you're gonna see the exact same builds uh, the only thing is, the stealth changes, ironically, don't benefit Assassination quite as much as they did Outlaw, because we're actually going to be going Echoing Reprimand and not um, not Shadow Dance early on. But, who knows. Uh, overall, I'm, I like the Assassination changes. That is why I decided to do this round in the first place. Anyways, um, talked about that. Now we can actually start getting the items prepped uh and yeah kuan I, I i'm i'm definitely considering that it hasn't been something that i've had to really think about in the past thankfully but i i might add mods or something um this one is especially weird but uh yeah i i i just don't know what's going on right now you're glad they don't post dick pics I guess. I, I mean, it's yeah. Like, I I don't know why recently there's been like a surge of people like joining in and spamming chat. It's been kind of a, a steady, consistent thing where it, it may not happen every single stream, but it happens like at this point almost every other stream where just there's people who join in and spam weird shit in chat. Uh, uh, like I said, this to me is much better than spamming the N-word, I guess. Um, because, I, I don't know, I, I guess I think the reason why they're going with... Um, like, There's definitely some weird messages here. The reason why they're, they're going with some of this stuff is like, obviously... Free Hong Kong is not a controversial topic, right? So it's definitely a little bit like I, I guess the hope there is like ah well if he if he tries to like you know time out somebody spamming Free Hong Kong it looks like he's supporting China like no fuck China right China obviously sucks but I don't want people spamming Free Hong Kong in a World of Warcraft stream it's just weird right like I said it, it's just a, a weird thing to do uh, so. Just especially, you know, if somebody, 
like completely like unrelated said that that was something that they were passionate about i would be like hey i get that but like you know please don't spam that in chat but the fact that it's completely unprompted clearly shows it's meant to be like a bait thing which i don't know why but yeah it's put yeah I, what i was saying is people are, uh, are are spamming political shit in chat for whatever reason you want to roll Volpera so badly, but you don't know what class. A uh, lot of good options, honestly. Speedy Gonzalez Assassination Rogue. Yeah, I think, honestly, Rogue for Volpera is definitely a good option. I When I was thinking about what to uh, what race to make this, Volpera was the no-brainer pick for Horde. I was basically thinking uh, either Volpera or Dark Iron, which ironically is the... Um, like the typical speed run race setup but i actually just think as far as a lot of the allied races go it fits much better than the others like when i think what alliance allied race void elf i guess would work well it's just i've used void elf a lot but i did consider dark iron dwarf because when i think like assassination rogue the the first image that came to my head when i was considering it is the hearthstone rogue card dark i think it's dark iron skulker where it's like the four mana four three that does like two to all undamaged minions and like dark iron just fits so well for rogues but because i've done a lot of uh alliance speedruns recently i did a dark iron dwarf speedrun even within that somewhat recently i figured horde hasn't gotten too much of a spotlight at least lately and it's been actually quite a while since I've done a Volpera speedrun. I can't remember what the last one was. I think it was the Hunter speedruns. I think those were Volpera. But that was like a month, two months ago? Or something like that? So, figured it was about time for that. Um... Volpera Monk or Enhancement Shaman? Uh... I feel like Shaman is probably the more iconic option, but I definitely like Volpera Monk. I see a lot of Volpera Shaman, and they actually have, like, cool totems and stuff, so, like, you can't go wrong with either. Uh, what do I want for... Hyper Augment Rune... Why can't I... There we go. Throw that there. Uh, what do I need for buffs? I guess buffs I need fort and attack power. Because I've had I've so many like leftover items from recent speedruns, I don't need to go digging my bank. I have like everything already set up. It's actually really nice. Good change of pace. Volpera Monk, tiny ineffectual fist. I mean, hey, Volpera Monk has a soft spot in my heart because I've done at least one world record speedrun with them. In fact, I think my Volpera Monk run is actually still my fastest Horde 10 to 60 time. Because a lot of the serious speedruns that I've done recently have been Alliance. For good reason, they get a bigger war mode buff. And especially with the recent, or I say recent, with the Dragonflight routing changes, the fact that the Alliance like 10 to 30 process is no longer significantly slower than the Horde, and it's actually, like, I would say about as fast now. Just means that, in many ways, Alliance are just 5% faster. It used to be that, like, Horde ended up beating out Alliance because they had a much more streamlined start in Silver Pine Forest. And if you're not doing dungeons, that's still the case. But dungeons really help smooth out that, like, rocky early section for, um, for Alliance players where, like, things aren't super efficient. And no Darkmoon Fair at the moment, so I don't need to worry about getting those items over. You wish Volpera was actually good for Shaman in terms of damage? Well, yeah, I guess that is an important disclaimer. Well, I actually think Volpera are cool as a race, like, visually and stuff. I do think it is important to note, uh, in, also, they are very good for speedrunning, which is why you'll see me use them a lot. They are, generally speaking, one of the worst races in the game, if not the worst race in the game, when it comes to actual like racial potential stuff like that um oh zach actually became a member i i yeah i guess i never really thought about that but like you've been a mod for a while 
but you're never actually a member. But thank you, Zach. I appreciate that. And now I see what you mean about like you changed your um your profile picture away from Dick Cheney. Which, you know, it's good. I'm guessing is that your cat? But uh I, I don't think I've ever seen that cat. But either way, I, I like the Dick Cheney profile picture, I'll admit. Mod on duty, everyone behave now, yeah. It looks like the stuff earlier, at least I hope, was just an isolated incident, but who knows. Maybe they come back, in which case it is definitely nice to have. Uh, oh yeah, so, real quick, no chance to behave your riding. Uh, I actually found new speedrun tech, which I'm surprised uh, I nobody's ever mentioned to me before. This is, it's very niche, but specifically in Dragonflight, this only works in Dragonflight zone, so actually if I use it here, says you're in the wrong zone. I'll demonstrate it in Dragonflight zones later, but I'm putting it here just to remind myself. But you can see here, uh, increases movement speed by 200% for 10 seconds, and then reduces movement speed by 90% for 10 seconds. That's Pop-Tart? Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I don't think I've, I've ever seen pictures of that cat. Um, but yeah, so this is... I, I don't know for sure if I'll be able to route this in, but I can think of a few cases where, as an emergency backup thing, like, especially indoors, there are definitely places where I can make use of this. In theory, the speed penalty is actually very significant. Because it's like, you're moving at double speed, but then you're moving 90% slower. That is not proportional, like, at all. So, this is specifically good in cases where you... Can't use, obviously, dragon riding, because it's only in dragon flight zones. Um, you can't use it, or you can't use gun shoes for whatever reason, because if you can use gun shoes, they're just better. And you won't need to move after using it. So, in I think the only situation where you really want this is indoors, because you can't use gun shoes indoors, and... You don't have, like, any other mobility options, and as soon as it's over, there will be some thing that will force you to stand still for, like, a longer period of time or something. And admittedly, that is a very rigid set of circumstances, so I'm not entirely sure if I can find somewhere to route this in. I've been, like, trying to think about it. It's like, unfortunately, there actually would have been one or two good cases to route this in with the Thaldrazis quest line. Alas, that has been nerfed. So, I don't know for sure if you can find anywhere to route this in, but something to consider. I don't know, though. It, it's definitely an interesting item. It's just unfortunate that it doesn't work outside of Dragonflight. If this worked outside of Dragonflight, there's like so many use cases at low levels where I could see this being nice, but yeah, is what it is. Uh, I did think it was worth mentioning though, because I found out about it the other day for the first time, and I was like, how has nobody mentioned this to me before? Because usually there's like a lot of those niche items, people will bring it up to me and be like, hey, do you think this has potential in a speedrun? And I'll look into it, and generally it's like, eh, no, for XYZ reason, kind of like what I said, where here there's like a lot of downsides, it's probably not worth it, but it's nice to at least figure out. There's been a few different items like that. This one I literally found because I was going through random toys in my toy box that I hadn't collected, like from Dragonflight, because I've been kind of slacking on that lately. And I found there was one toy sold by the same vendor as that, and then I was like, oh, what else does this vendor sell? And I found this thing. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of neat. It's fine. Uh, it is, but if you're fighting something, seems fine. RP. Uh, does it reduce mounted speed? You could run at... Um, I don't think you can... I want to say you can't mount up while it's active. I could be wrong. But it's worth testing. That is true. If it doesn't reduce mounted speed, you could probably use it to run out of caves. I didn't test it extensively, especially because this speedrun isn't going to Dragonflight, and I literally just found out about this last night. This is like tech fresh hot off the presses. Like, I just learned that this thing exists, 
So I'm honestly still thinking about potential use cases for it. And hey, there might be ways to remove it. The one thing is things that remove slows don't cancel this. That was one of the first things I thought of. So Tiger's Lust, Blessing of Freedom, uh, Shifting in Druid form, none of that removes the slow. Uh, what enchants to use in daggers? Same thing as always, Elemental Force. Yeah, that's not a... It's not anything different. Uh, if I was doing dungeons, I might have grabbed life stealing, but I don't really think it's important. Life stealing, the uh, healing effect falls off pretty hard at uh, higher levels, so it's generally not worth getting unless you're doing dungeons. Is doing dungeons at lower levels, eh, you might get some value out of it, but yeah, paladin bubble I didn't test, so that is possible. Uh, the toy getting you out of Undercity. Yeah, the well, the Undercity one, that actually was a, a neat one. In fact, shit, uh, good point, Goose Comics. Thanks for reminding me. Um, I'm going to try to remember to use that. Because I will actually have a chance to test that within this run. So I probably would have forgotten if you had not brought that up again. Yeah, that was definitely... That was a good suggestion, though. That 100%, that one we can completely route in. Uh, Naomi said... You thought, oh, Harlden was going to stream today. You're probably super late, but you guess you're not. Yeah, I mean, I started about two hours late, but in the grand scheme of things, I don't think it was super late compared to how late I've normally started stream. And I did do a lot of the setup ahead of time. So the only thing I didn't do is I didn't get like the items uh, prepped in advance just because I usually like to leave a bit of time at the start of the stream for people to get here and getting the items set up is usually a good way to do that. Um, let's check. Rogue for heirlooms. I'll need to actually get that. We can't do anything special for that. Um, oh, fuck, I'm missing Minari training amulet. That's uh, something I forgot to mail over. That one should be pretty easy to go grab off one of my characters, though. And then Elemental Confluence. I think that's the only heirloom I'm missing, come to think of it. Because I have rings, I have weapons, cape, shoulders, pants, chest. In fact, let me just get open my shopping list. Um, Google. I recently cleared my, um, my cookies, and now whenever I type leveling shopping list, it doesn't immediately pop up. There we go. Now, weapons, rings, cloak, neck, shoulders, chest, pants... And then Helm and Trinkets. Yeah, so I'm missing one Enchanted Minari Training Amulet, which pretty sure if I just go to my Warrior, because I didn't clean this character up at all. So if I go here, it's probably still wearing the one from last weekend's stream. Uh, is this set up for the Darkman Fair? Will you run again when that pops up? Um, this, obviously, Darkman Fair is not up currently. So at the time of recording, if anybody's watching this in the future, uh, not up. I... I thought about it. I'm going to do the sub-rogue run with Darkwind Fair. So, uh, actually, I think this is a good chance. I've pinned my streaming schedule in the stream chat for, like, the next few days. I'll be streaming every single day until Monday. And I guess this is probably a good chance to quickly go over that. So, obviously, today we're doing this. Later in the stream, I am actually going to be doing a fresh account playthrough of Warcraft Rumble which is the new mobile game that Blizzard is releasing. It is pay-to-win mi microtransaction garbage, and I'm going to show that. I'm going to show how it tries to do basically Diablo Immortal levels of bullshit to get your money. And eventually, I'm going to make a full review on that, because it's bad. And I'm tired of Blizzard trying to shove it down everybody's throats when it is just a garbage pay-to-win cesspool of the game. So that is later this stream. I'm going to be starting that. Then, just send this over. There we go. Actually, while I'm at it, while I'm on this character, I can just uh, get these heirlooms to the proper character. So, there. 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 Send mail to... Boon. All right, that taken care of. Somehow you like the honesty of the streamer. I, I appreciate that. I'd like to think that, yes, I am pretty blunt and honest about stuff like that. Um, 
but yeah, so here, let's grab this and then continue. Uh, yeah, so that is today. Tomorrow, I tomorrow, Saturday, and Sunday, those three days, those streams will be on Twitch. So my Twitch name is also Harlden, nothing special, so you can pretty easily search it, but it's also linked in the YouTube post that I've pinned in the chat. So those streams will be on Twitch. The reason is because they're not super serious streams. I talked about this before, but since I'm bringing it up again, and this is still relatively new, I'll just quickly go over that. The reason I've started streaming on Twitch is they are for things that I just wouldn't be doing on YouTube in general. So obviously, YouTube streams aren't going anywhere, but the YouTube streams are going to be for more structured things. Like, I am doing a leveling run, or I am testing Warcraft Rumble, you know, these are like set things that I have planned out, and that is the kind of thing that not only works for, I think, a more official YouTube stream, but also YouTube automatically turns that into a video automatically later on that will just go onto my channel for people to watch. And generally, I mean, it's better to have videos like that on my channel. Technically speaking, I could, you know, take a Twitch stream and, you know, make it into a video and then post it. But it's it's a little bit different the way stream recordings are handled and actual videos are handled. So those are the type of things that I will continue doing on YouTube. Same things I always have. But I've talked in the past how there's like a few things on YouTube where if I don't think it'll perform super well, I can't justify streaming it. Well, streaming it on Twitch solves that problem. It's kind of the best of both worlds. I can stream it, people who want to watch it can watch it, and it doesn't impact my, like, algorithm shit on YouTube whatsoever. It works exactly as it always would. Uh, Gabriel Keller became a member. Thank you very much for that. Um, always appreciate the support. Uh, but, yeah, so, Twitch stuff. Um, the way that, uh, or the, the plans that I have for this weekend, I'm trying to remember what I was talking about. Tomorrow, I'm going to be doing a few different things, actually. I'm going to start streaming probably a little bit early, like noon or so. And that will be for, like, the continuation of the Warcraft Rumble stuff. So, like, as I said, later on today, I'm going to be um, starting Warcraft Rumble. Obviously, it's going to take more than just the few hours left over at the end of the stream. So that will be picked up again on Friday on Twitch. Then at 4 p.m. there is raid testing on the 10.2 PTR. It's most likely going to be the final day of raid testing. There's only one boss. It's Mythic Naimu, which is the only Mythic boss outside of obviously Farak that they uh, need to test. Heroic Naimu was a fucking train wreck. Like, honestly, this might be the best raid testing to watch because I nearly lost my mind on uh, Heroic Naimu raid testing. It was such a fucking disaster. Oh my god, I hate that boss. It needs serious work. There is still time for them to make it better, but the iteration we tested was bad. Uh, so Mythic Naimu's tomorrow. And then after Mythic Naimu testing, I'm actually doing ICC 10 Man at like 7 p.m. EST, like later in the evening. And I'll probably stream that as well. So it's a bunch of different things back to back to back. And, you know, individually neither or none of those things are enough that i would want to like stream them on their own like youtube video but it's a kind of fun series of things that i can stream on twitch let me quickly before i continue just read chat um gabriel keller said hey man you started watching my vods yesterday and you've been really enjoying it awesome i'm glad to hear that uh you should ride tiktok at the same time you run twitch stuff eh, i I don't think there's as much of an audience on TikTok for the type of stuff that I do. And I'm more so using Twitch as just like a bonus thing. Like, you know, this is a way for me to stream things that I otherwise wouldn't do on YouTube. I'm not trying to like expand onto Twitch as like a second platform or whatever. I, like I said, all the stuff I have planned for Twitch is extra stuff. It's not like main content. TikTok would require a lot more effort because it's like more shorter edited stuff. And I mean, what would I post on TikTok? I'm obviously not going to do TikTok dances or whatever. So it would be the type of things like what I do for YouTube shorts. But if I'm going to make a YouTube short, I'm just going to post it on YouTube. Because quite frankly, it makes much more sense to do that. Right? You mean the, our TikTok is really algorithm based? Get lots of oh, live streams? I didn't even know TikTok had live streams. It's interesting. 
Um, characters do the TikTok dances, yeah. Insta followed on Twitch, awesome. I appreciate that. Um, that's interesting. I mean, I probably won't do that anytime soon, but I had no idea TikTok even had live streams, so I will at least glance at that just to see what it's like if it is something that I could potentially use in the future, but definitely not something I plan on doing anytime soon. Um, you tested shifting sands mounting. You can mount with the buff or the debuff. Really? Okay, that actually kind of removes the penalty. That gives it a lot more of a use case than I initially thought. Uh, appreciate that, Naomi. Um, you're looking into it for cooking and ice cream making streams. Yeah, actually, that would be pretty sick. I think that could be a cool thing to stream. Did I make an Elemental Shaman 10 to 60 run? Yes. Uh, if you go into the live stream playlist, you should be able to find that. I believe the Elemental Shaman live stream was unlisted. Uh, the recording wasn't performing quite as well as a lot of the other ones, but it's still there. You can find it in the whole playlist. All of them are on there. Um, What else? What an auto attack hitting you for 80% of your health through stagger? Oh yeah, Aksara. Yeah, because you were there. That, yeah, that was something else. The problem is it wasn't even an auto attack, so it wasn't mitigated by normal means. It's like in lieu of an auto attack, Naimu has like mini tank busters that she spam casts. It's fucking stupid. And for a heroic boss, like that was the hardest hitting heroic boss I think I've done in my entire life. That was some crazy bullshit. It applies the movement speed reduction while mounted. Oh yeah, I guess if you're dragon riding, then you'll probably barely feel it. Especially if it's additive and it's like you're moving at 540% speed and it's just subtracting 90 from that. In that case, yeah, you definitely wouldn't feel it. I'm uh, Anime Go. I am not a PvPer. I am the wrong person to ask any PvP related question because I have absolutely no idea. Um, I'll, okay, there's a few other messages that I'll read in a little bit. Let me just finish uh, going over the schedule. So, Saturday, on this day, any remaining Warcraft Rumble stuff that I wasn't able to finish on Friday, I'll be doing on Twitch on Saturday. Uh, planning on playing that until I hit like a major wall. And so I've already beaten the game for reference. I've talked about this before. Uh, in the closed beta, I beat the entirety of the game as it was available at the time. I think they've added a bit of extra stuff since then. Um, and then I played the soft release when it happened a few months ago and dropped it after a few hours because it's really bad and not much has changed which is part of the problem and uh i already know where the really 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 blatant walls are so the the wall in mind that i'm planning on playing this up to is karen bloodhoof because uh, there when you get to the karen bloodhoof boss in that game it just kicks you in the shins and says fuck you pay money and I think getting up to that point will be a pretty easy way of showcasing the difficulty curve of Warcraft Rumble and how it's just fucking trash. And I don't know exactly how long it's going to take me to get a fresh account up there, so we'll see. But hopefully by Saturday I should have more than enough time to do that. And then I'll have all the footage I need and I will post my full review of it sometime between like the 31st and the 2nd, before the official launch, because I want to make sure people have that as like a warning. Because I haven't really seen a lot of talk about the game, just like kind of people shilling for it, which, you know, is what it is. And any other time, I'm going to try to organize Mythic Plus testing for 10.2 on the PTR with some of my guildies. We'll see if I'm able to get enough people for that, but I definitely need to do that at some point this week. Because I don't really want to have to scramble to do Mythic Plus testing during the week in a BlizzCon. So ideally, I'd like to get all my remaining Mythic Plus testing done uh, this weekend. I did manage to at least get a good amount of Throne of the Tides testing before it closed on Monday morning. But I still need to test Everbloom a lot more. And Dawn of the Infinite has received a lot of tweaks. So I need to test that. So that'll be Saturday. Sunday will be... Uh, Really just, like, the main thing is ICC 25, man. Doing that on my Paladin, that's, like, early afternoon. And not entirely sure what I'll do with the remaining time. Uh, probably, like, level a character in Wrath Classic, because that's something I've been meaning to do. Uh, the more interesting stream, and the main reason um, why I wanted to talk about the schedule now, is to clearly highlight something that was kind of a footnote in the post. 
The 30th, I'm going to be streaming on YouTube. And that stream will be testing every single healer spec minus preservation from levels 50 to 60. And that's going to be a lot. So, you know, I in my free time, I'm going to have to get a few different healers up to 50 to get ready for that. And in a single screen, we're testing six healing specs. And the reason I'm doing 50 to 60 is because specifically what I'll be testing is dungeon healing. So I've already talked about which specs are good at like traditional leveling as healers. Like Holy Priest, we know, is very, very strong for leveling. Uh, but while like Resto Druid, for instance, is very blatantly not even remotely an option for traditional quest leveling, a lot of people have asked me, well, what if you're doing dungeons? And I think that is at least a topic worth briefly covering. So we'll be doing kind of similar controlled experiments, 50 to 60, just very quick, you know, one to two dungeons, however long it takes to get those 10 levels with time walking. Uh, probably, it'd probably be more in the range of two to three. And we'll test out each of the healers. I am not super familiar with healing, so we'll see how that goes. I'll probably do a bit of research and practice ahead of time, but hopefully that will give a good idea of which healers are better or worse for dungeon leveling. Generally speaking, I think the result that I expect to see is that you won't see that much of a difference. I think a lot of them kind of feel the same. Some will feel a little bit stronger, but most of them for dungeon leveling, it's like, can you heal people to the point where they're not dying? Yes, very few healers can't. And can you at least contribute a little bit on damage? And that's where I think some of them will differ slightly, but yeah, it really shouldn't be that bad. But we've already talked about which ones are good for questing. This is kind of more of a, because a lot of people have asked about it, I feel I would be remiss to not at least cover that in one stream. And that is the final stream that I'll be doing at least for the next week. So there's going to be no streams anytime here. Uh, like the weekend of BlizzCon, I won't be streaming at least on YouTube at all. I don't don't have any Twitch streams planned. What I might do is, if I end up doing Mythic Plus testing, maybe I'll stream it on Twitch just to say, hey, I'm doing this right now. I'll throw it up there for whoever wants to watch it, that kind of thing. But I'm not setting anything in stone or doing any YouTube stuff. Um, and then on Sunday or Monday, like fairly early into Darkman Fair, I'm going to knock out the Sub Rogue run. My current plan is I hope to have it done and recorded the moment Darkman Fair comes up on Sunday, like middle of the night, I'll get it done. And then either during the day on Sunday, I can post this or during the day on Monday, I can post this probably aiming for Sunday because there's other like 10.2 related videos, obviously, because the patch drops here that I would like to get done, you know, on the six and stuff. But I have a lot of stuff to do, which is why I won't be streaming at least on Twitch. Then I will be streaming on YouTube for the release of uh, patch words patch 10.2 yeah uh i'll be streaming like the early patch progression through stuff and my guild will actually be raiding on this day it's going to be our final avarice raid so i guess that'll be fun to watch probably and i haven't really streamed my guild's raids at all and i guess you know i can stream that on the 7th so that'll be a youtube stream and I don't know for sure if I'll be doing a YouTube stream on the 11th or the 12th. We'll see. That's a little bit too far for me to, like, figure out plans just yet. But at least went over the plans for the next few days, which I think is important. Uh, you're happy Dawn of the Infinite is getting a lot of focus changes and adjustments to the PTR. It's definitely needed it. Oh, yeah, for sure. You've been leveling a Mistweaver Monk because of all the hate they get. You're enjoying it so far. Not super high-end, but it's still fun. Yeah, I mean, in leveling dungeons, Mistweaver is actually... Uh, historically been quite strong for a while there it was i would say the strongest dungeon leveling healer but these days i don't know if it's the strongest it's still good <coughs> ah, still good but um i don't i don't know how good it is but in the past i definitely i've leveled this misweaver a few times back in like mop wad and early legion and it was actually not bad at all uh, Naomi said, it's negative 90, and even then, it's not the full 90 because of how the speed caps work. Yeah, that's fair. That makes sense. Uh, okay, let me quickly... I know I missed a few messages earlier, so I just want to quickly go back up and make sure I caught everything. Um, 
Garrett Newell said, thanks for all the hard work and testing so many aspects of the game. We appreciate all the work. I'm glad you do. And yeah, I, I mean, I enjoy doing a lot of this testing stuff, so I'm glad you enjoy watching it. Uh, you're probably worse than everyone here. Oh my god, yeah. In some ways, Zach, maybe. Uh, what else? Saved like four to five seconds. Yeah, for the the rocket helmet toy, definitely that saves a little bit of time. We'll be able to see that fairly soon. Uh, Pedro Maria said, always been a classic player. You're trying retail for the first time and you're loving to level following my route. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, Thomas Huddock said, I'm not sure I understand why you send heirlooms instead of craft them. Um, yeah, it's... Well, so Goose Comics said it takes time to, you know, open the tab and select the heirlooms. That is part of it, for sure. The main reason is the obvious one of enchants. And yeah, Kuan even says that. It's because they're pre-enchanted. Yeah, um, definitely it's mostly for the enchants. In fact, I would actually say... It would probably be, I don't know if I would say it's faster, but at least the same time to just quickly open up the collections tab and just select the things you want. I guess like in terms of running time, it would probably be a little bit faster to mail it over. But if we're talking like practical, which one is more efficient having to mail it over by hand, it's definitely easier to just click it out of the journal. However, the, um, the enchants are pretty much 99% of the reason why I mail it over, just because you need to pre-apply it and stuff like that. And heirloom enchants actually do really add up. Uh, yay, Rocket Helm? Yeah. We'll be able to finally see that suggestion from you in action, Tori. I appreciate that again. That was definitely a good one. Okay, so I've got in all my heirlooms. I'm just double-checking stuff. I need bags. So bags and mount equipment are the two main things that I always need to rebuy. So expedition, as a weave expedition, just buy four of these, and then chronocloth reagent bag. Two, three, four. Chronocloth. And then comfortable riders barding. All right, and what else? I think I just need gear at this point, which I am going to go ahead and grab gear. I have a lot of leather stuff in my bank, so that shouldn't be an issue. A lot of that Chori has sent me, by the way. I appreciate that. But I will check the auction house just in case there's any new ones here. But I think i gotten everything covered. Shadow Core oil I have. Uh, mount equipment, yes. Augment runes. I have, yep, the two main ones. Five draft of ten lands. Um, healing potions. Lesser healing pot, abyssal healing pot. Um, I guess I could probably get... I, I think abyssal healing potion for a rogue is actually one of the few specs... <coughs> or classes in general... That I think I would really want that. Darkman Firewater I have. Mongoose I have. Ghost Elixir I have. Raider Currents. Spectral Power. It's not here, but it is there. Uh, Glacial Fury. That's a Dragonflight thing. I have all the Bear Tartar I need. Yeah, 20. I have 20 Lemon Herb Filet. Goblin Gliders. Gun Shoes. XA-1000. Uh, Fort. Stamina. I don't need swim speed potions. I don't need diving suits because this is horde. And I'm not doing any dungeons, so this time I actually don't need sanguine hibiscus. What else? Yeah, no darkman fair. I am gonna check radanax. Um, yeah, I'm too lazy to go farm one, it's just faster at this point to just grab it. For 6k, that's a pretty reasonable price, I'd say. And I'm actually going to grab at least five Radnax gems, just because since I am copying it over to the PTR, I might as well just grab a bunch of Radnax gems and you know, do that for free. Otherwise, it would just be a pain in the ass to farm all of that stuff, but 
You can just get infinite ones by copying it. I think that's it for prep outside of the gear, which, like I said, I will take a look at. Uh, this is a solo speedrun, um, Diogo Ferreira. So I all of my speedruns are, are done solo. I thought about doing group stuff, but that would be maybe a special thing at, I, I don't know, some point in the indeterminate future. All of my actual speedruns are solo, especially because the entire point is I'm trying to specifically test this spec. So it kind of muddies the waters when you get other people in the mix because, yeah, I mean, a lot of the strengths of, or a lot of the weaknesses, uh, rather, of a rogue, well, if you have a pocket tank, suddenly those are not really weaknesses. Same with, like, a pocket healer. But the more important thing is, how do each of these specs perform when they have to solo quest out in the world? Uh, let's see. What's my favorite class? Monk or Demon Hunter? Leather. And... I'll check for lower level stuff, like, um, let's go 10 to 13. You recently realized that in Hillsbred Foothills, you save two of the three NPCs you provide with quests in the beginning of the zone? Yeah. It's one of the reasons why Hillsbred Foothills is just such a fantastic zone. The story actually has a pretty consistent through line throughout the entire thing. Like, you meet them at the start. And then, you know, Johnny Awesome is one of the main characters within, like, the first subzone. And, you know, Dumbass is the character that you rescue in the mines. And then Orcus plays a big role, you know, in the um, South Shore section and stuff like that. It's honestly a really good zone. for Especially for its time, Hillsbred Foothills was fantastic. Really, really, really good zone. There's level 13. Um... Honestly, yeah. Early on, that's especially because I won a dungeon gear. The other thing is, maybe I should get stuck, because this is only marginally better. Here, let's try up to 18. I want to see if I can get items that are about 20. Uh, 11 to 21. I want to find things that are just below... Item level 50. Oh, double mastery waste. Huh. If there's no socket stuff, it's actually kind of good. Especially, yeah, because I want mastery. Okay, well, I'll definitely take that. That requires, what, level 16? Pretty good. Uh, It's a soccer player? Oh. Yeah, Orcus dies a true Orc's death, for sure. Uh, let's go with feet. Okay. So, I want something that is... What is this? Verse Mastery? Alright, so I have to choose between, effectively, 13 or... Um... Fire. I'm going to go with this, because this is just low enough item level that I can apply minor speed to it, which I actually haven't been able to do in quite a while. That'll help quite a bit. Then wrist. This is... Yeah, that's probably worth getting. Um, Crit haste or... First mastery at lower levels, especially because this is higher mastery. I think I'll take that. You can see him riding his dragon as a ghost while on the spirit realm. Oh, really? Wow, I actually never knew that, Chori. That's pretty cool. Uh, for the last run of the rogue specs, would you consider using good statted purple BOEs, or do you think it'll sway your opinion of the class slash spec? Um... I considered it. I So I don't think BOEs play that much of a factor. It's nice, but especially the main reason I'm getting lower level ones here is because normally I would get a lot of this gear from dungeons, but because I'm going to be doing this run of the PTR, I won't have dungeons to get gear from. So 
think it's fine to go ahead and grab this. Um, yeah, this is probably okay. Uh, but I don't think the purple BOEs, like we're talking the much higher item level ones, I really don't think it makes that much of a difference, especially because by the time you're getting the really good purple BOEs that you're talking about, which is like the raid stuff at 40 to 50, quest drops are actually not that bad. So if there were really good drops that you could get in the 20s, that may make a difference, but because of scaling, you really can't. And obviously, the ones that we get at level 30, the Old War BOEs, are very, very cheap. So that also doesn't really matter. Speaking of which, I'll just go ahead and grab them here. So like this stuff, Gloves of Fast Reactions. Uh, gloves of Holy Might. Interesting. Yeah, this is obviously really cheap. Um... I want... I guess, yeah, this is probably the best I'll get. Then feet. Uh, yeah. Grab those, and then waist. And there is, yeah, nimble climbers is, I think, the one I always go for. And for whatever reason, I think I've talked about this particular item in the past before. It's a little bit weird how the scaling works in that. Grab Nimble Climber's Belt. And yeah, I don't know if I'm even going to bother with higher item level stuff. I'll check to see if there's anything good. Let's go with level 40 to 45. If there's any really good cheap notable items. Um, there's a few good ones around uh, level 45. Might be worth it. This is very cheap. The stats in it are not super ideal, but that's, I think, kind of fine. I'll check the others. It's a little bit expensive. What's the difference? 29 agility versus 21 agility. Um, oh, but you know what? I don't have this appearance. Uh, I actually do have this appearance, even though it doesn't show up there. Actually, fuck it. <laughs> you know, I, I don't mind spending a bit on transmog, especially when it's transmog that's going to help me within a speedrun. And technically... This is, I'm basically double dipping because I'm, since I'm copying it over to the PTR, anything that I'm using on this run, I can just reuse for the sub rogue speed run because I'm not actually going to be using these items. Frankly, I, I can reuse it in the future even beyond that because both runs will be done on the PTR. Uh, Sinuous Coraptor Bindings. This is actually a very good stat line. So definitely... Don't mind taking that. And I'm assuming... Yeah, there's not as many good glove options. Unfortunately. And... Teen Agility. Mm. What's the difference between this and Gloves of Fast Reactions? Actually, so... The level 41 greens... Is 15 Agi and 21 Haste. So 15 Agi and then 29 Secondaries. If we check Gloves of Fast Reactions. Uh, well, I apparently I bought the only one left in the auction house, so I have to actually check it off my mail. This is the low-level stuff. Then the Old War stuff. Uh, I think the socket actually kind of makes this probably still worth running. Is this is, what, 12 additional agility that I'd be getting? It's close. 
I think I'd rather just keep this, especially since it has a socket, compared to buying a new item if it's not going to be better. Uh, let me read what you're saying, Chori. Check ring BOEs. There's a ring with a socket from Nyalotha, and it sometimes appears at 2k gold. Um, I don't know if I'll bother with ring BOEs for this, especially because I guess if you prepped it ahead of time, maybe it would be marginally better. But the problem with anything that competes with an heirloom slot, the scaling on rings used to be terrible, but now it's honestly fine. So the problem with those BOEs is you're only getting them for like one or two levels where it really outscales the other stuff. I will check at least. So. Um, the Nyalotha ones would be down. I don't know where, what item level exactly. It would be below this stuff. So this is 57. So it would be around here, I think. Uh, so those are Kate BOEs. And the Nyalotha one, I think, should be at level 50, right? I'm not seeing that here. Shadow Ruby. Uh, I know the one you're talking about, though, Chori. Like, I remember the item from Nyalotha. But yeah, there's a few neck BOEs, but at this point, level 40, uh, I guess it has main stat on it, but at that point you're competing with, you know, Minari Training Amulet, which I don't think you replace that. Ring is obviously a different story, and I know that's what you were saying. I think it's this one, actually. Lurking Schemer's Band. That's the one, right? Um, and this one, I mean, hey, it has a socket. So... Yeah, it's the thing is, though, it's level 50, so I could see this. It might briefly outscale heirloom rings, but not by a lot. The socket would extend that, but we're talking this would maybe be slightly better than heirloom rings. We're talking very slightly for five levels, like 50 to 55 and 50 to 55. Once again, that's the easiest portion of the run. So if this was something like. You were getting a socketed ring very early on when scaling isn't the best and when every little bit helps. I could see that. Honestly, level 30 would probably be the most impactful. That's when scaling is kind of the worst. But yeah, at that point, I don't really think it would help a ton. I believe we've gotten everything set up, though. Uh, I got pinged on Discord, so I'm just going to double check. Um... All right. Uh, actually, I went to the mailbox, but I don't want to go to the mailbox just yet. We're actually swapping over to the PTR now because I'm just going to copy this character. And then once this character is on the PTR, I'm going to mail everything over to the uh, PTR character I've created. 30k? Oh yeah, for 30k, it's definitely not worth it. Like That is obviously, you're correct, a no-brainer. That is not like a good price to pay for it. But... I would say even if it was cheap, I'm more talking, would it even be worth it to equip? I guess if you were able to pick it up for, like you said, 2k, then I could see that. Uh, Dorthelion said, wait, it's not Saturday. Uh, you are correct, it is not Saturday. Uh, you can check the YouTube post that's pinned on the stream chat, and that includes more information about why my streaming days this week are the way they are, and when you can expect to see everything. I also discussed it in a bit more detail earlier in this uh, stream. So if you go back to the start, you'll see an explanation for that. Uh, go Harlan Bank. And we can mail everything over. I think I got it all. I'm actually now second-guessing myself. I'm 99% sure I have everything. Worst case scenario, I go back and copy over a few extra things, but I don't think I should need to. And I believe I have Postal on the PTR. Um, just double check my add-ons. I do have Postal. So that's important because the order in which you open mail with Postal is different than the default UI. So, shopping list. Um, yeah. Alright, so. 
to uh, doesn't auto complete for whatever reason. Uh oh, you're fucking joking. I got the UI bug? That is surprising. This is... I haven't seen this bug happen in quite a while. It's a little bit annoying, but I don't actually think any of the items in this particular bag were going to be used for the speedrun, so I don't think it matters. But... That's a little bit concerning because I'm. I mean, they. I don't know how they haven't fixed this bug. It randomly gets reintroduced on the PTR like every now and then, and it's really annoying to deal with. Um, can just mail over however much gold I want. It's the PTR after all. Uh, what do I want to send over next? Probably any major consumes. So that's. Swiftness Potion, Healing Potion, Darkwing Fire Water, Drums, I think. Then I want to send over... Oh yeah, Lemon Herb Filet is another important one. I'm actually just going to mail that over. I should have sent that in the last one, whatever. Uh, then Elixir of the Mongoose, then... I'm actually just going to mail that on its own too. Question of the Tolvier, Ghost of Elixir, this stuff. That's it for that level bracket. Then level 40 is all of this stuff. This is a full 10 to 60, yes. This is not a, a mini 40 to 60 test run. Every single rogue spec is getting the full 10 to 60 treatment. And what do I want next? Uh, I think next, send over that stuff. Then the low level ones. Oh, you know what? Forgot to enchant this stuff. Um, how big are the enchants that you get? I know minor speed actually kind of helps. Uh, I actually, I, I'm gonna enchant this. I need to recopy this character anyway to mail over multiple Radnax gems, so that's actually not really that big of a deal. But, yeah, I need to stop mailing now, because the order will be I send this stuff, then I send Radnax gem, then Riders Barding, then Heirlooms, and then I mail over bunch of Radnax gems by recopying the characters, so... Back to actual live servers, briefly. I knew I was forgetting something. Oh well. Um... switch over the OBS display. Yeah, there we go. It's working now. Didn't realize you hated yourself. Yeah. Um, Hassan Ramano said, watching you while testing Enhancement Shaman all I have, only alts, no main yet. Oh, nice. Uh, well, I hope one day you're able to find a spec that you really like and decide to main. Because, you know, that's the most fun part of WoW. It's like really playing one spec and getting really good at it and, well, enjoying it, right? Uh, when you were testing Dawn of the Infinite, you had that bug on your evoker. Yeah, it happens kind of randomly. And, yeah, Goose Comics, I skimmed what you wrote. I'll have to look into that later that's interesting it's not the type of thing that i think i really want to do in a speed run but that is definitely some interesting tech right there it's actually surprisingly high item level for uh drops like that i wonder if that's just like the maximum green item level that can drop so you just like hit the top of the breakpoint Weird coincidence, you just started playing Assassination. Nice. 
Well, I hope the run gives you some useful insights or something. Minor speed. That's... Uh, then item enhancements for wrist. Let's go with... Uh, greater, it's... What is it? Greater agility or... There might be some other one. This is six agility... That's just 5 agility. Minor agility is 1. It's probably the one that gives 6 agility, but I'm double checking these other ones just in case. There's versatility in chance. I'd much rather have actual agi. Yeah, it's going to be... Greater agi. Alright, then I already got minor speed. There is no belt enchant, and I need glove enchant next. Would be hands. Uh, crusher, that's seven attack power. Major agility is seven. So 7 Agi is the highest here. I'm pretty sure 7 Agi is the highest you can get for gloves. I remember some of these enchants were not, like, evenly balanced. Superior Agi is only 3. Yeah. Yeah, so there was, like, 9 strength enchants. But then... For agility, you can't really get much better than, I believe, 7... Yeah, that's fine, though. Just old, weird enchants from the Wrath days. Go there, enchant boots. Enchant racer. Enchant gloves. And in fact, I'm going to... Even, I might have minor speed still sitting in my bank somewhere. Champ boots, eternal agility. Yeah, I do have minor speed. Just put that there. And that way I can immediately apply it to my boots because these ones won't come online until 18. So there we go. That should be actually everything I need. I can swap back over to the 10.2 PTR. It'll be on OBS in a second. Just gotta you know, get that set up. Can't get that damn mount. All you get is masks and rings. Yeah. I've heard the drop rate is pretty low. Uh, also, before I forget, if you're enjoying the stream, and or if you've just enjoyed the streams and videos in general, uh, make sure to toss it a like, as that helps the channel. Etc, etc. Likes on streams, generally speaking, will help just as much as like vi regular video likes, because this turns into a video later on and, you know, the algorithm treats that all the same. Yeah. Uh, you have every class you can't decide for 10 years now. You were a hunter main from Classic to Wrath, but then your downfall started. Yeah, I feel that. I played hunter for a while, too. Okay, so... The next thing I wanted to send to my character for this run, I may as well honestly send extra Draft of Ten Lands just so I can play safe with it and not have to worry about like, oh, am I actually um, using it properly? And I probably would have sent over the minor speed. Actually, if I send over one stack, then this doesn't matter. Send over one stack of minor speed. And... No. How do I want to do this? Send that. Then I send over the enchanted items. Then I send over one minor speed. And... Um... And then I, then I send over the Radinax gem. Then I send over one minor speed. 
and then I send over Comfortable Riders Barding. And then all of the heirlooms. Okay. Now I just need to send a bunch of cracked Radnax gems. That's a pause for a second because just wanted to make sure I was actually on the PTR. Because there, there was that moment of like, wait, this is the PTR, right? I'm not actually deleting my entire bank alt and check the server. And I'm like, okay, we're good. But it's a little bit scary doing that, as you might imagine. A character, and then just recopy it over. Actually, at this point, I'm just going to copy it over a bunch of times really quick. And then I can do it all in one sitting instead of having to, like, log out, copy again. So I have two Radinax gems right now. Let's go with six Radinax gems just to be ultra super duper safe and make sure I have everything I need. All right. Tossing a coin to your Witcher? <laughs> Thank you. Um, up. I can respond to chat a little bit better when I've like fully started the speedrun, because obviously we're very close to that. I, I was trying to type Harlden Bank, and then it just I doesn't matter, but I can honestly type gibberish for these characters, and it really doesn't make a difference. Uh, aren't, uh, Nizal, you can technically add sockets to a belt, but the item level stuff is really, really weird. It doesn't actually work. There is... Basically, so one of the problems with adding a socket to a belt is the socket items in almost all cases will cause the belt to be soulbound. So one of the advantages of enchanting the items ahead of time is it doesn't make it soulbound, so it's just a free bonus. If you have to stop and manually socket your belt and then put in a gem, like, not really the most efficient thing. But also, the main reason, I would probably do that if they actually worked. Um... I'm more just saying that's a little bit of a downside. But a lot of them just flat out do not work. Uh, it works kind of like the um, the shoulder and pants enchants, how they're like bugged, right? Where it requires a certain level, but by the time you get to that level, the item level is too high. I think there is one socket that actually does work, but it only works for like a two level range. And it's not within a level range that I traditionally use BOEs. So basically, yeah, sockets don't work. And they also don't work on low-level stuff. Uh, you find some of that stuff cool. You don't take full advantage because you like your account. I, yeah, I mean, here's the thing. That is, like, it's an interesting tech, Goose Comics. Well, I probably wouldn't do it for a speeder and just because I don't think I, it would save time. I honestly don't even think that's, like, really an exploit. It definitely seems like unintended behavior, but it's like such a, like, who cares kind of thing. That's like a very, very, very minor quality of life exploit at that. That's not really the type of thing that I think Blizzard would give a shit about. So, there definitely are some exploits that they would. But, yeah. Uh, oh, James Sloan became a member. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Um... And, oh yeah, James Sloan, I was just about to get to your comment. So, what would be your suggestion for someone that wants to get into tank for the first time? Yeah, that is, is definitely a very involved, or very loaded question. I have a lot that I could say about that. Um, I'll read what Naomi said first, because Naomi usually has good advice in that. Uh, play one of the simpler ones, definitely. Um, I don't know if I would agree that Prot Warrior is the simplest. Um... I think I would say the simplest tanks to get into are Guardian Druid and Blood DK. 
Blood Decay definitely is a little bit trickier at the higher ends, but Blood Decay's skill floor is very, very, very low. It's very easy to pick up and, like, learn at a basic level. But Guardian Druid, I think, is very safely the easiest tank to pick up. Now, in the past, I steered people away from Guardian because there was a pretty good stretch of time where it was really not in a good spot. But obviously, that's no longer the case. Guardian is in a very, very good spot at the moment. And whenever Guardian is in a good place, it's usually a very good starting tank. Yeah, I I know it's getting gutted, Naomi. I still hope they give it at least a little bit of love, because it is a bit tragic that it's getting nerfed as hard as it is. Or rather, it's losing a lot of really important stuff and getting nerfed. But it's, like, even losing that, I don't think it's going to go back to how bad it was before. I think it's still going to be pretty solid. And it's not going to be bad in raids. Like, it's not like it's going to be absolutely terrible. Um, and Oxara, well, that's, I, I'm definitely glad that you, um, got into tanking as Vengeance. Vengeance is the last tank that I would ever recommend somebody as a starting one. Except maybe Brewmaster. No, actually it's Vengeance. Vengeance is the last tank I'd recommend to anybody learning how to get into it. Definitely would not recommend Vengeance. Obviously I like Vengeance. Or at least I have liked Vengeance. I'm really frustrated with the current area they're taking its design but uh that is something i've talked about extensively uh, vengeance is vengeance has at times been a very easy tank to get into with the sigil build in mythic plus maybe it'll still be an easy tank to get into next here but i don't know it right now i i don't think it vengeance is worth like for new players like a good tank to pick up and learn you also have to remember that Vengeance relies so heavily on borrowed power compared to other tanks that the way Vengeance plays at lower levels is so drastically different. It, not even lower levels, lower gear levels. It plays so much different before you get like your, all of your borrowed power shit. Whereas like Blood DK, well obviously there's a lot of stuff that powers up like Blood DK, Brewmaster, etc., their rotation doesn't change that much. Like, their general playstyle doesn't change that much. Brewmaster, at points, has been susceptible to, like, borrowed power changing up the way you play it. And it has a few different rotational talents that it switches between. Which is why I would say Brewmaster is also up there in terms of tanks. While I love Brewmaster, would definitely not recommend it to a new player. It's one of those tanks where once you've gotten the fundamentals down, then check out Brewmaster. But... Um... Vengeance is also, yeah, not one that I would definitely recommend. Uh, Goose Comics said, it's easy to pick up, but also easy to fuck up your defensive rotation. Um, and yeah, like Naomi said, Vengeance, in order to not die in like even remotely challenging content, you need to at least have a, a solid understanding of how it plays. Whereas Blood Decays, while there is definitely a high skill ceiling, you can kind of just get by pressing Death Strike for a very, very, very long time. I have... I have seen a lot of very, very, very bad Blood Decays playing at a level that is well past where they should be for their skill. But considering Blood can just cheese so much shit by pressing one button, a lot of really bad Blood Decay players kind of just scrape by. So, yeah. Blood Decay, can, yeah, I mean, high Mythic Plus, like, we're very high Mythic Plus, Blood Decay struggles, for sure. But we're talking, like, even Mythic Raids, like, entry-level Mythic Raids, Heroic Raids, like, mid-to-high Mythic Plus, Blood DK can scrape by. But, yeah, when you start to get to 20s and higher, that's when, if you don't know how to play Blood DK, it'll really start to show. But I would say Vengeance, if you don't know what you're doing at all, you would start to struggle much earlier than that. Same with Brewmaster. Uh, hello, Warren Murphy. Good to see you. Uh, in Raid, no tank. Yeah, well... No tank really struggles in Heroic, for sure, but I think as Blood, you'll still have an easier time pressing Death Strike than, like, if you don't know what you're doing as a Vengeance Demon Hunter or a Brewmaster Monk, you will probably still get clapped. Vengeance more so in raids. Brewmaster Stagger can kind of carry you through a lot of raid bosses if your healers are paying attention, uh, but even then you'll be taking a notice noticeable amount of damage if you're not, like, actually min-maxing things properly. Um... What else did uh, Naomi say about also try to maximize for DPS and raid? Yeah, I, I mean, I generally, I would not recommend maxing for survivability uh, outside of obviously, like Naomi said, keys. 
but early on, I think as a beginner tank, it's fine to play a bit more in the safe side, but I think definitely remember that your damage still matters. As long as you are not completely neglecting your damage as a beginner tank, it's fine to focus a bit more on survivability until you're really comfortable, but there are a lot of people that will say, go full tanky, don't worry about your DPS at all, and that is a recipe for disaster. It is just setting up, setting you up poorly for the long run. And I think it is the biggest issue you see with a lot of bad tanks. Um, and Naomi said, would recommend talking to players rather than blindly following guides. Yes, it definitely is a good first step. Um, I think there's definitely a lot of good guides out there, but... Some tanks have noticeably better resources than others. I would say the, the without a doubt, best tanking resource is for Brewmasters. Peak of Serenity has amazing Brewmaster resources. I honestly... I don't want to knock the other, like, discords or guide writers and stuff, but... And I, I am a little bit biased, because obviously I do know a lot of them. Like, Emelson is a god among men but yeah actually dream grove is pretty good too a lot of the guardian druid resources I, that is fair i don't play guardian quite as much so i don't interact with it but i would say i don't know if i would say it's better than peak but it's close a lot of really 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 good resources for bear druids but monks obviously are just like a cut above the peak of serenity discord is fantastic the resources there are really really good actually um emelson put out a really fantastic article a few days ago about like discussing the brewmaster stat priority which like i kind of already knew about that because i've played brewmaster for, for a while and i still found it to be interesting to read just because you know they do such a good job like explaining things and giving like little insights that i wasn't aware of uh definitely if you're a brewmaster you have so much information at your disposal uh we're, we're not talking about the the uh, Peak of Serenity quest line or the zone in World of Warcraft. We're talking about the Discord. The, the monk Discord with all the guide writers and stuff is called Peak of Serenity. <laughs> um, understandable mistake, though. That I I think it's amusing just because I can completely understand the confusion. But yeah, we're talking about the uh, the Discord and stuff. Um, Goose Comics, I, I don't entirely disagree or I don't entirely agree that Vengeance Demon Hunter has good resources. Um... I actually think the Vengeance Demon Hunter Discord is on the weaker side of things. It's not terrible. Like, they don't... It definitely, compared to a lot of other, like, specs... I, I'm not going to talk about Azertharian again, but we all know he sucks. Um, it's definitely better than a lot of other specs out there, but I would actually say Vengeance has one of the weaker guide writing and theory crafting communities. They are generally not the best at staying up to date on like you know the best builds and stuff like that the discord is pretty hit or miss in terms of information it's not the worst though and the main thing about it is they generally are open to feedback so a lot of times if people provide them with the correct information they will update it they are just not always the best about getting there on their own but definitely not the worst but i i don't think they're even close to like the other discords um like protection paladin i will say and and this is i i love lincoln right he's a friend of mine he plays very tanky um he doesn't go for damage quite as much as i think a lot of other protection paladins like to so lincoln's guide while i think it is still a good one does have a very defensive slant to it but I think there's generally a lot of solid resources out there for Protection Paladin. And I still think Lincoln's Guide is well-written. And in terms of, like, all the core fundamental aspects of Protection Paladins, it'll teach you what you need to know, right? Um, and Lincoln is, of course, a very knowledgeable person on the spec. Um, so I think Protection Paladins generally are in good hands. Uh, Prot Warriors... There's a few guides that contain a decent amount of outdated information... I'd say Prot Warrior is a little bit hit or miss. There are a lot of good resources for Prot Warriors, and then there's also a lot of really bad resources. So it's just a matter of finding which ones are which. None of them are... I'm not going to name or shame any specific guide writers, because, you know, I think there's a difference between writing a guide that I just feel isn't very good and doing what, like, Azertharian does, which I think is blatantly scummy. So I'm not going to, like, 
call people out, but there definitely are a few of the Prot Warrior guides that I think are not super great. And leads to a little bit of misinformation, but not through malice, just, I think, through lack of understanding. And does that cover every tank? Or monks? I, Death Knights? Yeah, Death Knights are fine. Um, I, I think Death Knights share a little bit less information in, like, the Discord. It's not as thorough, but generally speaking, from what I've seen, the information the Blood DK Discord does share is usually, like, decent, but... They aren't like as they're they're not as communicative, I guess, compared to like the monk and druid discord. So a lot of times it might take them a while to get out like the um the most recent information. So you might see some slightly out of date stuff there. Uh, but as far as I know, it's generally speaking pretty good. Uh, there's so much weird info about the stat prios. Yeah. I mean, I haven't played a Blood DK in a little while, so I don't know, like, all the specific details. But generally speaking, I think it has most of the good information. Anyways, let me, um... <laughs> yeah, Goose Comics. I also go pretty heavy damage as a Vengeance Demon Hunter in Mythic Plus. Uh, one of the things I do kind of hate is having to completely switch around my build for Keys and Raid, which is part of why I'm moving away from Vengeance, at least for now. I think they just need to reconsider what they want the spec to be like, and the direction they're going is not one that I'm personally happy with, which is... I have an entire video planned. Obviously, I've ranted about that on stream numerous times, but it is something I do plan on covering in a completely full, separate video. Uh, even if you deleted it on Live Realms, they added... Yeah, Nizal, I I'm aware of that. I was more just joking. Um, you've been on a hike out of the mountain and forest all day. You can now fall asleep to a Harlden speed run. I'm glad to hear it. I hope you enjoyed your hike. It would take a lot of time to get fully kitted out since you can only do feast once a week. Yeah, that's true. Goose comics. Um, you're going with warrior in season three. Hope it's a good choice. Uh, warrior is not bad in season three. So Right now, for raids, the only bad choice in raids is Vengeance Demon Hunter. You know, th there is no way around it. Right now, Vengeance Demon Hunter can only go down. It is already the worst tank in raids for um, Amir Drusel, as it currently stands. And quite frankly, it will only get worse because right now, Vengeance Demon Hunter is running Aberus two-piece in raids for the entirety of Amir Drusel. And unfortunately, there is a chance that Blizzard will nerf it because they wouldn't want people to be running old tier but without that vengeance demon hunter is even worse so honestly i i genuinely i don't know uh and to make to fix vengeance it's not even just numbers things they would need to fundamentally rework it and guess what vengeance just got a rework unfortunately the rework is part of the problem so vengeance needs a rework for the rework and that is not going to happen in time they nerf the four piece oxara so I did some PTR sims right now, and even before their nerfs, uh, two-piece, two-piece was the highest performing build. Four-piece was still very good early tier. Uh, what this does is this actually is a very big hit to Vengeance still early in progression. So heroic progression, week one and two, is going to murder you as a Vengeance Demon Hunter now, because the set bonus four-piece from Aberus is dead. It is so fucking dead. It is really, 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 really bad. And long-term, it's actually not that much of an issue because you were already planning on running Aberus 2-piece, Amir Drissel 2-piece. But what this means is until you get Amir Drissel 2-piece, you are fucked. It's, Vengeance is really not looking good. Um, they are in a, a dire situation for Raid. Now, for Mythic Plus, for Mythic Plus, they're actually looking pretty solid. Uh, partially because, obviously, as Naomi said earlier, Guardian Druid is losing a lot, and Guardian Druid is currently the dominant tank. So with Guardian Druid falling off and Vengeance already being pretty solid in M+, especially considering this current tier right now in Aberus, Vengeance is maybe the second or third worst tank in the raid. It's not bad, but it's down there. It's nowhere near the top tanks for raid. And yet it is still very good in Mythic+. Plus. So even though it is still not really bad in Amir Drusil, um, still not really great in Raid. Um, it is still going to be good in Mythic Plus regardless, but actually the rework that they gave them really only benefits them in like Mythic Plus AoE scenarios, which is kind of part of the problem. 
it doesn't help them at all in single target or raid scenarios. It only helps with like throughput survivability against multiple mobs and AoE damage. And even then, it doesn't help their AoE damage that much, just more than it helps their single target, which is to say it doesn't help their single target at all. So Vengeance Demon Hunters in Mythic Plus are going to be quite good. They also have a lot of utility. And that is also another issue with their situation in Raid. Because they are good in Mythic Plus, you cannot reasonably buff parts of Vengeance Demon Hunter without giving a like counterbalance nerf to their other stuff in AoE. There are definitely things they could do to balance out Vengeance Demon Hunters like Raid and Mythic Plus performance. I just don't think they will because I don't think they know how. Because they have shown time and time again that they have absolutely no idea what to do when it comes to designing Vengeance Demon Hunter. That's just life as a Vengeance Demon Hunter player who has been playing it since Nighthold. We, they just don't give a shit about our spec. Whenever it happens to be good, it's completely by accident. Uh, oh, Bagheera became a member. Uh, thank you. I greatly appreciate that, Bagheera. Um, what else was I saying? Uh, yeah, but other than Vengeance for Raid, and I mean Mythic Plus, every tank is going to be fine in Mythic Plus unless you're going for like plus 20 or higher than 20s like title pushing obviously there there's a meta we've already mentioned vengeance i don't know what it is beyond that but every tank will be more than fine in terms of like getting your portals which I mean, is really all i care about i'm not like a um, super high like plus 25s mythic plus pusher not my cup of tea um, i care about mythic raid cutting edge and getting portals in keys and every tank is perfectly fine up to plus 20, so that's not really something you need to worry about. But in raids, Vengeance is, noticeable. Vengeance is notably weak. Right now, the current meta for tanks is um, probably a mix of Brewmaster, Prop Pally, and Blood DK. We're talking like top three for raids. Brewmaster's kind of a no-brainer. It was really good this tier, and it's not really getting changed. If anything, it's it, it's maybe going to be losing a tiny bit of damage, but getting a bit of survivability next tier. And a lot of the fights favor Brewmaster. It's just good. Yeah, Brewmaster is always a solid tank. There's, I don't remember the last tier, maybe Emerald Nightmare, where Brewmaster wasn't like one of the top three tanks. That's just kind of a no-brainer. Um, Blood Decay also usually up there. It's notably a little bit lower in Abarus right now. But even then, it's always a solid option, and obviously it's getting a Legendary, and Blood Decay is actually looking pretty solid overall for next tier, so probably going to be Brewmaster Blood Decay. Prop Pally, while a little bit weaker now than it was in like the end of Vault of the Incarnates or Abarus, is still looking very strong. The tier set bonus has some problems. It's definitely one of the weaker tank tier sets, but Prop Pally damage is still fine. Prop Pally survivability is still very good. Um, much better than it has historically been. Um, I'm going to start the speedrun shortly, but I, this is just something I wanted to talk about because it was asked. So we're just we're covering this topic, then we're starting the speedrun. So appreciate if people could stop asking. Um, but yeah, Prop is good. Mostly the utility is very nice. And then um, Guardian Druids are, I would say, on the weaker end. They're not going to be bad, but they are definitely going to be weak-ish relative to, I think, the other tanks, just because they're getting a not-so-great raid tier set, and they don't really offer any utility or really anything special, and I don't think their damage is looking to be that high relative to the other tanks, because they were pretty heavily carried on that front by the Aberus 2-piece and 4-piece. So, um... They'll probably be a bit lower, but definitely nowhere on the level of Vengeance Demon Hunter. And Prot Warrior is looking solid. I would put Prot Warrior, like, just below the other tanks, especially in Raid. Prot Warrior Mythic Plus at the moment, I think, is a, in a little bit of a weird spot. Its tier set blatantly favors single target rather than multi-targets. So, kind of weird how that's going to play out. It's not bad, but it's just not amazing. But single target, Prot Warrior is looking pretty solid. I think they'll be perfectly fine. Yeah, I appreciate people saying, you know, it's his stream and stuff. I, I appreciate you guys, you know. I understand that people want to see the run. We'll be starting shortly. It's just the reality of the first, like, 20 minutes of the run is I'm going to need to be somewhat focused, so I want to get all this stuff out of the way. Uh, hello, Faxi. 
Faxi said, hey, let's get this going. What's the hold up? Yeah, to be clear, um, I, I hope people weren't responding to Faxi. Faxi is a friend of mine, so he's just messing with me. I, that probably wasn't super clear for everybody else, though. Um, but good to see you, Faxi. If the axe doesn't come with a teleport to the new zone, that would be a plot hole. True. Yeah. I am very curious to see what the axe does. The other thing to consider with Blood Decay is... Blood Decay, while it will probably be good for late progression if the axe is even remotely decent, because it's the only tank that can get the legendary. So if the axe is even somewhat good, it'll probably make Blood Decay one of the strongest tanks. But you gotta keep in mind that at the moment, since we know nothing about the axe it's most likely not going to be a thing that you can get until much later into the tier. Kind of like the Evoker Legendary. So, with that in mind, you gotta think like, okay, if I'm playing Blood Decay like early on in progression, and the axe is maybe like a significant part of my power, is it really worth it? Like, for my purposes, what I'm gonna be doing is I'm starting the tier as Brewmaster 100%. That's a no-brainer. And then, much later on, if the axe ends up being really, 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 really good and Blood Decay is looking to be absolutely bonkers, then I can maybe consider later in the tier, like on the final two bosses, switching to Blood Decay if I think that'll help, right? But I personally think that at least at the start of the tier, it's going to be Brewmaster Prop Pally, but maybe later on Blood Decay will become very good. At least that is what I suspect. I don't think Blood Decay would be even bad, though, at the start. Just maybe not as strong from the initial thing. You also have to keep in mind... I think Prop Heli and Brewmaster are both stronger coming off of Aberus relative to some of the other tanks because they were like the two best raid tanks right now and they have relatively good stuff. Brewmaster especially has a very good set bonus with Aberus. They're not going to be using it because their new bonus is also very strong, but they are going to have a lot more of their initial power compared to some of the other tanks at the very, very start of the tier. But I think that's like a pretty thorough uh, analysis of that. Faxi said, might be his stream, but he's at my kill. I mean, hey, it's true. Uh, this is your favorite part of the stream. It's a cozy feeling just chatting. Yeah, I know a lot of people like it, which is why I tend not to rush it a ton. Um, does this mean you can clear a Mythic Nihilotha on a normal geared heroic warrior? Unfortunately, BFA raids are still, in many cases, impossible to solo, not because of gear, but because of mechanics. And Ian promised, like, early in the expansion that Dragonflight would finally address the fact that, like, you can't solo a lot of BFA raids, and they just haven't. I've had on my... Because I made, back in Shadowlands, I made a guide on how to solo all of the Legion raids, and that actually did fairly well, especially considering my channel was much smaller at the time. So, whenever they make it so BFA raids can be soloed, I'll probably go ahead and put together a guide on, like, how to solo all the tricky bosses. And I've been waiting to do that for a while. I had that, like, on my planned videos list ever since 10.1 or 10.0.5, when they initially said they were going to eventually make BFA raid soloable. We're now at patch 10.2, and they still haven't done that, so... I don't know. <laughs> we'll get it eventually. Uh, also, oh, fuck, real quick. Uh, I don't Actually, I don't even have my timer up. I can do that real fast. Um, it'll only take a moment. But I need to go into... Uh, one of my characters, just to make sure that's set up properly. Let me check my OBS, and... Yeah, that should be good. I should cover it. I can start shortly. I just want to make sure I read every last message. Uh, what have I missed... You're probably going to try out Blood Decay, James? Yeah. I mean, Blood Decay is definitely a good option, especially if you're just getting into tanking. It's fun, too. I mean, I I don't enjoy min-maxing Blood Decay at a high level, but Blood Decay at a baseline, just learning how to play around Death Strike is pretty fun, I'd say. Uh, Dan Wesley, I missed this message, said, Greetings from the UK. As an Assassination Rogue main, uh, you wish me luck. You love the class, but it's shitty to level until you get to, like, 45. Yeah, I've heard that a lot. I think the PTR changes, so this is on the 10.2 PTR. I think it's going to help a lot. Uh, the Rogue changes, especially, are very, very nice, but we'll see. Um, I don't think it's going to be amazing, but I don't think it'll be nearly as bad as it is in live servers. Uh... You felt like Blood Decay was a much harder tank than Vengeance? Depends on the build. Traditionally speaking, the hardest 
Vengeance builds, the ones that are optimal, are generally much harder to play than the hardest blood DK builds. That is my personal opinion. Though I will give you that when Vengeance has had very easy builds that are literally just spam Soul Cleave and press Demon Spikes for incoming damage, yes, that was pretty brain dead. But that has not always been the case. In fact, it usually is not. Uh... Let's see. You can see the axe being released once Mythic Farak dies. I hope it's a little bit earlier than that. I honestly, I think the axe, I hope, is tied to a quest line or something, and you progress through it. The main thing is, I want it to be very clearly established how long it's going to take to get the axe, and I hope it's not RNG bullshit like the Evoker Legendary, because nobody liked that. And they know that nobody liked the Evoker Legendary acquisition, because they made it easier and easier as the tier went on. So if they just repeat the exact same thing again, it's just going to piss people off. Uh, releasing the Legendary and then having it be absolutely useless the next tier is something you'll never understand. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure how the Evoker Legendary is going to play out. I definitely think they should have given Evokers a way to upgrade their Legendary. Maybe they'll do it later on. I mean, they technically did it with the Sylve, though, in Shadowlands, so it's not unheard of. But, uh, definitely think that they should have, um, done that. Oh, shit. Uh, Chori, I'm not, I won't use those two BOEs, but I appreciate the offer. That, I, I know the BOEs you're talking about, I think that would be, like, too big of an impact, especially the legendary one, but I definitely appreciate it. I thought about doing that for, like, super serious speedruns, getting those, but, yeah. Uh, okay, like, two more messages until I'm caught up and we can start. Myth Mythic Nazoth is the only one that's unsolvable. Yeah, I'm more thinking there's a lot of other bosses in other BFA raids that are unsolvable. You got pretty far in Mythic Nihilotha a couple days ago, but you didn't have enough damage to kill Ilganoth. Yeah. Best expansion 10 to 60. Uh, no Noah Kowski. I have a guide on my channel that literally goes over how to level fast. So go check that out. Those can be brute forced by sheer DPS. Yeah. Uh, the boat would have been awesome if survival wasn't better and more fun that season. True. Yeah. I mean, the bow is still interesting, especially for anybody who was actually playing Ranged Hunter, but yeah, survival did kind of skew things a little bit. Um, yeah, the, the bo those boots are pretty OP, Chori. Alright, I have finally fully caught up in chat, so I will enter world. And we'll start the timer once the cutscene is skipped and all that fun stuff that we usually do. A second now. Oh, the cutscene gets auto skipped by one of my add ons, cinematic canceller. So, three, two, one, and start the run. And oh, you get sprint immediately. That actually helps you reach the mailbox a little bit faster. Okay. Got my bags. Equip these. Drop. And then open all. Actually, real quick, so I can start getting my UI set up beforehand. I'm going to quickly do this. Normally, in like actual speedruns, I would create a character and enable these settings so it carries over. But of course, I'm not going to do that just for like a random testing run. It's only a very minor time loss anyway. There... Right, there we go. Now I can do gun shoes, and while I'm using gun shoes, I can figure out what I'm doing as far as that stuff's concerned. Hello. Oh, I don't know why that did not work. Now it's up. Miss that little hop, that angle. 
Uh, don't have any items that I can use just yet. I guess I probably could have just used. Yeah, I probably should be using cracked Ranax gems because I have them. I'm not used to having cracked Ranax gems back in the route, but they are very useful for situations like this. This should. Thought it was going to dismount me manually, but I guess I have to click it off. Uh, good luck. You're doing Antorus Mythic in the meantime. Awesome. Long loading screen here. Very long loading screen. There we go. Sprint. Effect. Put this here so the moment sprint wears off. And swiftness potion. And coming up. Alright, here we go, Chori. It's time for your uh, super awesome speedrun tech. So, X-52 Rocket Helmet. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> that actually definitely... That definitely gets a time save. That's actually... No, that's more than four or five seconds. Because I didn't even think about it. Like, the Goblin Glider absolutely saves you time there. Because normally you have to run on your mount for a little bit. I guess with the addition of the Cracked Radnax gem, it's maybe not as massive of a time save, but it's still pretty good. Uh, I'm going to quickly drink my experience potion. Do I have anything? I guess I can use my Volpera Racial to pull from range. And... What abilities do I have? Yes. Just start the RP and then I can sort everything out. Alright. As usual with these runs. Really nice to start with Silver Pine so I just have some breathing room. Throw minor speed on there. Now that Radnax is back, you can return to tell me to make a cancel or a macro. Yeah, I mean, I used to have a cancel or a macro. I stopped doing it because for when you only have gun shoes, it's easier to have a keybind to just go into walk with gun shoes instead of cancel aura. But you're absolutely correct that now that Radnax is back, there, uh, that is something I should be doing. I also should be doing Caddy Stamp Whistle. So that I can refill on the fly. Get on with it, Sylvanas. Very well, War Chief. I have solved the plight of the Forsaken. As a race, you can just drink multiple of these. Oh, it caps at thirty-five minutes, it seems. We are now able to take the corpses of the fallen and create new Forsaken. What else do I need? And put mongoose there in advance god i'm so excited to do this in cataclysm classic and do cataclysm classic speedruns i i'm actually so fucking pumped for that it's gonna be so much fun uh okay i can switch to assassination true yeah chori i if i didn't have volpera racial that fruit would have actually been helpful there uh evasion is definitely the first thing i want What difference is there between you and the Lich King now? Isn't it obvious, War Chief? I serve the Horde. Watch your clever mouth. Report when next we meet. 
remember, Stefan. Eventually, we all have to stand before our men. What am I missing? I have sprint. And I think this is all I really have at the moment. Oh yeah, that's actually... I just saw Forgotten said... Will I use the instant... Is the trading post mount instant cast? Is it actually? Room. What is the... um? What's the fucking trading post mount? I guess I can just check the name. Eve's Ghastly Rider. Eve's... It is instant cast. It, this must be only Hollow's End, right? That's actually... I did not know it was instant cast, so that's interesting. Thank you for telling me. Um, I could have sworn that I tried that before Hollow's End. Okay, it's... Yeah. I was going to say, if that was always instant cast, then I was going to lose my mind, because I definitely thought I tried that. But that's actually pretty cool tech. I was not aware that it was instant cast. Um, huh. Yeah, that's... I mean, we had a long discussion on, I think it was the Warrior stream, about the, like, including the Magic Broom, like, the regular one, in the route. But that absolutely falls within, like, fair use, because it's obtainable by literally anybody. So there's no reason to rule it out. So that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, one of the only things is not... You're absolutely correct, Chori, that I think right now the Fruit Basket would help. I have literally zero ranged pulling options, so... What was the, the thing? Fruit Basket? Um... Yeah. So, if I put that on... 5... And, okay, I can just... Let's actually round up some of these mobs, get them to attack me. Don't think the bear leashed? Yeah. Yeah, a little bit slow, especially at lower levels, definitely. And now we can just kill the worgen. Bear with me a little bit, because I for this section I still need to focus a little bit. It's not as mindless, because I'm I mean I haven't played Assassination. I've looked at builds, I know generally what I'm gonna be running and like how to play it, but I have not done practice or anything. So still trying to make sure I'm doing everything correctly. There's or howl, or Gorfang, whatever, close enough. And, and sprints. I'll have what I should do. There's a few more worgen guys that I can kill. Not having a lot of mobility at this stage is a little bit rough. Don't forget about the extra rares. Yeah. I mean, it, since it's the PTR, they're almost certainly going to be up. I haven't looked into all of their locations, but I think I have it memorized. But it's been a little bit. Uh, this is actually, this is definitely a Radnax angle. As I already know that Gorhowl won't be at his usual spot. Oh, Nightlash does go into that building. Okay, I did not realize that. Yeah. Wish I had a cancel or a macro for that now. Uh, I could grab another Radnax gem, but I think the distance generally is not enough to justify it. I can save a little bit of time. Cheeky little goblin glider there. 
and come on. And then the moment I kill Bulgath, I should be able to gun shoes again. And we'll head back to where the other I need clean beast guts. Somehow I didn't get enough off the mobs I killed. Alright. There should be enough, like, right outside, though. Unlike the original broom, it can't be used while moving. Yeah, I just noticed that firsthand. Realized I wasn't able to do it on the move. Just a little bit of an inconvenience, but... Oh, I didn't loot these mobs. That explains it. Yeah, I can't... Really, I did not get beast guts from that? Alright. That's, uh... I've gotten some really bad RNG with these drops. This actually may be the worst RNG I've ever seen for this particular quest. I don't think... I. What the hell is happening? <laughs> okay, this is actually really bad. I don't think I've ever had to kill so many mobs for this. I mean, it happens, though. RNG on quest drops is definitely not something that always rears its ugly head. There are a few quests where you notice it a lot. Like, a few quests in Duskwood are really annoying like that. This one, I generally speaking, have not had a problem with. But, in theory, anything that is not guaranteed. Holy shit. Uh, yeah, this is actually really bad. That especially, because now there's no other mobs anywhere near. I think I need to go all the way out here just to get one more ferocious grizzly. That's a little bit unfortunate. Let's just pretend that I queued into Escape from Durnhold if this was like an actual regular run and I was doing dungeons. that It's effectively the same level of time loss. In fact, compared to that, this is pretty innocuous. Okay, so... So I turn this stuff in. Then I think there's... It's the closet RP. After that... Or is it Murlocs first? I think it might be the Murlocs one first. Yeah, it is Murlocs. I always forget the exact order of these. Kind of blends together at the start. Yep. Uh, when do you know the quest versus dungeons while leveling? My guide covers all of that. TLDR is you do dungeons early. But I include like the specific times in which you want to do it. Okay. I can read a few messages... Will I use the... Oh, yeah, I've just referenced that. Um, yeah, so something amusing uh, forgot is... Or forgotten, I think is how you're supposed to read that. Uh, will Garrosh call Sylvanas a clever bitch in Cataclassic? Unfortunately, I'm pretty sure it'll be removed. It's hard to say for sure, because there are some weird things that are missing in terms of their, like, puritanical crusade on Wrath Classic. They got a lot of it. Um, I think they missed some of the fruit paintings. So, they, there's a few women on Wrath Classic that weren't successfully turned into fruit. So, they technically didn't catch everything. And there is a gear set called Gypsy Leather in Classic that got name changed in, uh, like, Retail WoW. And it's still named Gypsy Armor in Classic. So, uh, I was... I remember being very confused when I was, like, searching transmog prices for Gypsy Armor, like, on the Undermine Journal. I was like, how much is this worth on, you know, retail WoW? Because I got it on Classic, and I couldn't find the item name. And then I realized that Blizzard changed it. But for whatever reason, that change did not carry over into Wrath. So, I don't know for sure. I would say it's probable... That, uh, I, I think the reason why some of that stuff got missed is because it was technically implemented back, like, when Classic first came out, and maybe they only did the changes on the retail client itself. I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing that anything new will probably include their changes, because I think they're probably working backwards from that.
So I can go into the sit up here. Come on. There we go. Uh that dialogue aged very well with Shadowlands. Yeah, I mean, hey. Look, Garrosh was not perfect, but a lot of what Garrosh did actually was pretty justified. Minus the whole, you know, genocide thing. That that, you know, that part was pretty bad. Um Garrosh could have been a much better character if he was actually written consistently instead of like the random villain arc towards the end. But that's something I've talked about a lot. Yeah, the I, I guess it is like a seasonal speed run, but I think it, that that is actually a good point though, Jory, because if it is only instant cast during Hollow's Ends, does that count as a major advantage? I'll use it for now because this isn't like a super serious speeder in any way. We're not breaking any world records with fucking Assassination Rogue. So I'm not too concerned about, oh man, is it going to give me an unfair advantage because I am playing with the biggest disadvantage possible by playing one of the worst leveling specs in the game. Um, but it is an interesting question of is it fair to use Eve's Ghastly Rider? It's definitely more fair than Magic Broom. Magic Broom, the biggest issue I had with it was the RNG. Because obviously the RNG was bad. Uh, Eve's Ghastly Rider, because you effectively get it for free. I think the other issue, though, is it's a monthly trading post reward, right? So... That's a little bit iffy, because we don't know when they're bringing that back. Obviously, right now, everybody has access to it, but let's say next Halloween, it's, like, still not been obtainable. It hasn't been added to, like, the regular mount rotation. I think none of the monthly reward mounts have been re-added just yet. Presumably, they find a way to reintroduce that for people who missed it, but since we don't know of how they plan on doing that just yet, that also could potentially throw a wrench in things. It... Like I said, though, that would not be a concern until at least um, next Halloween, but it is something to consider at the very least. I don't really know what the best way to handle that would be. But I think at least for this particular speedrun right now, it's fair. If it's a long-term thing, it's a little bit harder to say. Uh, I'm not going to... Do anything just yet because i'm about to get gun shoes in like five seconds and then the moment i get to the next area i'm going to have uh a mailbox to get rat and axe from first mount to be reintroduced will be the nether drake do they confirm that already like did is there an interview where they say that or are you just taking a wild guess there I could believe that for sure, because it is definitely a more impactful mount than a lot of the others. Although the Spectral Tiger lookalike, I think, is another one that a lot of people who miss the initial month are probably going to want. Uh, I'm also not going to get the, the pumpkin stuff. Let's see, you can take Faint off my bars. Throw the fruit at that mob. So Mutilate is a generator. Okay. Uh, you have a shield on your warrior on Classic called Gypsy something and you're a little concerned. Yeah. I think that's a chest, right? Yeah. I could see it was a chest through the little fire animation. I just recognized the top of like the Classic uh, chest model seared into my memory. Also, this is a regular chest spawn that happens a lot. Um, oh, fuck. No. Why does this bug it out? Um, I might be fine. I don't know what the range on this is. Uh, this is... There's no way to fix this outside of abandoning the quest. Or going all the way back, at which point you might as well have abandoned it anyway. I'm pretty sure I'm fucked. Well, I've gotten pretty unlucky this run so far. A rare bug uh, on top of everything else that's already happened is not ideal. Uh, I guess for people who 
weren't paying super close attention and weren't uh, watching what happened. Basically, there is a rare bug that happens if you jump over the little siege machines there. Oh. Hold up. Let me just test this. Does it spawn the orc sea pup? Radinax despawns the orc sea pup. That is actually something I had no idea. All right. Well, uh, good thing I sent over extra Radinax gems because that one got completely burned. Wow. <laughs> this is really not going well. Get it kind of fucked right now. Um, yeah, if you jump over the little catapults, sometimes the orc sea dog will snap to your location and it will never snap back. It gets stuck up there. You can't move it. Because the boxes are minimum range, you can't actually throw the boxes to it, and there's no way to snap it back, so the only thing you can do is go pick up the quest again, which is not good. Going so well right now. I encountered a lot of very fringe issues that I almost never run into during these runs, all in the same run. Uh, but uh, thank you, Maru Shira. I appreciate the encouragement, though. Okay. I have no other speed boosts at the moment. So, grab that. And I need one more Blood Fang scavenger. Okay. Uh, I think once I've completed the quest, it doesn't matter if it despawns. I'm pretty sure that's how that works, but I guess we'll find out if my memory on that is correct or not. But I, right now, I'm really not good as far as mobility goes. So... A little bit counts. There's another Radinax gem. Yeah, this is like anti-streamer luck. Um, yes, okay, I am good. I, I'm glad I remembered that correctly. Would have been disastrous if I misremembered that somehow and actually know you needed uh, to have the guy out there with you, but no, it seems we're good. Uh, the Forest Eden, I think by the time I'm done in the mine, it should be right around the outside area. So we can round up a bunch of these spiders... And then it's going to evasion. Never going to use kidney shot while leveling, so I can just take that off. And oh, thought I killed that. Yeah, admittedly, at low levels, I think Outlaw, just the fact it has Pistol Shot, puts it ahead. Because Assassination so far, unless, like, maybe Sub has nothing either, we'll see. But having literally no ability to pull things from range, and also fairly weak mobility in general, definitely makes this not so great at lower levels. We'll see if it uh gets better later on. And especially mobility should improve the moment I get like better mount stuff. But at the moment, it's definitely a bit of a problem. And this is also, I think, a good example of why mobility matters. Because I've heard a lot of people say before that they don't think mobility should be such a big factor when like comparing different specs because you have items like gun shoes, like goblin gliders, to take a lot of that out of like the class's hands. Like, the stuff is kind of similar, but this is where it's important. Like, the difference between Druid and Monk low-level mobility and, uh, like, mo Rogue mobility, as we see here, it's a pretty sizable difference. And it absolutely can add up. Also, somehow my nameplate range got turned way down. Do not know how that happens, but I'm going to quickly... Oh, I think it's just I had always show nameplates unchecked. I think that maybe should fix it. Maybe that's why, yeah. 
I also don't really have any other talents at the moment that would help me much at all. Let me double check. Um, cheat death, deadly poison, and... Well, I don't even have Garrote or Rupture right now, so that is a weird talent to put early on. Like, that is one of the other problems with a lot of, like, the design we see here. So, I'm getting a talent that only has an impact whenever I do damage with Garrote or Rupture. I do not have either ability. <laughs> um, when do I get them? I get Garrote at level 15... And I get Rupture at level 17. So that talent is able to be taken at level 13, but you literally can get nothing out of it for like the next four levels. That is just... Yeah. Like, I don't know. I get that they don't always consider leveling stuff when designing the talent trees. I get it. It's an afterthought. You more so care about the end game performance. But... Would there really be any major difference if this was here, for instance, Seal Faith or something like that? I don't know. It's just, it seems like kind of poor design if you can't then say, okay, well, I have a talent tree that fundamentally doesn't work with the spec at low levels and not do anything to fix that. Like, maybe just make it so you redesign the levels in which you get those abilities. Like, would it really be a problem? if Assassination Rogue had access to Garrote and Rupture right now, or at least one of the two, right? Garrote or Rupture, by the time those abilities are a thing. I think it is pretty fair to say, at least, that there should be no talents that when you take them while leveling, they do nothing. The pathing can be, like, maybe not ideal, but having completely dead talents is just really not good. And I think especially, like, as a new player who maybe doesn't realize that they are not the concern for Blizzard. It might feel a little bit disheartening looking at stuff like that and being like, they clearly put zero thought into this, huh? And I do think that the kind of treatment they give leveling and new player experience stuff in general needs to improve for reasons like that. And many others, right? There's, there's a lot of clear cases of uh, low-level stuff really not being well handled, but well uh, yeah i don't know why you have to stand still that's actually kind of frustrating uh, i also just realized i technically forgot to uh, i forgot to get a new radinax before i left that zone not a big concern because i think this is the only situation where it, one charge of it might have been slightly useful. Because here, I'm going to use XA-1000. I shouldn't need to use any of the movement items while I'm on the lake. And then the moment I get back from the lake, we immediately teleport to the Sepulchre anyway. So, effectively, very minor time loss. Which I was able to mitigate through using Goblin Glider regardless. Where do you even get this Fruit Basket, basket toy, by the way? Because uh, I know, Chori, you recommended that I use it, and I happen to have it, but I I have a lot of random toys that I've gotten over the years, and I don't exactly remember where all of them came from. So if you could like let me know where it's from, because that is actually kind of useful. I think Assassination so far is one of the only specs I've played that has literally zero ranged pulling option early on in the leveling process. Usually you have something, like even if it's just a taunt or heroic throw or something like that, you have ways to round up mobs. I genuinely cannot think off the top of my head of a spec that is melee but doesn't have the ability to pull mobs from the very start. So that puts it in a uniquely bad position to the point where it is probably something worth mentioning in a guide. It's a garrison reward. Oh, fuck. Well, that, uh... In that case, I actually may not mention it. If it was easy to pick up, then I would probably mention it, but I... Yeah, I don't think it's worth getting the garrison just for that. Unfortunate.
And... Real quick. Cinematic canceler. I gotta disable that. Uh, hello, Spicy Knife. Good to see you. Leave. The rare is in the basement, right? You know what? I think the rare can't appear during this section. I think if you want to kill that rare, you have to do it outside of the worgen part. Because the rare is definitely up, right? It's the PTR. There's no way it's down. So if it's not there, that clearly means that it's phased. Which makes sense. A lot of times that's the case. Let me just type something real quick on Discord. Um, oh, well, so put out the full patch notes for Guardians of the Dream. And wow, they actually, you know what? Kudos to Blizzard. They actually announced the chapter release dates ahead of time this time. It, that is, they normally do not do that. So... That is actually really good on Blizzard's part. Um, join Rathian and Viranoth. Okay, wait, hold up. Blizzard has revealed campaign chapters and dates for story content coming in, blah, 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 blah. So the way that this is worded, the, and knowing Blizzard, it might just be not made clear is it's i wouldn't rule it out with this company it seems to imply that all of the campaign chapters for mirdrasil are available at launch because the only other ones is misfit dragons which releases on november 14th that's the week of the raid but that quest line is not part of the amir Drasil campaign that is just a generic dragonflight campaign chapter and then Reforging Tear is unrelated to Amir Jusil. So those are not actually part of like the reputation rewarding campaign quests, which seems to imply that you have access to everything from day one, which I don't know if that's the case because they definitely time-gated the Aberyst campaign. So I kind of figured they would do the same for Amir Jusil too. But... I mean, hey, pleasantly surprised if they chose not to do that. Uh, I honestly, the way Blizzard tends to work with that stuff, though, it's kind of hard to say for certain until we actually like see it on live servers. I also, I can use some of my gear. Actually, oh, it's level sixteen. I thought I got some thirteen stuff. It's not. Uh, I need to refresh my food buff. And, oh, that was the quest I was looking at. Yeah, I don't want the... Don't want that thing. Right, we're going to use gun shoes first. But that actually makes me hopeful. Wait, Garot has no instant damage. Kind of sucks. Uh, that makes Garot significantly weaker than I thought. Hmm. Yeah. If Garrod had instant damage, then it would be able to immediately proc trinkets and stuff like that. The fact that it doesn't, it will probably... Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I did not realize you were available right now. Shadow Step actually is very helpful. Uh, my dad brought me coffee and water, which is huge. Let me just... Um... In fact, I actually, I really need water. <laughs> Ah, my throat was starting to really bother me, especially when you talk for a while. I forgot to get, like, a fresh bottle of water before starting the stream, so that was a little bit rough, but we're good. Um, stream's going pretty good so far. Had a little bit of a poor RNG, but it happens. It's nothing that I can't manage. Um, a goblin glider just as, like, a slight mobility boost. 
think that might mean that it's down for the next section, but it's like I don't even really care too much. Sprint. This should be the last one that I need. And I'm just going to mount up. There is sometimes a chest in here. It's not guaranteed to be up, even though it's the PTR, just because... Oh, well, there it is. It is up. Uh, but sometimes there's other spawn locations that I wouldn't normally check where it could be. You're generally going to find a lot of chests in the PTR. And I happen to, at least in Silver Pine, I know basically every single chest location, so... Uh, the only ones that I don't check are so far off the beaten path that if I went out for them, it wouldn't even be efficient. But... Uh... No. Yeah, so normally I would use Glider. I would run up the hill and stuff. I actually think Radnax is faster here, which is why I wasn't too concerned about burning a Goblin Glider use a little bit earlier. I'm going to quickly scan for Lost Son of Aragal. In case it's on this part of its patrol range. Dip this way. Oh, fuck that up slightly. Yeah, getting improved sprints definitely feels really good. No loss of Aragal just yet. There are still chances to encounter him later on. I can clear up my bags. A little bit. Have all my buffs refreshed. Yep, yep. We're good on everything. I can refresh Crippling Poison and Deadly Poison. And extend this. And I think that's it for right now. And I'm in range, I think? There we go, yeah. Sometimes you're not in range to get that. Radinax up this way. Going to exit. Uh, hmm. Unfortunate timing. If I was a little bit closer, I could have Goblin Glidered off that. Doesn't really matter. Slipped around. Uh, is that barrel on your back a mog or a quest item? Yeah, it's a quest item. I think if you pick up the quest, you can actually carry it around with you, at least in some areas. There were a lot of quests like that in Cataclysm, and I remember a lot of level 19 twinks would abuse that. They would uh, carry around like little quest items on their back in Cataclysm and stuff. I think they fixed a lot of those, unfortunately, so it might not work anymore. But I believe that for a while that was a thing you can do. I'm trapped in a prison of flesh. Yes, that is a good way to describe life in general. Uh, I can Goblin Glider over to that rare mob. So this is one of the new rare mobs, Ravenclaw Regent. This one is really easy to access. Because it is right along the questing route. Just a very small detour right over there. And... And yeah, I know I haven't read a lot of messages. I will try to get around to every single one of them eventually. Especially in Gilneas, there's like a ton of RP. Right? I have like a ton of time to read stuff. So, should be much easier than... But this is a little bit unfamiliar for me. Uh, did I mess around with Stardew Valley? I've never played Stardew Valley, no. Never touched it. I've heard good things about it, but... I mean, to be frank, it was... It was never really, like, my type of game. Um, I, like, I get why people like it. I've heard a lot of people have told me that they didn't expect to like it, and they still enjoyed it. I believe that. I completely believe that it's like a very, very, very good game for what it is, but I 
don't really think that I would personally have fun with it, so I've never tried. Um, I, I've looked into it, I've watched people play it, so it's not like I'm, I know nothing about it, I'm just writing it off. It seems neat, but I need a little bit more than what it, uh, what I've seen it offers to really keep me interested. And I'm, generally speaking, not the type of person who likes playing cozy games for the sake of it being like a cozy game. Like, there are things within World of Warcraft or Final Fantasy or whatever where it's, like, much more relaxed and fun. Um, and I can, you know, just play that when I want to relax. Honestly, mobile games are really good for that. Lately, my, like, cozy game that I want to play when I'm, like, just relaxed has been Honkai Star Rail on my phone. And, you know, if I'm ever just kind of, like, tired or bored and I just want something to play, I just, you know, there's a few things in that game that I can just kind of chill. The thing I really like about Honkai Star Rail in general is that it has both, right? It has a lot of, like, chill stuff that you can do for fun, and then it actually has a lot of really min-maxy, like, endgame um, challenges. So it kind of has, like, really the perfect combination for me, which is really what I look for in a lot of MMOs. Uh, a lot of MMOs have, like, you know, fun, chill things. Like, hell, World of Warcraft, uh, one of the things that I like doing when I'm bored is I just go collect shit. Uh, usually toys, transmog, I, a lot of people, I'm sure, the same way. But a lot of times I do like going around just farming things, um, like optimizing stuff just for shits and giggles. But usually it's for a bigger purpose. Like, I'm farming transmog and WoW, and it's it's not the most fun thing, but it's something to do when I'm really bored, and I know that, hey, maybe that item that I just farmed is something I'll use eventually, but general, like, laid-back, just pure for fun games like that, if they don't have, like, something to really keep me interested and there's not, like, an end goal, I tend to get pretty bored. Now, who knows, maybe... I'm completely wrong on this, and I would actually really enjoy Stardew Valley if I played it. But I I don't know. I don't think I would, personally. Also, I'm going to put Shiv... Put Shiv on Shift-T. I'll eventually want to use it to get the nature damage debuff, but right now it has kind of lost its purpose, because I have enough abilities that I don't really have a reason to press Shiv. I still want to press Fruit Basket. Um, quickly, unfortunately, this, this is a little bit of RP, but I still need to pick my talents. Uh, I think I definitely want Cloak of Shadows, because that's going to be pretty good at certain points. Um, Venomous Wounds, at this point, I have online. I don't have Venom yet, so that's useless. The problem with building into Grote right now when things are dying in one hit is, like, there's no real points. So I think this will at least give me energy refunds every time Grote or Rupture deal bleed damage. And I want to build into this by the time I hit level 19. Um, Actually, I, like, when do I get Envenom? Envenom is... Level 2... Why?! Why isn't Venom level 22? And this is... What? What is this? I mean, like, I get that there's probably some reasoning why the tree is designed like this for endgame stuff. But... Why... Is in Venom at level 22 if it's part of top row talents? Does a Vis count for it? I guess it's something that I can try. I'll be able to try it. The wording does not change, though. So, it, like, if Envenom did replace... Uh, well, I believe Event Envenom replaces Avis. But if Venom replaced Avis and the thing was coded to work off both of them, in theory, it should update uh, automatically and say Eviscerate extends the blah 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 blah. Does Rupture deal instant damage? It does not. So then it's kind of worthless as a spender. At least right now. Um, it should update wording, but you're pretty sure it will work. It's just shitty wording. Okay. I'll take your word for it. Um, I 
I'll use Eviscerate here. Well, I guess we'll test. Uh, if Eviscerate does count, then yeah, that's a different story. But then, obviously, still shitty wording. But it will be very bad if it does not count. Hmm. I feel like at this point... Applying bleeds and then quickly running to the next target. It, see, this is a little bit of a weird play style, right? Because I think this is the most efficient way to play it. Like, you apply your bleeds to multiple targets, and then apply poisons to get the energy refunds. So there, I, I got all of my, my poisons up on the target. I'm getting energy refunds, so... I'm allowed to, like, continue doing this, and if there were multiple mobs, like, this is not a very good goblin glider, but it's better than nothing. And I won't have many uses for goblin glider later. Like, on a single target, this honestly isn't terrible, because, like, you get actually value from those bleeds. Uh, here I am actually going to use... I should have grabbed another Radnax gem before I left the Sepulcher, but oh well. Forgot. We're gonna gun shoes. Don't take your word for it. Yeah. It's all good. I mean, you are right that it definitely should work like that. I'm just, I'm only skeptical because of the wording. Because they usually do have the wording update naturally. But I know you said that, like, you think in this case it's just, like, actual wording issue and not a mechanical issue, which very well could be. Uh, oh, there's actually a huge clump of Wolfsbane right here. Okay, there's three in a row here that I can use. Can you Shadow Step to a friendly target? I guess either way, I can shadow step to this Highland Fox. And it doesn't put me in combat, which is actually quite good as far as mobility is concerned. We can Radnax back the way we came. Nice little bounce off the top there. Uh, level 18 means I should have access to... And one thing I could do... <laughs> this is so dumb. Uh, where did I drop Caddy's Stamp Whistle? I can't find wherever I dropped Caddy's Stamp Whistle. I was gonna go over to Caddy, and... I was gonna talk to her and grab another charge of Radinax. But I couldn't find it. I didn't get any blitzing worgen down the road this time, thankfully. You'll take credit if it works. Fair enough. Yeah. It despawns if you go out of range. I never knew that. Huh. That's weird. Does it despawn if the person who summoned it goes out of range? Or if... Nobody, like, no other players in range. That is definitely a really interesting quirk that I had no idea was a thing. So I'm gonna go over to the water here. And get a little bit of a time save. Okuna Perch has a longer range to despawn. Yeah, I've always been using Caddy Stamp Whistle just because I figured why not. I didn't realize there was a difference. But if Okuna Perch has an actual advantage, then suddenly it becomes just a better Caddy Stamp Whistle. Uh, oh yeah, so something I was going to say earlier in regards to this playstyle for Sub Rogue is technically speaking, it's perfectly fine here for me to just like go around and... Like, apply poisons, apply bleeds, and then I'm just moving on to the next target. And it doesn't matter, because my bleeds are going to finish off the target anyway. 
But if there is a mob that you need to actually loot a quest item off of, suddenly this doesn't work. And that is why, generally speaking, play styles like this, where you're kiting a bunch of mobs behind you with dots and stuff, is not super great. It's, for instance, one of the reasons why Boomkin leveling was not super good, even though, wow, as Boomkin, you can starfall tons of mobs down at the same time. That's cool, but then you still need to run around and loot a lot of those mobs in many cases, and that part, not so great. I think I tried to thread the needle between these two mobs, and I failed miserably and pulled both of them. So, unlucky. Kind of the same as Feral Druid? Eh, not quite as much. Um, Feral Druid has a lot of burst damage while leveling. It depends on the build that you're going with, but if you watch my Feral Druid run, Guardian is still 100% better, don't get me wrong. But the Feral Druid build that I ran was very much like a... You apply bleeds, but then you still sit there and you, like, blast the mobs with um, Brutal Slash and stuff. And that is where a lot of your damage comes from. So, Feral Druid is more so you kind of stay in melee. You have, like, uh, more ways to do upfront damage. And also, because it's AoE, like, the main thing is, I think once I get Fan of Knives, this is going to get a lot easier. Which is, well, literally, wow, my timing is impeccable. Uh, right now... <laughs> When I get Phantom Knives, this is going to be a lot easier. Um, I still don't have a ranged pulling tool, and I don't know if I'm going to get one. Honestly, rogues should just get like an ability called Shuriken or something that just lets them pull from a distance. I feel like that would make a lot of sense. So I don't know why it's not a thing. It literally just heroic throw, but for rogues. I, I don't know why it isn't an option. I'm gonna jump over to the water here to XA1000. Feral gets the damage boost. Yeah, I mean, Feral has a lot of, like, good stuff early on. It's not like this where it's lacking. The thing is, Moonfire as a druid is by far your best ability, which is one of the reasons why Guardian is so good. Um, because you get, like, all of the benefits of being in melee range... But you still have Moonfire, which is one of the strongest low-level abilities in the game. So, yeah, this feels so much better. Fan of Knives definitely solves the exact issue that I was just complaining about, but obviously that makes the first 19 or so levels a little bit problematic. Um, that said, this still isn't great. In fact, I am very surprised at how poorly this damage is scaling. Moonfire, for instance, hits way harder than that. Okay. The energy region is also really bad at this level. This is, like, pitiful energy region. Uh, I need to find one of the groups with dogs. Okay, there's a guy. No, 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 no. I need to get in shadow step range, and I think, yep, yeah, make it. Nice. Yeah, Fan of Knives being a generator, too, helps a little bit. That should be all I need, and now I can gun shoes straight to the end. I think, I don't know if I can gun shoes all the way there, but I can definitely goblin glider. So I can go up this way. And swing around. Worst case scenario, if I hit the water, I can always just do another XM1000. But I think I have just the right angle for this. Yeah, this will be, like, the perfect angle, and I can XA 1000 for, like, a little tiny bit. Perfect. Actually worked out quite well. There we go. Let me quickly spend any available talent points. Second charge of Shadow Step. Uh, cut to the chase. We can test to see if that works with Eviscerate. 
Uh, what else do I need? I shouldn't need to refresh XP pot just yet. Oh yeah, I can equip this. That'll be a bit of a boost compared to the starting gear, but that's not going to make up, like, a really large difference in terms of damage. Oh, I also forgot to socket this stuff. I didn't even think of that. Fuck me. Yeah, I forgot to get a lot of this gear prepped. Um... It'll still be an upgrade, but not by nearly as much. Whatever. At least the higher item level stuff doesn't have sockets anyway, so it's not a concern. You get Poison Knife after level 20. Oh. Brian Sang said you should have an... Yeah, so a few people are saying Poison Knife. Um, 29? That is such a high level to get a generic ranged pulling option. What the fuck are they thinking? There is absolutely no way that a generic ranged pulling option should be locked behind level 29. That is insanity. Like, why even have the new talent tree? So, this is right here. This is a key issue with the old system that we had in Shadowlands. And one of the reasons why I've said many times, a lot of specs that historically were very weak for leveling have gotten much stronger. Like, Enhancement is a good example. Enhancement used to be not really that great for leveling. Because while Enhancement has so many good options, all of them were like level 40, level 50, level 60, back when like leveling went up to 120. So you were so bad for like the first large chunk of the leveling process. And it got better later on, but it never really hit the same highs. And now, the advantage of the talent tree is like Enhancement can just path into all of the stuff that they want really early on. And that is the same thing for many other specs. Shadow Priest massively benefits from the talent tree. Shadow Priest gets all of the stuff it wants in its kit online very, very early on. I mean, I, I could name a million different options. There's so many specs that really benefited from that Dragonflight talent tree change because now instead of only getting their best ability much later on, they get it so early. But for whatever fucking reason, I don't know why rogues now have... I mean, this should just be fucking baseline. There's absolutely no reason this should be level 29. But having, like, all of your core abilities tied to talent points instead of or tied to like specific levels instead of talent points like why why isn't i don't know venomous wounds should be and this is how almost every single other spec in the game works mind you just make venomous wounds a baseline passive that unlocks at, at level 25 and then replace this with mutilate functionally at end game nothing changes but it means leveling is so much smoother if you look at, like, 90% of specs in the game right now, their first, like, five talents are different abilities. You have all of your core abilities front-loaded, and you choose the order in which you want to unlock them. And random-ass passives, like Improved Shiv, which, what does this do for me? Like, how does Improved Shiv help me at level 12 or something? It doesn't. This is, if this was a baseline passive unlocked at level 50, and in place of Improved Shift, you had in Venom, functionally nothing would change for Endgame, except now, suddenly, leveling feels so much better. It's nonsensical design, and it is so far behind the way that almost every other spec in the game is designed in Dragonflight. Which is a shame, because rogues have all, always been a bit of a, a difficult spec to level as. So... There's a reason why, in the past, I always said, like, Shadow Priest or Boomkin or something was the worst spec in the game to level as. And I said rogues were up there, but they were not the worst. It's because, like, while rogues were never great, because they do have a lot of gener generic problems, like survivability, low mobility, etc. A lot of the other really good specs got a ton of amazing tools with Dragonflight, and rogues got fucking nothing. For whatever reason. I don't know why. And this is pretty egregious. Honestly, Outlaw's changes were better than this. I, I kind of didn't realize how bad some of that was. Like, when I was looking at Assassination, I'm very glad that I did the, the full Assassination 10 to 60 run, because this is very bad and it really highlights that problem with this spec. Because... Outlaw at least had most of its kit early on. That's not to say it felt great, even still, but 
Outlaw at least felt complete from pretty much the very beginning. This does not. Not even slightly. And that's not good. That should not be a thing. I should have used Cloak of Shadows there. Um, fuck me. Ah. Uh... Okay, uh... You're talking about bad class design when the class is designed and balanced by the same person who does vengeance. God, I know. Ah, I'm I'm unfortunately fully aware of that, and that is another issue that I think Blizzard has. I don't understand why they have class designers and not like people assigned to cover specific specs, because I don't I don't even fully blame the DH Rogue developer. He designs melee DPS, and then he's told that he also needs to design a tank spec. Like, what the fuck is he gonna do? It's it's like setting him up for failure. So, of course he's gonna have no fucking idea what to do for Vengeance DH. Now, honestly, I have heard that he is not really that bad of a dev when it comes to, like, Rogue and Havoc Demon Hunter. He apparently makes generally good decisions. People seem to be kind of happy with most of what he's done. But he has clearly no idea what he's doing for vengeance and uh, tanks play very differently to dps so there should be like a tank designer or at least split the tanks like 50 50 give half of them to one dev half of them to another but it makes no sense to have somebody who's primarily designing melee dps also design a tank spec that's i mean the problem with that is like that's like me complaining about Blizzard's company is poorly managed, more at 11, right? It's something where me complaining about that is not going to, like, fundamentally at all change the way that, like, Blizzard structures their stuff. And quite frankly, it, it is a bit of a cop-out, right? Like, obviously, a good developer should be able to do both. He obviously can't, and it has been shown time and time again, but that is that is definitely something that has irked me, and I've thought about on a few different occasions. But oh well. Um, there have been egregious Havoc rogue problems. Havoc's had horrible shit for a long time. Momentum, it's like he doesn't play it. Yeah. I don't, like I said, I don't interact with... I, I, I mean, we all... Anybody within the community knows the dev's name, but I'm not going to say it because obviously I don't, like... I don't want to encourage that because, like, he's not, to my knowledge, a bad person. Um... But, you know, I, I just have problems with some of the design decisions that he's making. And I think credit where it's due, he at least communicates with a lot of people in the community. And, oh, nice chest. That is more than can be said for a lot of developers. The reason why I'm not too hard on him, and I, I, know, I know what you're saying, Naomi, there have been a lot of design issues. That is completely fair. He at least does talk to a lot of at least the rogue theory crafters um because i've heard on numerous occasions especially koji uh would talk about like reels just said his name uh developers said this or that um and he at least communicates with a lot of the the top level players to try and get an understanding of the class uh so credit where it's due that is infinitely more work than a lot of the other WoW developers have put into, like, making sure that their spec is well-designed. Uh, could he do a lot better? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. But, you know. Take what you can get. Also, how is my potion... Oh, yeah, my potion just fell off. I, I don't know how long I didn't have my potion. I've been looking at, um... I've been looking at the timer in the YouTube playback, which my personal YouTube playback is like 10 minutes behind. And in that, I still have five minutes left to refresh my potion. Uh, but I forgot to actually check the buff that's on my fucking screen. There. Uh, nice. And another chest. Duplicate chest. We got this one earlier, but obviously war mode, different phase. So able to get it again which is why i'm checking this 
So there's a chance for double stuff. Should be a rule that you can't be a Blizzard dev without at least 1k playtime hours minimum. I mean, maybe. Like, while I would probably partially agree with you, if you are... I, I think exact playtime numbers... I, I know you're partially joking. Um, love, obviously. But... I do think that, at the very least, it is very fair to say that you need to be actively playing whatever spec it is that you're designing. Like, I may not actively play Blood DK or Guardian Druid or whatever a lot right now. I've actually been playing them a little bit more than I have in recent years. Um, but I'm more just saying, like, stuff that I haven't played a ton. If I were the designer for those specs, I would make it a point to constantly keep that character up to date. Because I would consider that part of my job description. If I am supposed to be the Blood DK or whatever, I'm pulling Blood DK out of a hat. I'm not criticizing the Blood DK designer. Um, though, uh, I one criticism I do have for Blood DK, fucking kill Bone Shield as a build. It's been here since Legion and it needs to go. But that's just side tangent. Um, but I would consider that literally part of my job description as a developer. Of At the very least, I need to play and actively test... Uh, and be knowledgeable on the thing that I am designing. Because I think that is one of the biggest issues a lot of people at Blizzard have, a lot of designers have, is they get too hyper-fixated on how their game should work in theory. And then the reality of World of Warcraft is there's going to be a lot of things that they don't think of that the community, who is hyper-min-max focused, and I'm guilty of that too, but, you know, you got to understand your player base. And like it or not, th these are the people that you're designing your game for. It's people who are really crazy about min-maxing and want to be as hyper-efficient as possible. And if you know that that is who your game is designed for, I mean, you could either just kind of put your head in the sand and be like, la 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 la, I don't care, I'm going to blatantly make things that my player base won't enjoy because I dislike my players. And a lot of times... It, playing World of Warcraft, it does feel like Blizzard actively, in many cases, dislikes their player base. And it's a very disheartening feeling sometimes, when everybody is saying, we do not like this, and Blizzard, on countless occasions, has done the, you know, it's a meme at this point, you think you do, but you don't. And it constantly feels that Blizzard f believes they know more than the actual players, and, you know, tries to make changes in spite of feedback. And uh, I think that's a problem, obviously. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> this is not a hot take, even remotely. So there's no point really going along and beating this point to death because I, I'm i well aware that pretty much every single person watching right now agrees with me. So it's not really something worth discussing. It's, uh, it, quite frankly, it's been something that has been true for many 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 years now and it has been slowly getting better which is another reason why i don't feel like beating the point to death because there are at least a decent amount of people at blizzard who i think have gotten the memo on that every once in a while they kind of regress a little bit obviously we're talking about a case in which they regressed a little bit at least in my opinion but generally speaking i feel they've been better about uh, listening to their players. Uh, normally I would not check for this chest, but we know for a fact that there's going to be a chest up. So I'm gonna check at least a lot of the easy to access spawn locations. And if it's not there, it's not there. Um, yeah, okay, I'm not gonna bother then. So there has to be a chest up, right? Obviously, because nobody else is here. It's either on the complete opposite side of Dalaran Crater, where I just don't go for the quest, or it is at the top of one of those buildings. It's one of the reasons why this is one of the lesser places in which I tend to find chests, because there's a lot of spawn locations outside of the traditional route. But it was worth checking at least some of the obvious positions that are like out in the open. Uh, here I can take a flight path. It's faster than using speed items. Okay. Let me... I, I'm going to take a moment to just quickly go up and scroll up in chat really quick because 
now that I'm kind of getting more into the flow of things. Um, oh fuck, I forgot to test the whole does eviscerate extend slice and dice. If somebody wants to test that on their own time, it it's not a huge deal, honestly, but it's just a, a very minor thing that, I, at the very least, the wording should be cleared up. Um, but let me scroll up in chat a little bit, because there were a handful of messages that I missed early on. And now that the rotation has kind of like settled and I'm a little bit more comfortable in what I'm doing, I can, can read some stuff. Uh... Trying to find wherever I left off as far as messages go. The Nether Drake is going to come back at some point. Uh, on the premise, it has customizations added. I see. Oh yeah, you think the original skin tone being from the trading post is exclusive. Yeah, I could definitely see that for the Nether Drake. That is That makes logical sense. Oh my god, that, that must have crit did a lot of damage. Uh, I'm just going to shadow step here. And what is... Envenom is a spender of combo points. Okay. That's one thing I still need to figure out. Which ones are combo point spenders? Which ones are energy generators? Um, and what does Envenom do exactly? Envenom does damage... And increases your poison poison application chance words. Um, and the duration extent or the duration extension is for the increased chance to apply poisons. Okay. Just pop evasion here. Uh and then Killing these mobs, because why not? Crimson Tempest, whenever I get that, is going to help for situations like this. Where right now, a uh, Phantom Knives is definitely a pretty good AoE generator. I wish you got it earlier, but oh well. And Crimson Tempest is a decent AoE spender, though as we'll see, it has some problems. Uh, can I actually pick it up now? No. Actually, I'm still a decent amount away. Uh... Think, do I want maneuverability? I think first thing I want is definitely Veil of Midnight and Nimble Fingers, and I'm gonna go Blind and then Airborne Irritant. Uh, right now, I think Invenom is probably still my only real option as a spender because. Rupture, unless I'm fighting, like, a single mob, which isn't usually the case at these lower points. I will say, though, uh, despite a lot of the early problems that it has, this is already feeling better than Outlaw Rogue. It's just a shame that, like, the levels at which you unlock abilities is so weird. Like, if Fan of Knives was something that I could pick up early with talent points, that would be so much better. Because then I'd presumably be able to get it at, like, I don't know, level 13 or something, instead of only getting it online at level 19, which is pretty significantly later when we're talking about leveling. But at least right now, this feels a lot better. And I just chuck some fruit at that guy. I need... Somehow none of my fan of knives hit this mob. Or at least maybe they did and they just didn't apply any poisons? No idea. Oh. 
and I can go over here, and then during this quest, I literally just spam Fan of Knives, so it should be easy. Alright. Uh, let me read a few more messages. Uh, Jordan Tolliver said, Very unfortunate bugs, but you're glad you got to catch a stream. Super enlightening. I'm glad you think so. Early Sin Rogue leveling looks terrible. Sub Rogue is much better. Level 10 Shadow Strike makes stealth worth using. And level 11 Shuriken Storm. Yeah, there's a number of reasons why I've left Sub for last. And they're actually good reasons. I actually think Sub has, out of all of the Rogue Specs, the most potential. At all levels. And the reason why I'm going to put like a lot of effort into that speedrun is I think it could actually have the potential to save Rogue. Especially with some of the changes they've made. The biggest one is Sub is getting some really nice survivability changes. And that is going to really help it on some of like the more sustained pulls, where historically the biggest issue was that you were just paper. And while, sure, Rogue has okay damage compared to like a lot of other specs, it's hard to really get full advantage of that okay damage because you can't fully kite like mages or something. And you don't have the sustain of a Fury Warrior to just sit there, like, in a pole and face tank all the damage and heal through it. So you have to spend a lot of your time kiting around mobs using relatively inefficient abilities like you saw there. I was spam casting Fan of Knives because it allowed me to stay just out of range of mobs' melee attacks. And I'm still doing a decent amount of damage. It's definitely better than Outlaw Rogues. Outlaw Rogues have fucking nothing. So... The only thing is, at very, very low levels, Outlaw at least has an advantage over Assassination in that it has Pistol Shot. And having at least some access to a ranged pulling tool is very, 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 very good at low levels. At this point, it's not nearly as big of an advantage, but uh, you definitely feel it, for sure. Uh... Oh, Wound Poison actually deals damage. So, oh, is that a... Oh, it's a lethal poison. Wait, if Wound Poison... Oh, that's lame. Yeah, where are my poisons? Yeah, I guess I still want Crippling Poison then as my other poison. Uh, I guess any... Poison that deals damage then counts as a lethal poison. Seems a bit silly considering why would you take one that's partially utility in your damaging poison slot. Okay. Then I have to use fruit to pull corpse feeder. <laughs> and chuck a gob or a full para racial at it. I mean, technically, I almost said goblin racial, but Volpera are just furry goblins at the end of the day. I'm sure somebody's going to be very offended by me saying that. You love when you have two tabs open, you try opening WoW, and your computer just shits itself. Oh yeah, that's always fun. Uh, the new player experience in WoW has been awful for a long time. Venriki put it amazingly well from a PvP standpoint, and most of it, what he said can easily apply to PvE. I mean, I I don't watch Venriki, so I don't know what he said. I would imagine PvP is probably a little bit different, though. Um, but I can't speak to that. PvP is... It's definitely a bit of a stranger onboarding process compared to like pve at least in some way you can argue that like leveling sets you up for endgame in a very very minor way but there's a reason why i've always said pvp is like not real world of warcraft it's like a mini game that is attached to wow and like that's not necessarily a bad thing but it's just it's so disconnected from like what the rest of the game is doing right now and it, which is why it always pisses me off when Blizzard forces PvPers to do PvE or vice versa. Um, especially, like, I mean, both are bad, but I hate when I have to do PvP at all for anything because it's just so different than the rest of the game, and I have no interest in doing it. You know, there are some PvP games that I enjoy, mostly card games. Quite frankly, World of Warcraft, it's not one of them. Um... You know, not knocking people who like PvP. I know there's actually a decent amount of people who watch my stream who enjoy PvP because they say that whenever I talk about this. But 
it is just really not something I have any interest in whatsoever. And, I don't know. Obviously, it's kind of impossible at this stage to make it a separate game, right? There have been, there have been people who tried to make, like, World of Warcraft PvP into, like, its own game. I think a good example was, um, like, Battle Right. Battle Right, I think, is a, the closest I've seen to something that is clearly trying to emulate, like, a World of Warcraft Arena-style thing as its own game. I actually played it a little bit with my friends. I kind of enjoyed it. It was fun. Um, completely failed miserably, though, unfortunately, but I think it had potential. Uh, and at least I, I get what they were going for with it. I'm going to garrote, and then I'm just going to kind of kite now. I did not mean to hit that. One of the other issues is mobility being tied to your, uh, like, jumping to targets. I cast blind, it went on cooldown, and it did not blind the target. I guess he's immune. But yeah, this is really bad, unfortunately. This is, by the way, Rogue's biggest problem. You don't see this a lot on a lot of pulls, because also I have, uh, I have heirlooms, right? I have heirlooms, I have BOA or BOE gear from the auction house, I have, um, like, consumables and stuff. So on most standard pulls, you're not really gonna see me struggle a whole lot. But, Rogue, and, and I can say this for a fact because I did a fresh account Rogue leveling run. Oh my god, it is brutal without heirlooms or anything. Even on standard pulls that like 90% of specs in the game can survive, Rogue has nothing. But you are paper, you will just melt. And like I said, with like the full heirlooms and stuff, you're not really going to feel that on a lot of regular pulls. But that highlights, I think, the biggest issues with Rogue right there. That pull, it's a notoriously difficult pull, the General Marstone pull. To the point where in my, I did a monk like testing run or a monk testing video where I like compared builds and stuff like that. And uh, one of the tests that I use to compare like different specs is General Marstone. And I think he is one of the most difficult like situations that you'll encounter in the, uh, at least the horde leveling experience. Should probably just use Vanish for this. No reason not to. Uh, and I could put Vanish on Shift-H. It's a good spot for it. Uh, what do I want to take for talent points? I'm using Garrote and Rupture enough that this is probably worth it now. Then I'll probably take Garrote dealing increased damage. That's worth it. Uh, I'll start using Garrote when mobs live a little bit longer, so building into it now is not the worst thing I can do. This is a good area for one charge of Radnax. Uh, the barrier to entry to a lot of endgame content makes you surprised WoW isn't completely dropped off the face of the earth with how little new players we see. Ah, uh, so... It depends on what you mean. The barrier to entry for endgame content is not necessarily the worst. In fact, I would say WoW still sees a lot of new players, but as, as somebody who makes a lot of guides that appeal to new players and engages with them pretty often... What I find is that a lot of the new players to WoW that I have seen are people who have played similar games to WoW. I have talked to a lot of people who are like, I played... Uh, Final Fantasy is obviously a big one. Um, there are like, other ones like Every Once in a While, Guild Wars 2, uh, some like BDO or whatever. There's definitely some people... I played X MMO that I've literally never heard of and asking me about it. And I'm like, I, I don't... I can't compare and contrast games that I don't know. But that's something I see a lot of people saying, I come from like another MMO or something like, uh, honestly, WoW's biggest source of new players is older World of Warcraft players. So the most common thing that I see is I used to play WoW back in Wrath and I'm just coming back now. And it makes a lot more sense when you think about the fact that WoW used to be gargantuan. It's kind of almost a different game. It's effectively like somebody coming from classic to retail, which a lot of people do, but I think, generally speaking, the crossover is not quite as much. Uh, a lot of people very clearly are interested in one or the other, but 
there's definitely a huge market of like older World of Warcraft players who are now coming back. The thing that I think WoW really struggles to appeal to is people who have never played MMOs in general. And this is like a distinction that a lot of people don't seem to understand when I talk about this. Because a lot of people are like, oh, WoW is like fairly intuitive for me. I like, you know, I played it, it explains it. And what World of Warcraft does well is kind of explaining you how is this game different from like some of the other MMOs out there. Or like generally speaking, if you're familiar with games in general, how does this game play? Um, it does not appeal or not really try to appeal and uh, teach people who are brand new to World of Warcraft in general. Speaking from experience, having watched my sister try World of Warcraft and completely bounce off it. My sister is not really big into games. She doesn't play them a lot. And then, and I, I say, you know, I, I give this example because the difference between Guild War, or not Guild Wars 2, fucking Final Fantasy and World of Warcraft is massive. World of Warcraft, she was just not getting into. And she had me there to explain everything to her. But that honestly frustrated her, right? Not that I was explaining it to her, but the fact that she felt like she had to ask me all the time everything. Like, she would constantly run into things that she didn't understand, and she had to, like, either, if we were playing together, ask me, or, like, message me and be like, I don't understand this, how do I do this? And, um, it bothered her, because she felt like she wasn't actually being taught anything by the game itself. Final Fantasy, on the other hand, really, 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 really holds your hand. And a lot of people hate that, right? It's a complaint that whenever I try to get people into Final Fantasy, I hear that complaint all the time. Oh, it's too handholdy. The game is too slow at the start, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But at the same time, Final Fantasy really, 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 really appeals to casual players. A lot of people, Final Fantasy was like their first MMO because they can never really get into it. And Final Fantasy was the one that like really taught them how to play MMOs in general and got them into it and got them interested in it. And especially because it is, well, it has stuff like Savage Raids, etc. It, the general game environment is more story driven. It's more casual. It is more friendly to the type of player who's not interested in the super hardcore end game WoW stuff. And as somebody who is into the super hardcore end game WoW stuff, I can tell you that it does that stuff well. Because I don't really play Final Fantasy for the Savage Raids. I've done a few. I haven't done a single Ultimate. I've only done a handful of Savage Raids, a few Extreme Trials. And that's the kind of stuff that I enjoy doing in WoW. But I don't do it in Final Fantasy because the main reason I even play that game is for the story. And for the casual elements of it. It's a game that I like to play when, you know, I'm just... Nothing's really going on in World of Warcraft and I'm just kind of bored. And I want to play through, like, the new uh, campaign chapters to see what's up with that. Maybe try some, like, dungeon content or whatever. Um, and that is the most fun thing in the game, and it appeals directly to new players who are not really familiar with MMOs. And that is the thing that World of Warcraft really, 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 really struggles with. It does kind of fine when it's somebody who already knows the basics, who already knows, like, you know, what leveling is, what, like, DPS and tanks and healers are, and, like, what a rotation is, stuff like that. But Final Fantasy has, like, the entire Hall of the Novice that teaches you all of those very basic concepts that, like, you consider... It's like difficult to even explain to somebody right like what is a rotation it's the order in which you press your buttons well how do i do it well it's like where do i start right final fantasy does that it does explain all of those fundamentals and that's why it does a lot better um i don't know it, it's a tricky situation though uh and i at it's one of those other things where, at the moment, like, it's easy for me to say that World of Warcraft needs to improve its new player experience, but Blizzard is just kind of floundering across the board, so... I don't know. And quite frankly, for a while there, the endgame experience was so fucking bad in both BFA and Shadowlands that Blizzard had bigger f fish to fry than improving the new player experience. They needed to just make the game really fun, uh, period. But nowadays, I mean, well, Dragonflight is definitely not my favorite expansion. There are definitely a lot of changes for the better. So the, the game is going in a better direction. If they keep this up and keep making improvements, they're on a good track, which is not something that I would have been able to say a few years ago. So now I think it is probably time for them to start looking at, you know, paying a bit more attention to the new player experience and making sure that's running well. Anyways long ranted i still have a lot of messages to get through so apologies for that uh what am i in combat with 
Either way, I'm just going to vanish. And do XA1000. Uh, Rip Dartol's Rod of Transformation. Yeah, isn't that a toy now? Or at least there's like a toy that does basically the same thing. Um, every time you fly through Red Ridge for any reason, the little camo kit from the POW quests. Oh, yeah, true. I think they're zone restricted now. Back in Cataclysm, those like limited quest decorations did not used to be zone restricted. <laughs> That's uh, <laughs> I just noticed somebody said something not nearly as bad as uh, a lot of the other like spam messages still bad enough that i just you know ban them but it's at least that was like an insult that made me chuckle so that person's probably not watching now but at least i got a good laugh out of that one um fuck it's annoying uh get up here and then I think gun shoes is probably I should have gun shoes back up by the time I go to the next little zone, but we'll see if I glider from the right angle. Hook right around here. Got into combat, which kind of sucks because now I can't use gun shoes. Come on, any second now. There we go. Uh, you never touched it, but you found another game called Moonstone Island that's essentially farming and crafting of Stardew, but it has a Pokemon aspect to it, and the battles are card-based. Huh. Interesting. You would like that one, and it's a decent bit challenging. Definitely remind me, like, a few months from now when I'm not ridiculously busy, and that's the kind of thing that I'd, I'd love to check out in my free time. Unfortunately, right now, it's like... I have so many things that I need to get done over the next, like, three months that I don't even know when I'll have free time to play games that I've been wanting to play for a while. Uh, we'll see. The nice thing is, one of the games right now that I really want to play is, honestly, Wrath Classic. Uh, and, well, I'll go back to Hardcore at some point to at least finish that up and, well, try to get to 60. We'll see if I manage to die in my Feral Druid or not. Um, but I really want to play more Wrath Classic. And at the moment, I just don't have the time to really dedicate a lot of effort into it. I've been playing it, obviously, like, raiding ICC and stuff. And I've been keeping my Paladin up, but, like, I want to have more characters ready. And I want to start leveling a lot of characters in that. Um, I just, I've not been able to find the time. But, honestly, November, like, once I've gotten my Dragonflight leveling guide out of the way, I will actually probably want to focus a lot more on classic videos, especially with Cataclysm Classic likely around the corner. So I'll be able to justify actually spending a lot more time playing classic when um, that's going to be the larger focus and retail slows down a little bit. But I just gotta, I gotta get through everything at the moment before I can really think about anything else. Uh... Lately, instead of collecting shit, you've been farming old mats to sell in the AH since last time you decided to treat your gold deficiency. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely a nice way to spend your free time. I've been doing something similar, but on Classic. Which, um... Hmm. I'm probably going to make a video covering it, but uh, I'm debating it depending on the exact details for Cataclysm Classic released at BlizzCon. But... I've been spending a lot of time in Wrath Classic collecting removed items in Cataclysm in preparation for that. A lot of them are BOEs too. And part of that is going to be like towards a transmog collection when Cataclysm Classic actually comes out. And a lot of it is just going to be for gold. Because a lot of those removed BOEs, I am buying them for like one gold. And <laughs> removed items, you are going to be able to flip for a hell of a lot more than one gold uh, when that is actually the case. A lot of people don't really know their value. And unless Blizzard says something like, we're going to change the drop rates for every single item in the game to not be removed, which maybe they'll do, who knows. Um, then 
I am probably going to make a video around BlizzCon whenever Cataclysm Classic gets released of like, these are all of the removed items in Cataclysm. This is what you should be farming right now. And like extensive list of all of like the really big ones. And uh, that way people can start farming their own stuff. The problem is if I do that, I end up losing a shit ton of money because that would mean I'm inviting competition to something that I've been actively doing uh, with part of the reason being to make gold. But who cares? I think at this point, I've also, I've talked about it on stream a lot of times, so at least people who, like, actively watch the streams or are in my Discord have heard me mention that a lot of times, but there is very much a difference between me discussing something on stream and me making a video about it. Like, on stream, like, the people who actively, like, watch my videos will be aware of it, but it won't go, like, widespread. But generally speaking, the moment I actually cover something in a video, that's when, like, the larger population becomes aware of it, i.e. the secret Thaldrasis quest line. Right. So, we'll see. Uh... Let me count this real quick. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Just mounts up again. Stardew is more focused on home building and the relationship stuff. That's part of it, but mostly optional. There's dungeons and bosses and temples and stuff. Yeah, that actually does sound, like, up my alley, so... Definitely. That's interesting. The mobs start, like, spraying poison stuff when enemies get close. I actually don't think I've ever seen that happen. It's a neat little touch. Uh, okay. Yeah, this was all the discussion about Envenom... Sandwich said, you watch all my runs uh, in the background when you're leveling and now you're live. Yes. So glad you were able to catch a live stream. Always good to see you. Or Lootering, if bots didn't use it so it was nerfed into Oblivion. Yeah, true. Lootering, I guess, yeah, would have been a nice way to get, like, uh, long distance stuff, but... Like you said, it's been pretty heavily nerfed. And you ideally wouldn't want to rely on Lootarang. It would be nice to have as an alternative, but... Yeah. You should have an ability called Poison Knife. Oh yeah, this was when we were discussing Poison Knife and all that fun stuff about assassination getting screwed over. This potion. Um. Okay, I'm mostly caught up to like where I left off in chat before, so I should be able to get caught up relatively soon. Oh, you know what? Something I haven't had on my bars: drums of fury. Not a huge deal, because it doesn't really matter at this level, but there's like one or two situations where maybe that would have helped. Uh, Blagoja Milovanovsky said, you the best. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, he should not be developing DH at all. He doesn't understand the early game content. Yeah, for sure. They had that rule, no Blizzard games would be made, as far as, like, the developers being required to play their game. Yeah, definitely. Um, You see them doing it, they don't understand a lot of things. The guy who deals with Necros in D4 plays on a controller. Oh, God. Yeah, that definitely is not great. The conflicts between engineers, designers, and end-users are universal, yeah. 
Uh, MM Hunter, as far as you know, has had no good changes the entire expansion, despite all the hunters complaining. Uh, hunters in general aren't great, but yeah, I've heard MM is in a really bad spot at the moment. None of my hunter friends are happy with it. Sucks because you really like MM. The whole bow and arrow ranger fantasy is awesome, but when your only good ability is aim shot, even that isn't great. Yeah. Uh, Ty, Ty Titty, which I'm guessing must be one of my guildies. Um, curious uh, if you're still watching, can you tell me which one you are? Just so I know. Uh, but said, hey Lonnie, how has Sin been so far compared to the other specs? Um, at low levels, so far, I think it's the worst rogue spec. Like, we're talking 10 to 20. But it's better than Outlaw at the moment. Outlaw was pretty dire. Uh, really, anything past the super early game. So this is... It could be worse, really. Let's go gun shoes and head up there. You finally caved and downloaded a 1.12 client for private server shenanigans. Ooh, nice. I wonder why the mob's nameplate shows it as damaged. Huh. Well, parrot damage, like, taken sound is very odd. Something about it just doesn't feel right. And try to do... Oh wait, I was about to say I can Goblin Glider, and I'm like, why is my Goblin Glider on cooldown? And, uh, yeah, I forgot that I used it to, uh, negate the knockback, which, I mean, that's normal, I just traditionally don't use Goblin Glider there, but whatever. Radanax is... stop right next to a mob. All right, let's take a look at movement speed increase. That's huge. Definitely take that first. Improved Garrote, Crimson Tempest. All right. So now I have an AoE Spender, which is very good. Or at least I don't know how good Crimson Tempest is compared to a lot of other stuff, but having a or having a um, AoE Spender at all is going to be good. Technically speaking, and Venom becomes a mini AoE spender later on when I get Poison Bomb, but for now, it's pure single target. Uh, you struggle so hard for surviving with Outlaw, sit and eat and repeat. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Uh, oh, somebody just asked how close are you getting to Crimson Tempest. Well, right as I read that. Oh, fuck, I completely missed this. I'm so sorry, James. James donated $2. For whatever reason, YouTube did not give me a notification for that. I can see it in the chat history. Uh, thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Uh, for whatever reason, YouTube did not fucking notify me. So that... Unfortunately, that was right after I scrolled up to uh, read older chats. So I missed that until now. But thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, original Final Fantasy VII is the best. Change your mind. Uh, I'm not a big, like, older Final Fantasy player, so I've never played original Final Fantasy VII. But I have heard a lot of good things about it. So I think there's probably a lot of people who would agree with you there. Can't wait for the Yetta litmus test, aka having to rebuff after running back from the graveyard. I feel like the nice thing about Rogue is at least it, its biggest issue so far, with the changes, mind you, has been AoE. It still generally struggles on AoE. It obviously struggles with like ranged pulling options. And surviving against like a lot of different mobs for an extended duration is tricky. Because especially on very large pulls, if you can't easily cleave down mobs and you don't have great survivability tools, it's rough. But evasion and like, you know, second evasion with Cloak of Shadows effectively actually give it pretty good survivability in a burst window. And you have pretty good single target burst. Even Outlaw had like decent single target, kind of. Uh, but so far, Assassination seems definitely better on the single target aspect. So I actually, at the moment, I don't think Yetimus will be an issue. I'll also have better single target burst options by that point. So what I'll probably do is the moment I reach Terran Mill... I'm going to uh, set my Volpera camp, and then we're going to do Wad for a bit. But by the time I come back, I 
should have more than enough tools to just eviscerate Yetimus, no pun intended. Uh, let's see. Previs said, sorry, haven't been around lately. Um, yeah, uh, you don't need to worry about not being around, Kriva. I appreciate you stopping by the stream regardless, though. Um, the leveling add-on is at the same place that it has always been. It is, I've said it before, it's not a priority. It is, to be clear, not going to come out this year. I think maybe if I, if I say that, people will stop at least asking right now. I have zero plans to have the leveling add-on finished by the end of 2023. It is not a priority. Uh, it will, maybe it'll be finished like in January or February if I have time in like December to work on it, but I'm going to be very busy for pretty much, well, definitely the rest of October and the entire month of November. So I won't even begin to work on it until December and, or at least work on like the coding aspect of it. Obviously I've been updating the guides and stuff, which is yet another important part of creating an add-on like that in the first place. Um, but that stuff is... 100% going to be the priority at the moment. I am not really worried about getting it out very soon. Um, yeah, Naomi gave a, a pretty good explanation there, too. That is basically, yeah, exactly what I planned. I'm, I would like to get it out be like a good bit before the next expansion the i i've said that as like a time of it will absolutely 100 percent be out before uh the avalorian expansion i guess at this point i can stop saying the void lord expansion because we've actually had a real expansion leak that is almost guaranteed i don't know if the name of the expansion was leaked though i didn't see that anywhere but um, yeah, so before the Avalorian expansion, which I don't know what they have planned for that, we're going to have to kind of wait and see for BlizzCon, I am very concerned still that they are just going to abandon Dragonflight and not do like a final patch, which I don't know why. I hope that it's not and that they're just announcing it really early, but considering they already have a decent amount of stuff done, I have a feeling they're just going to start doing shorter expansions where we get less content for our money, which, you know, typical Blizzard shit. Um, just not thrilled about that. So we'll see. The problem is, if um, if we don't get a final content patch, that puts me on a very tight deadline. Because that means that we're probably going to have less than a year after Amir Drasil, like eight months or whatever it was, between Shadowlands and Dragonflight. And then I'm going to be kind of forced to split my time between new expansion testing, which is always way more in-depth and complicated than new patch testing. And um, obviously, like, classic stuff, which I've said before, I plan on doing a lot more for Cataclysm Classic than I've done for Classic in the past. And then also on top of that, making the add-on. And um, I was hoping that I would have a little bit more time, but it doesn't seem like that is the case, unfortunately. Okay, this is a little bit tricky, so I'm just going to... This is definitely a Crimson Vial angle. Throat... So I'm going to... Can I get my poison supplied so I get a refund? There we go. These mobs are a little bit rough. Uh, Barely killed that before the lightning bolts. Uh, this is 100% a stop and eat angle. That is rough. You wish Final Fantasy would not um, would let you not have your handheld. Uh, yeah, I, I know what you mean. I think the problem is by forcing you to have like the same experience. One of the best parts about Final Fantasy forcing you to have your handheld is it ensures that most of the players you see in endgame content and most right are actually decent uh and kind of know what they're doing because the game 
forces them to know what they're doing in order to, like, complete the main campaign. Now, that is not to say that there are not bad players in Final Fantasy, because there absolutely are. Uh, but I think there are more... There are more, like, bad players in endgame content in World of Warcraft, because in order to reach World of Warcraft endgame content, you only need to play for, like... I don't know. Let's Let's be really generous and say 24 hours. If you are the slowest leveler in the planet, you should be able to get from... Uh, like, level 1 to level 70 right now in 24 hours of slash played time. That is, like, very, very generous. Uh, whereas Final Fantasy, it is closer to, like, 100 to 200 hours. And that is on the low end, I would say, for how long it would take somebody to reach endgame. So it kind of ensures that by the time the people get there, they know what they're doing, and there is, generally speaking, a better endgame experience. So I think that is one major advantage of Final Fantasy doing that. I can understand what you mean, though, about wishing that you have the option to skip a lot of that stuff. Technically speaking, you can buy a boost. I would not recommend it, though. But it, it, is, it is technically there. But it is an option that I've said multiple times I do not think anybody should do. Like, whenever one of my friends is like, I'm considering playing Final Fantasy, but I don't want to go through all that story shit, I'll probably just buy a boost. I'm like, just don't even bother playing then, because you won't enjoy it. Uh, WoW needs to improve its new player experience for sure. It's dog shit, WOD and Legion, great content, but too much uh, forced content in BFA Legion, yeah. Uh, Joel Ellenbecker said, as an old player coming back, haven't played since WAD, uh, the time walking was cool as far as the story goes, but it didn't make any sense. Yeah, well, the problem is the story is a complete afterthought at this point in the game. The story is not supposed to make sense. The story only makes sense to Steve Denuser and people who live in Bellular videos and think they understand the story because they've put together a million different little tiny pieces and speculation and spend so much time outside of the actual game understanding the story. I'm, like, partially joking about the half, or, like, the second half of that comment, which, like, uh, one of the things that always honestly impressed me about Bellular is that he was able to somehow piece together what the World of Warcraft story was going towards based on little crumbs thrown out by Blizzard, because it's just so poorly communicated within the game itself. The WoW story, in terms of how it is actually, like, told throughout the game, is... I That is not an unpopular opinion. It is terrible. Absolutely terrible. The story is the weakest part of this game by far. More so than any new player experience or anything. It is, honestly, one of the weakest parts of the new player experience, quite frankly, and there's not really a lot... What the hell happened to my... Oh, I think the fucking stupid bleed from the Warden right there. Uh, the, the unfortunate thing about the story being as bad as it is, is it is also a major turnoff for new players, and there is no real way that you just magically fix that. It's kind of already too far gone. So the unfortunate reality of World of Warcraft in the modern day is that it really can only ever appeal to people who do not care about story in video games at all. Because if you care about story in video games, you are not playing World of Warcraft. Or you're like me, and you play World of Warcraft purely for the gameplay, and you play other games when you want story. Because I do care a lot about story in games, which is why I complain about it a lot in World of Warcraft, because I wish WoW had a better story. I think the story used to be at least a lot more coherent, and the lore and world building at least used to make sense, even if it wasn't super well communicated within the game. But now, not only is the story still poorly told, but the world building has completely gone to shit, and that is by far the biggest weakness of it. Um, not a lot you can do to fix that. That is another thing where, like, I understand that I've used my sister as an example, and my sister technically doesn't stand for every single new player. I'm sure a lot of people would disagree with her perspective, but literally exactly what I just said is the same thing that she expressed many times. She was not engaged with WoW at all because there was no story and she had no idea what was going on. So she was just kind of going through the motions and just 
you know, I, I would tell her we got to do this quest and she's like, okay, and just kill stuff. But she has no idea why she's doing any of the things she's doing. All she knows is that she needs to level up and she was following my instructions on how to level up. And I, I mean, quite frankly, there is no way to level right now that does not run into that same issue. Uh, you just have no fucking idea what's going on. Unless you, like, level through a specific expansion, maybe you could argue that certain expansions have, like, a more clear story throughout, but even then, it, it's never been World of Warcraft's strong suit. And one of the other reasons, once again, why my sister really connected with Final Fantasy, uh, aside from the fact that, as I already said, the new player experience is much better, she felt a lot more engaged with the game because there was a story and she understood what she was doing. You know, every quest was part of the main campaign and she felt like she had a reason for doing everything that she was doing. And that made her feel a lot more motivated to keep going. And that, I mean, it is important to a lot of people. It really matters. And it, it is definitely a weakness. Uh, what's your favorite race class combo? I, I, or, like, Rice, you know what races I've played. <laughs> I, I know you're asking a question for the sake of a question, but, like, you, you literally know what I play. I mean, obvious answer is probably Blood Elf Monk, right? It's, uh, it's what I mostly enjoy playing. Right? I got, unless you're asking what would a theoretical favorite race class combo be if it, like, could exist but doesn't. In which case, I don't know, probably Blood Elf something. Blood Elf Druid, maybe, I think would be cool. I like playing Blood Elves. But you know that, right? So. Night Elf Paladin would also be uh, a really good one. Yeah, true. That one is more, I'm surprised it doesn't exist already. Nice. Level 30. Uh, which means I finally get flying and I can update my consumables. Potion of the Tolvir. Ghost Elixir. Get my War Scrolls. I think that's it for now. Yeah. Um. Let's cancel that. I can read chat in a second just because, uh, you know, it'll work out well when we're on the long flight. This is always a good section to read chat and stuff. Yeah, it definitely, it should be added. There's already Night Elf Paladins in the lore. That it absolutely makes no sense for there to not be Night Elf Paladins at this point. So I don't know why they haven't added it. Now I can scroll up and read chat. James said, These playthroughs that you do help new players get into playing and experimenting with different classes more than anything Blizzard is doing, especially with creating a community of people that are willing to give their information and experience to help others like Naomi does. Yeah, absolutely. Um, definitely. And I'm, I'm glad that you enjoy that. And I, I would hope that as somebody who is fairly in touch with, like, the new player community, like, I, you know, my feedback is kind of on point. Um, it's one of those things where a lot of times, obviously, while I am, like, the furthest thing from a new player that you can get, I'd like to think that something that I spend a lot of time doing is trying to put myself in the shoes of a new player and understand, okay, if I was new to WoW, what would be something that... Like, I would be unsure about. In fact, I get a lot of really good video ideas from people, uh, either my friends who, are, like, are looking for stuff in Endgame, um, and I can make, like, an interesting video on that, or new players who ask me questions, and a lot of times I'll get asked a question, and I'm like, huh, you know, that is actually something that I'm sure a lot of people are wondering. I can do more research into this topic and make, like, a detailed video covering it. So that is kind of 90% of what I do as far as, like, figuring out what to cover in terms of videos so i i hope i do it well considering i you know it, it is kind of my job to do that well but oh you're jaken okay good to see you jaken 
Um, your surprised outlaw is worse. It has been quite some time since you leveled a rogue. Outlaw, the biggest issue with outlaw at the moment is blade flurry being an active ability instead of a passive. It's outlaw definitely, or rather like combat. I don't remember when they changed that, but the fact that you effectively don't have any AOE abilities whatsoever as outlaw for a huge chunk of the leveling process really the entire leveling process it's just most of your time while leveling it's really bad so your damage also isn't really great uh rogues in general have a lot of scaling problems their damage just simply doesn't do as much as a lot of other specs i don't really know how you fix that at low levels i'm not an expert on how they've implemented like the damage scaling and why that is a thing but it is very noticeable how like, I'm running the exact same fancy leveling heirlooms, consumables, etc. that I do in every single run. And you can just literally compare and contrast the amount of time it takes me to kill stuff by pressing, like, two buttons on Rogue versus every other spec. And Outlaw, Assassination, both just have a longer time to kill, almost arbitrarily, I... Like I said, I don't fully understand the math behind it. But there have been specs where I have really no idea what's going on. Like Elemental Shaman. I didn't really understand what I was doing with Elemental Shaman for a large part. I think I kind of started to figure it out at the end. But at a certain point, like if I, when I was playing Elemental, one of the things I kind of liked about it is I was just kind of pressing buttons and things were dying. And a lot of times those are the good new player specs. When you don't really even need to understand what you've just done, you've pressed the button and things are just dead now. And you're like, okay, I'm just going to keep doing that over and over because it seems to be working. And with Elemental, that was kind of the case. Now, Elemental definitely has some minor issues while leveling, though I do think it was one of the stronger specs that I tested, especially compared to a lot of casters. Um, uh... But that was kind of something I noticed where generally, like, a lot of the abilities just seem to hit harder. And, I mean, compared to something like Rising Sun Kick, generally it's just very front-loaded. And maybe that is one of the issues with rogues in general for leveling, is all three specs, to a certain extent, are fundamentally designed with back-loaded damage in mind. With Assassination, you have your poisons where you poisons and your bleeds. You apply bleeds, you apply poisons, and they do damage over an extended period of time. Uh, Outlaw, it's kind of like that. Outlaw was a little bit more front-loaded. The Outlaw, I think the bigger issue is just the lack of any AoE whatsoever, and it just did not feel like it scaled well at all. Um, you pop Blade Flurry, and if you don't kill everything within Blade Flurry, which you usually don't, then you're in for a bad time. And... I don't exactly know how sub works, but it seems like it's a little bit more front-loaded than the other specs, which is why I have hope that it's going to be a better option. But that is definitely a significant issue that at least Assassination has, and even Outlaw still had some damage over time things. And whenever you have a spec that is heavily built around doing damage over an extended period of time, it's going to be worse than something like Windwalker Monk, Warrior, etc., where it's all front-loaded damage. You press the button, you get the full damage. And I get it, every spec needs to have, like, different designs, but because they're all supposed to be relatively balanced in terms of how much damage potential they have, generally speaking, you're just going to play the ones that do front-loaded damage. Because if I can get all of my damage on a mob instantly, and, and this is, of course, not how it works at, like, a high level, right? Um, you know, we all know that. But as far as leveling goes, if I can get the damage from Rising Sun Kick in a single global, and it, one of the bigger things is, right, like abilities such as Rising Sun Kick, Fists of Fury, they have cooldowns. So you can't just mash them over and over and over. And in many cases, like that's kind of the entire thing about Windwalker Monk. Like you have to rotate between different abilities. So even if Rising Sun Kick does do an obscene amount of damage, you can't just spam only Rising Sun Kick, whereas most of the abilities on Rogue don't really have a cooldown. They are spammable, but obviously you need to use generators, spenders, etc. Um, but the thing about that is if you're using Rising Sun Kick and the mob is dying instantly, then by the time you're going to the next pull, the bigger one is Fist of Fury, right? Use Fist of Fury, it shreds all mobs in front of you. 
And then by the time you've reached the next group of mobs, this is up again. And you just do the same thing. So it ends up basically translating into you just have higher damage overall. And I don't know if it's just, if it is a scaling issue or if it that is kind of the problem. It's balanced around the fact that your poisons and bleeds are supposed to do all that damage over 10 seconds. Well, then it ends up feeling really bad because you have to sit there and wait for your poisons and bleeds to tick on the mob. Whereas like half of the other specs in the game would have done upfront damage, gotten their damage in and moved on to the next pull already. And then while they're moving, their stuff is recharging. So they don't even need to worry about like that not being system enough. That is basically the biggest issue that specs like Rogue, especially Assassination, will face. And there are certain exceptions, like Shadow Priest has a lot of stuff that is very dot-focused, but at the same time, Shadow Priest has a lot of builds that are not dot-focused and are upfront instant damage-focused. So even if it may not be endgame viable, right, maybe the dots are more damage over a longer period of time, you know, on a raid boss or something like that, if all you care about is upfront damage and the other build that does that is not completely terrible, well, then you're probably going to run that. The best example that I've found so far, so I'll keep citing it, um, especially because it received some, uh, like, disagreement when I asked people about it, is Orbital Strike on Boomkin. Orbital Strike, by everything I've seen, is a completely terrible ability at max level compared to Pulsar. You know, every single Boomkin runs Pulsar, it's so much better. And yet, Orbital Strike, while leveling, is amazing. It's really good. It ended up being, on many pulls, my top damage, because I run into a pull, I drop uh, Orbital Strike on top of a bunch of mobs, it shreds like 75% of their health, I finish off the rest of their health, by the time I do another pull again, it's back up. And then suddenly I have a gigantic AoE nuke for almost every single pull. Um, missed a handful of messages though, so I'll scroll up a little bit. I'm guessing there's a chest here. No chest here. In that case, it must be in one of the buildings or inside this cave, which I'm not going to bother checking every possible location, just the easy to access ones. Um, check, uh, Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, well, okay, yeah, so Gabriel Keller said, uh, what are the three most important symbols? Naomi said, I, yeah, I, so Naomi, obviously, Gunshoes and Goblin Gliders are the two most important. That one is an easy question to answer, for sure. Um... I think if we are counting Draft of Ten Lands, you are probably correct. The The thing is, I kind of, I separate Draft of Ten Lands when discussing consumables because it's like, the way I see it, right? And, and Gabriel Keller, you can correct me if I'm wrong in this. Whenever people ask me what are the most important consumables to get for leveling, usually it is from a perspective of, I don't want to spend as much gold as you do on a speed run. I want to try to budget myself. So I want to know what should I be spending my gold on to get the most out of the time save. And Draft of Ten Lands is very, very good. It is definitely, if we're talking like it is the, if we're counting it as a consumable, the most efficient consumable. Because 10% additional experience, even if it stops working later on, is still very strong. However, I have said many times that I think everybody should be farming Draft of Ten Lands if you plan on leveling alts, right? If you're leveling a singular alt, and that's it, and you don't really plan on leveling any other alts after your first one, maybe don't get Draft of Ten Lands. Oh, nice. Fuck, there's a chest right here. That's pretty good. Um, but if you plan on leveling, like, even three alts, like, even that little, I'd still say it's worth farming Draft of Ten Lands. Is you never know. At that point, three alts, you're definitely going to be getting a value or good value out of it. And if you decide to level it in the future, you'll already have it easily set up for where your characters can farm it. And the more characters that you have, the easier it becomes to farm Draft of Ten Lands. So it's kind of a knock-on effect where the more characters you're leveling, you know, the more efficient it becomes to actually get that farmed. 
Uh, so that is definitely going to be worth it 100% of the time. However, I usually believe that when people ask that, like I said, they're looking for how do I efficiently spend my gold? Because that is kind of the context in which I get asked that question. In which case, definitely gun shoes, goblin gliders. Absolutely. The third consumable, I would say, is a little bit trickier. Where I, I would say, if I had to pick anything... Uh, oh, fuck, I also forgot to put on my new EOEs. Almost forgot about that. I almost want to say it's Bear Tartar. As far as, like, what you should buy. Bear, Bear Tartar is also nice because it's very cheap. You can usually get it for basically no gold whatsoever. So it's not even, like, an investment cost. You know, this actually is not too bad. With Crimson Tempest, this is actually a good pull to look at the damage breakdown. Yeah, Deadly Poison doing a, a fairly decent amount. This is really solid. I think this is absolutely better than Outlaw. And the problem with Outlaw is even within Blade Flurry, you have to sit there in melee. The fact that you're able to do almost all of your AoE from a distance as Assassination, that is actually very, very, very good. Already, I would say that is a huge plus compared to Outlaw. Outlaw would not have been able to do that pull nearly as efficiently. Crimson Tempest. Yeah, just having a spammable AoE like that is really, really, really big. Uh, hello, Thomas Pemberton. Good to see you. Sorry, I read that message a little bit late, but hopefully you're still here. Yo. Uh, you know what? Come to think of it. I actually, I said this earlier that I was going to do WAD intro at this level, and I just kind of forgot because I got caught up with, like, responding to chat. I actually should be doing that, especially these quests where I'm, like, flying around a lot. I probably should have done that the moment I got to Terran Mill. It's not a huge deal, but especially since I'm Volpera, I can just make camp and then return to Orgrimmar. But yeah, I think Bear Tartar, actually, I, I might say, is the third most useful consumable to get overall. Uh, just because once you have it, you unfortunately don't get it until level 40. So that's a little bit of a bummer. It would be nice if you got it a lot earlier. However, the speed boost that it gives you at that point, especially for slower classes, like, when I get that on a rogue, it's going to be a lifesaver. It'll be night and day compared to what it usually is like. So that'll be very, very impactful. Let me get the, the WAD intro set up in general before I continue responding to chat. Talk to Thralmar Mage over here. A Goose Comic said, finally home. How are you enjoying Assassination? Well, I guess I did just talk about that a little bit as far as the AoE. Um, it's still not amazing, but I think despite the problems with uh, it not having like a range pulling tool at low levels, it is feeling better now, but it is feeling like kind of mid-tier still. One of the issues with Phantom Knives being that it's like not amazing damage, it's definitely nowhere near as good as, like, spamming Thrash or something like that on a Guardian Druid, which just hits like a truck. And, of course, Guardian Druid can just face tank stuff, so... A little bit different. Uh, I also need to spend my talent points, which I... How do I want to do this? sprint here. Uh, I kind of need to take stealth movement speed, even though I... There's a lot of other stuff I'd rather take. But... Hmm. I also... I don't think I need to use subterfuge. Subterfuge. Whatever, however you fucking pronounce that word. Because I'm pretty sure that 
The only real benefit I get after leaving stealth, at least right now, is on Garot. So, Garot deals 50% increased damage and has no cooldown when used from stealth and for 3 seconds after breaking stealth. So there's basically no advantage to using subterfuge with that because improved Garot kind of has the built-in subterfuge effect tied to um, its, uh, its increase. Now, I think there might be something later on that would give me an increase to stuff like that. Yeah, but Indiscriminate Carnage actually also doesn't require subterfuge because it's basically the exact same thing. When you break stealth and for 10 seconds after using stealth or after leaving stealth, you get to use those abilities and they hit multiple targets. Except subterfuge would kind of defeat the entire purpose. So yeah. I at least want to take the uh, stealth movement speed increase, though. So I take that. Um... Ooh, flying daggers. Yeah, that's a big one. Uh, yeah, that's actually really, really, really important. Um, what else do I want? Okay, this only works if it's Rupture and Deadly Poison. So this is like, uh, effectively, splash damage off a beefy target. Um, This is probably still worth it. Yeah, I think there's enough situations where I can maybe make that work that it's probably fine. Uh, what else do I need for here? Casting in Venom on a target afflicted by... That's terrible. All of those things. Yeah, that yikes. That's really bad. Um, I guess Dagger in the Dark just for whenever I am in stealth. It gives me like a 2 or 4% damage buff for when I quickly dip into stealth before breaking it. Uh, and no, Naomi, I was not able to test the, um, eviscerate thing working. I forgot to do that before it was, uh, uh, before I got in Venom. I meant to do it, and then I just forgot. Um, so it's... Let me double check. Exactly how does Caustic Spatter work? When you use Mutilate on a target that has Rupture and Deadly Poison... It causes, and then for the next 10 seconds, causes your poisons to splash. So once you've activated that effect, it automatically starts splashing the damage. So I don't need to maintain that at all. I see. Yeah, I. the only thing about Caustic Spatter is I think neither of those talents are a super great option. The alternative is Seal Fate maybe could be okay. Either way, I need to get to Deathmark. That is what I'm going for now over other stuff. Um, James said, you know you said you were going to try Blood Decay, but you decided to go Warrior because you enjoy the early gameplay more. Uh, yeah, Warrior Solid. In terms of, like, endgame viability, Warrior is a bit hit or miss. It's looking solid for Amir Jassil. I think it's one of those where it's... Warrior is, like, very middle of the pack in terms of how easy is this to pick up. So I think earlier when the discussion was, like, which tanks are easy to get into, I said I would recommend, like, Blood DK, um, Guardian Druid, mostly those two. I think I'd probably put Warrior as third behind Blood DK and Guardian Druid as far as, like, how easy is this to learn. Just because managing your block and stuff is a little bit more involved than, like, pressing a healing button after you take damage. And you have to, like, you know, make sure that you're not 
uh, like without a shield block charge when you need one, which, you know, not always the most intuitive thing in the world. Uh, sometimes you may want to not use shield block because you want to make sure you have it for like an increased burst of damage in a little bit. It It is not the hardest tank to pick up, but it's definitely a little bit more involved, I would say. And especially like when you're trying to min-max it, it can be a little bit tricky. But that's not something that you'll need to worry about super later. But Warrior is good. Prop Warrior is one of the tanks that I tend to enjoy more. Um, not quite as much as Brewmaster or Vengeance Demon Hunter, at least when Vengeance is not being designed by a fucking monkey. But generally speaking, Prop Warrior is pretty fun. Um, can you count all the retcons? I forget what the context of, uh, can we count all the retcons? I think that was when I was talking about how the WoW story isn't good. Um, but, I mean, yeah, the problem with the retcons is, at this point, World of Warcraft's story effectively can't be told without, like, retconning half of it. I mean, honestly, you maybe could. So I'm not saying that, like, it isn't at all possible for them to tell a good story without retconning half the shit. But that is just how they've decided to go about telling WoW's story. They've just, Steve Denuser especially, has just decided, I'm going to retcon all of the established lore and just shove my own garbage in its place. And it sucks. And it definitely, the game's story suffered massively as a result of that. So, yeah. Unfortunately, that is just kind of one of the biggest reasons why the story sucks, so you definitely gotta count it. Uh, depending on the content you're doing, you're, you'll likely hit a wall with Blood Decay where you really need to improve a bit earlier than Grot. Both are decent early, but you could develop bad habits on DK. Yeah, I think you could also develop bad habits on Grot Warrior too. Um, I think it's... If you're not managing block properly, especially at a higher level, it's much more noticeable than a Death Knight who maybe isn't pressing Death Strike quite as good as the others. So... Uh, isn't it great how you can get to 60 in the time it takes the average player to get to level 10 in vanilla? Yeah, I mean, quite frankly, Retail WoW wouldn't survive if leveling wasn't this fast. Because we've already said that, like, everything outside of Endgame is an afterthought for, um, Blizzard. So, uh, the Shadowlands leveling changes, one of the best decisions they've made, despite how bad the rest of Shadowlands was. But the fact that now it takes way less time to actually, like, really get into WoW if you want to get into the endgame stuff means it's a lot easier for new players to get there and form an opinion compared to before where it took, like, a ridiculous amount of time to even level up. I, even, even in BFA, like, I think... I forget exactly what my time was, but I, I leveled from 1 to 120 in, like, 14 or 17 hours back in BFA. Which, like, it wasn't world record. I wasn't competing for world records back then. I didn't start until Shadowlands, but... Um, I still had, like, a relatively fast leveling time compared to, like, a lot of my friends, who would take sometimes over 24 hours. So... Like, even my relatively fast leveling times back in BFA were still... Very, 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 very long. Which is part of the reason why I was never interested in actually doing speedruns, because... Doing all of that in one sitting... It's a lot. That's um, something that I only have the patience to do in very specific cases. Not in a, a regular situation. Alright. Uh, and at this point, Crimson Tempest. A lot of these mobs. Like, at this point, the best way to finish this is just AoEing as many things as possible, and I think running around, applying Deadly Poison, and hitting things with Phantom Knives, this is pretty much the best damage I'm going to get in terms of clear speed. I do like that Phantom Knives applies your, uh, Deadly Poisons. That makes it feel pretty solid to use. I'm actually curious. It doesn't do that much damage, 
I feel like your poison should probably be a larger chunk of your damage as assassination, but maybe it is at higher levels. I don't know. If you look at lore outside of the game, WoW has a pretty cool story in general. I, I kind of disagree right now. WoW used to have a fantastic story in general outside of the game in terms of, like, the lore and world building. It used to. In fact, like, classic, I'm constantly impressed by how many, like, cool things the devs were building towards. Even if the story itself was not well told in classic, the world building was phenomenal. And it's one of the reasons why I was so interested in WoW lore as a kid. And it, nowadays, it's just tarnished. Because, I mean, technically speaking, all the stuff that was really good in Classic is still there in retail, if it hasn't been retconned, which a lot of it, unfortunately, has been. Um, but now you have shit like the first ones existing. And the it, complete existence of the first ones, in general, as a topic, just completely kills so much established WoW lore. Now, it's impossible to take anything seriously because there's some uber titans out there who actually created the universe and, you know, now suddenly, oh, who are they? Are we ever going to see the first ones? It's so fucking garbage. And unfortunately, the fact that that has been introduced, it's Pandora's box. You can't fucking close that. You can't just say, yeah, we changed our mind. Now the first ones don't exist, despite the fact that we have literally had a raid called Sepulchre of the First Ones. You can't retcon the first ones. Like... I mean, Blizzard has retconned a lot of shit, but have they retconned an entire raid tier? I don't think they have. So, that was just, um, I, I don't know. Like, the fact that, that is, I think, my biggest issue with Shadowlands. The fact that the terrible story and world building elements are so deeply ingrained in, like, the actual gameplay to the point where there is nothing you can do to, like, change that we're already fucked right we already have the first ones existing as a concept i don't know like the most you can do is ignore it like they introduced all of that stuff they could just never talk about the first ones again and pretend that they just don't exist but they do right unless you want to literally just pretend that shadowlands was a fever dream and the first ones didn't actually happen which genuinely would be a, a good thing for the story like i hate deus ex machina but holy shit, do we need some Deus Ex Machina to make it so Shadowlands never existed. And like, I know a lot of people use that as a meme, and like, it kind of is, because obviously you shouldn't need to do that to make it good. But Shadowlands was so fundamentally bad, and just corrupts so much other potentially good stuff in Warcraft lore, completely ignoring it would genuinely be better for the story or acting like it never existed problem is you can't really do that it, it would be such like a a hack move as a writer to basically be like whoops we fucked up this never existed that it, it's not a real option so i don't there's just no winning solution with salvaging the warcraft story the genuine only way to fix wow's story is just really a complete rewrite from the get-go Alternate, I, but the problem is like alternate universe doesn't even work <laughs> because it the first ones are so deeply ingrained in WoW lore that unless you were to completely rewrite the story from scratch in a remake, which is what this is what a lot of people will typically say, Classic Plus will do this, right? They'll be like, ah, oh, just wait for Classic Plus to fix the story. It, that's not going to happen, but um. Something like that is the only theoretical chance WoW has of saving its story. And you know what? Maybe an unpopular opinion, I don't think they should try. It sucks, it is what it is, the, the story we have right now is absolutely terrible, and I'm not happy with it, a lot of people aren't happy with it, but I think trying to salvage the World of Warcraft story at this point is a lost cause. And I think it's... It, it's kind of a weird situation because I can't even imagine writing for World of Warcraft right now. Unless you're Steve Denuser and you actually enjoy the smell of your own farts, like, I think anybody who is on that writing team who isn't on board with the bullshit, you know, being thrown into the WoW lore at the moment, I would actually just be in pain trying to write good, satisfying narratives for WoW. I think the most you could do is purely focus in on small-scale stuff. 
and completely just ignore the larger scale things because i guess you can always still tell a good smaller scale like individual personal stories and just you you can't like act like the first ones don't exist but you can at least just tell stories outside of their scope so to speak and that would maybe be passable but it, it honestly does still limit the range of interesting stories that you can tell when so much of your universe is now just completely fucked. So, I I don't know. I genuinely have no idea uh, how WoW writes its stories going forward other than just embracing the fact that it's bad. Luckily, I, I guess maybe at this point it's good that they keep Steve Denuser on because I don't think he realizes how bad the shit he writes is. So, he's probably gonna keep trucking on, writing Dragonflight quality stuff, acting like it's God's gift to writing, and we're all gonna have to sit here and fucking deal with it, but... whatever. Uh, energy regen feels pretty bad, I will say, at this stage on Assassination. Probably because spamming Fan of Knives is the most efficient way to do AoE damage, and that probably is guzzling my energy more than it normally should, but unfortunately that does mean it's a little bit tricky to, uh, really keep up my rotation. Yeah. Anyways, uh... Would it be a gameplay issue if they let every race play every class? Um, I guess there's two answers to that question. So, Naomi gave one of the answers. Uh... Yeah, definitely want Featherfoot. Okay, so this is where I take Deathmark. There's a few other talents after this that I'll probably want to grab, but Deathmark is the biggest one here. Uh, so Naomi's answer to that question was... Druids and Evokers have, like, obviously special, um, like, models and considerations like that. That, I would say, is not a because so the way i read that question initially would it be a gameplay issue um i wouldn't call that a gameplay issue i would call that like a development issue and a fair development issue at that it does make sense druids have a lot of extra modeling work required for them to function it makes sense that they're not available to every race because you know unless blizzard were to be lazy and just not make unique druid forms which is something i think a lot of druid players like having different ones for every race. It's like something that we've come to know. Then I think it makes sense why it's something that they can't really do. And I think that's fine. As long as they eventually try to add Druid to at least a lot of other races. Uh, same thing with Evokers, obviously. But they did say from the get-go that p nobody else aside from Drakthir is ever getting Evoker. It was a spec designed for that specific race. That's fine, I guess. Uh, that was the design of it. Uh, the way I read it is, would that affect the actual gameplay of would that be a problem? Like, would it harm rating or whatever if you suddenly could have every uh, class on every race? And I don't think so, personally. I think every, in theory, every class uh, having access to every single race, so racial abilities were no longer something where it's like, you know, uh, like Demon Hunter, for instance, uh, can, you know, only be Blood Elf or Night Elf. Well, if I could be a Dwarf Demon Hunter, now that might be a little bit goofy, admittedly, but it would at least alleviate some problems with that. I actually think that would be good from a gameplay perspective. At least that's how I interpreted it. Like, would it cause any problems with, like, the racials and whatnot? And I actually, no, I think it would be good. Um... Let's see it. Missed the Adgar quest. Just clear out gray items in my inventory so I don't need to worry about it until later. Uh, where did I leave off? I actually missed a handful of messages in the time I was reading that. I thought I was close to catching up. What's wrong with a gnome evoker? I, technically, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just Blizzard has said before that it's not something they're doing.
Uh, Drakthir racials are definitely, yeah. I mean, Drakthir racials, I think while they are strong, I would honestly argue that for most practical purposes, dwarf racials are stronger. Legion would probably have been one of the better times to introduce them, considering the whole light versus demon things. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it should have been introduced a while. We had the first in-lore Night Elf Paladin in Legion, so they technically did introduce it then. But, you know, I think everybody kind of expected, oh, they're adding a Night Elf Paladin, you know, as a character in lore. Surely we're going to get it as an actual race class combo soon, and we just never did. Uh, could, yeah, actually, Corbin of, you know, after Teldrassil got burned, it could have been in, like, a retribution thing. That would have been a good idea, yeah. Outlaw kind of sucks until you get the insane CD reduction talents, but you can't get them until 60+. plus. I struggle to believe that Outlaw would even be good from 60 to 70. Like, I, I had some of the CD reduction talents, and I had, like, decently high uptime on Blade Flurry. It still didn't do a lot of damage. And... Ironically, one of the things about Outlaw that I, I talked about all of this at the end of my Outlaw speedrun. Um, one of the weird ironies of Outlaw is that at low levels, I was saying earlier that one of its strengths is that pistol shot allows it to get like a ranged pulling option, whereas you don't get that until 29 for assassination with poison knife. So that's definitely not great. But the thing about that is... When you get Fan the Hammer, suddenly Pistol Shot becomes a an actual part of your like rotation. Beforehand, it was like just a generator, so it was kind of fine to use it while rounding up mobs. You're generating combo points as you run up and grab mobs. But suddenly, when Pistol Shot becomes not necessarily a spender, but something that like you actually want to use the proc on for like damage, wasting you know Pistol Shot Fan the Hammer shit while you're rounding up mobs really isn't good. So there were a lot of times where if I had a fan the hammer proc, I I just couldn't use it. I couldn't use pistol shots around up mobs or I lose a huge chunk of my damage. And that felt really bad. So the irony is that Outlaw later on felt like it was terrible at range pulling mobs because there was no real way to group them up. And, you know, a lot of times one of the best ways outside of ranged tagging, because you know, moonfire and stuff like that, or pistol shot, poison blade, etc., is good for tagging a bunch of mobs. But you've seen a lot of the times when I'm rounding up mobs on Assassination, I'm like tagging them with the edge of Fan of Knives. Like hitting them with an AoE is good too. Druid is really nuts because it can do both. You have Thrash, you have Swipe, you have Moonfire. You have so many ways to round up mobs. It's one of the reasons why Guardian is super good. But this is definitely... I haven't even really been using Poison Knife outside of specific situations the moment I got Fan of Knives. Because now I can just kind of run around a pull, and tag a bunch of mobs at the same time, and it's applying deadly poison and stuff, which feels great. Um, and then once they're rounded up, then I can spend those combo points. So, it's just, it's really weird, the way that this generally uh, has been playing out. But Outlaw especially it is a very janky spec. Second... Just get rid of all this stuff. This is on the PTR, right? So, like, keeping transmog items does not matter whatsoever. And... Then I will use these at level 45, so I don't need to worry about that for a little while. Uh, not a real speedrun unless you're playing classic. All of retail is a natural speedrun. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to, like, remove that because I, I get that a lot of people feel like that. Obviously, the only part I take issue with is, of course, the it's not a real speedrun. The whole my game is better than your game mentality is dog shit, and you should feel bad for having that opinion. Sorry. Because I enjoy classic, but the whole idea of, oh, retail isn't a real game. Like, that, it, that's just a childish, stupid opinion to have. Um, 
if you're saying it as as a partial joke, which is the only reason I'm not like directly removing that, is um, like I get that a lot of people feel retail is more fast paced, and there, like I said, there's a reason I enjoy classic too. I there are parts of classic I enjoy, there are parts of retail I enjoy, and if you personally enjoy the classic play style more, more power to you. Um, but I think they both have their merits, right? Do I personally? I will say I enjoy classic leveling more. In terms of, like, if I'm doing it for fun, just for the sake of leveling, definitely I prefer the classic approach. Now, retail, still, I do the speedruns because I think, since I don't necessarily enjoy the, um... I don't actually, like, enjoy it for the sake of leveling, right? I do the speedruns as, like, a bonus challenge to keep myself occupied. And frankly, a lot of these recent runs... I have not been doing it even just because I enjoy it. I'm doing it for testing purposes. Uh, this is I, I view this the same way I would view any PTR testing that I would do, except a lot of the tests are done on live servers, right? Because yeah, but I do a lot of testing of a lot of random bullshit. It, I view this the same way as I do raid testing. Sometimes raid testing is fun, and sometimes I find these runs fun. And sometimes raid testing is absolutely fucking miserable, and I'm in agony for, like, the entire hour. Because I'm just like, god, this boss sucks so much, I just want this to end. Um, but I do it anyway, because, well, I gotta make raid guides, right? And, uh, that's how a lot of these runs go. There have been surprises, like, for instance, the Fire Mage run. I expected to be in agony, I had so much fucking fun. I loved playing Fire Mage. The point where, like, if I ever need to play a caster, I honestly might try Fire Mage. It was pretty enjoyable. Um, but, you know, there have been some runs, frankly, like, this is not the most fun thing. This is definitely, it's a struggle getting, like, these rogue runs done. I'm curious how the sub one's gonna go. I think that one might be a little bit interesting. And this at least has felt better than Outlaw. But there have been issues with this. This is definitely not a fast run. It's a little bit of a slog to try and get through all this stuff. It's uh, it's rough. Um, but, you know, that's that's just kind of how I view it. Uh, you think if they remove leveling, scaling, and added back absolute levels to zones with hit tables, it would make leveling feel more important in retail? No, that sounds terrible. I hope they never do that. That sounds like the worst thing they could possibly do. Like I said before, retail, like the, honestly, the scaling is, in terms of the zones, the best thing that they've done for retail leveling. Now, you can argue that they should have streamlined it a while ago and fixed things so it never got bloated out to this point. A good example is Guild Wars 2 was kind of designed with that in mind, where all of the zones kind of automatically scale so it feels a lot more natural. And it's not like this retroactive scaling thing, which has always felt a little bit janky, but I think compared to the alternative of it taking, like, a ridiculous amount of time to reach max level in World of Warcraft, this is definitely the better solution. Now, they can still improve this. It's not perfect, but no, the, like, Classic exists for a reason, right? If you want that type of leveling, go play Classic, and I'm not even saying it's bad. There's a reason why I've said before I'm interested in trying to do Wrath Classic speedruns. I think it could be a lot of fun. But uh, that does not belong in retail. Not even close. And the whenever people say they need to like add classic stuff to retail, it just it's annoying to me. Like it, It's just not good design. Especially considering you guys literally have that game if you want to have that playstyle. So... Uh, there's some hearthstone. Can throw this on there for when I need it. Most people who know spam about a hundred dungeon runs and get there anyways. No point in going through hundreds of quests. I mean, by that logic, there's also no point in changing it, right? Like, that seems like a weird thing to say. It's like most people I know, you know, just spam dungeons so it doesn't impact them anyways. And it's like okay, but then why would you... I guess maybe the argument there is you don't like questing, and you don't like the zone scaling, but I I really don't see how then adding scaling, or re-adding scaling to the zones back again would somehow make that better. 
because I think most people disliked questing before even more compared to now, where at least now it's relatively streamlined and you can quest wherever you want. Forcing people to quest in specific zones for specific level brackets is worse. So I just, I struggle to understand the argument there. Oh, that was a very well-timed level up. Alright, uh... What if rogues had a detonate ability to immediately cause all dots to hit their remaining damage? I mean, yeah, that would be good. There's a lot of specs that have things like that. Naomi even said, Prot Warriors upcoming tier set. I mean, there there are a lot of different specs that have things like that, of consume all of your active dots to deal damage. And yeah, it's it's good. Stuff like that helps. And grab the plans. Um, I I don't really think it would be overpowered, Naomi. There's a lot of little effects like that. So, if it's tuned properly, there's plenty of things that do consume dot uptime to do immediate damage, or things that shorten the duration of your dots. Uh, there we go. Gaslow took a little bit there. Um, and Corbin, that suggestion of giving it to Augmentation Evokers, I, I hate to say it, but that may be the worst ability suggestion I've ever seen in my entire life. That would be so, so bad. I apologize, but that is really not a good idea at all. <laughs> oh my god. Assuming, I think, what what I think you're saying there... Correct me if I'm wrong. I think you're saying that Augmentation Evokers should have a cooldown that lets them immediately detonate all of the other player's dots on the current target. And, you know, it immediately does all of their remaining duration. That is the single worst idea ever. And the unfortunate thing is, I say it's a bad idea because that sounds like the kind of thing that Blizzard would actually do. And oh my god, that would be so bad. <laughs> because the prop, like Og Evoker in general, I think anybody who's watched a few of my streams before, um, knows I hate Og Evoker. I, it's not really an a, unpopular. Everybody hates Og Evoker. Anybody who plays this game at even a remotely high level really does not like Og Evoker. The Og Evokers I know hate Og Evoker. It is a toxic spec that should never have been made. It is terrible for this game. And at the first chance Blizzard gets, they need to make it... I've, I've actually already done an Og Evoker speedrun, Sonic Boom 44. So uh, you can actually find that. Um, but yeah, it's toxic. I mean, it, in solo content, it's whatever. It's just a weak DPS spec in solo content because it, it is built as a support spec. Um, the moment that... Blizzard gets a chance, which will probably be in the Avalorian expansion, they need to make Agavoker a regular DPS spec. Just fundamentally rework it, say the support thing did not work out, sorry, make it a, an Earth-based uh, range DPS or something. It is fundamentally terrible for this game. And until it is reworked or removed, it will be a plague upon World of Warcraft forever. It is terrible. It is really bad. Yeah, I would hope they make it a tank spec. They probably won't make it a tank spec. Um, who knows? But uh, tank spec would be my first choice, but I don't think that's what Blizzard will do. But it, it cannot remain the way it is. So fundamentally, right now, Aug is already terrible. And the problem with Aug, obviously, is just the fact that it gives so many like insane you know, utility and survivability buffs to your group while also amplifying their damage by a ton is i mean it's just overpowered quite frankly and it will be overpowered unless it gets nerfed into the fucking floor or redesigned um but 
the the bigger issue is things like Ebon Might. The problem with Ebon Might, Prescience, and and Prescience, this is going to be an even bigger issue with the new tier set bonus. Ebon Might, Prescience, etc., etc. Having to figure out like which target to buff and stuff like that, and anything that even remotely impacts like the way that they like play the game, right? Is already it's already not great. But at least in many cases, for the most part. As long as, like, the, really, how do I put this? Technically speaking, there are ways in which a player can play, as in, like, aligning their cooldowns around the Og Evoker, where it would result in higher damage. But because it is attributed to the Og Evoker and not the player themselves, they don't really notice. And having an Aug Evoker buffing you doesn't meaningfully impact your playstyle really one way or another unless you are actively communicating with them and being like, hey, I'm going to use my ability at this point so they know when to buff you with Ebb and Might. And maybe if you want to like, delay your cooldowns briefly to align with other people to get like maximum uptime, you can do that. It doesn't really matter enough, especially below like a Race to World first level, that really anybody's doing that. Generally speaking, Aug Evokers can with a understanding of when people are using their cooldowns, kind of just use it at their whims and get most of their damage if they're playing properly. But it doesn't require really any effort on the player being buffed by the Aug Evoker. Something like the suggestion of detonate all of your dots and do all of their remaining damage for all players on the target would be ridiculously intrusive in terms of like interrupting the way that like a lot of specs play I, I mean first off i'm pretty sure there are like a lot of specs that actually want to have their dot on the target because having their dot active on the target actually gives them benefits so there are many specs that probably would not want that because either they need to have their dot on the target for like a specific amount of time because like they can't refresh it immediately or, I, I don't know. The point is, if you did a universal thing like that, with, with no oversight, it would... Some specs would probably like it, but it would be degenerate as hell. Because that would... The specs that would really like it, where they automatically consume all their dots and they can Im immediately reapply it, it would be so overpowered for them that it would require Aug Evokers in every... Like, I, I say that, Aug Evokers are already effectively mandatory in every single group. But right now, Aug Evokers are, at least in raids, like, you really, 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 really want one of them in raids. They're mandatory in dungeon groups, but... Um, in any serious pushing dungeon group. Uh, but they are mandatory in raids in the sense that having one is very, 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 very good, but it technically speaking is not make her able to make or break your personal damage but the biggest issue with that is there is absolutely no way to attribute that to either player what do you what do you do if somebody has the ability to completely like consume their dots and get like another cycle do you attribute that to the og evoker well if you attribute that to the og evoker now you're attributing a player's entire dot window to the og evoker and what do you do for the player who just had their dots consumed and is now forced to use GCDs to reapply their dots for the same damage? So that obviously would not work. So you would have to attribute that to the player themselves, their actual dot damage that gets consumed. In which case, that would be either bad for the player, it would effectively troll the shit out of them and fuck their rotation, in which case, having an Aug Evoker in your group for those people, would be a damage loss for them. I don't think that would be the case for too many specs, but at the very least, it would fuck with your rotation. That is something where it would happen to everybody. If it wouldn't... I don't know if it would be a direct damage loss, but it might be a very, 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 very minor damage gain to the point where if you forgot to play around it, it would lose you damage. And it would definitely require you to change up the ways in which you use your abilities... And that is just not fun. It's never fun to like, oh, I have an Aug Evoker in my group. I guess I need to play my rotation completely differently to account for the fact that my dots are going to be immediately consumed. Uh, but more realistically, you would always need to have it because for the specs that value dots, that would be ludicrously overpowered. And then suddenly you run into a situation where not only is one Aug Evoker important, but having as many Aug Evokers as physically possible is important for those specs parses. And then... Uh, 
Obviously, you know, you could argue whether or not you think parsers should exist. Blizzard clearly doesn't think they should exist, which I think is just... Blizzard's war on parse culture is annoying because they're benefiting nobody. Uh, they add Og Evokers, which, like, you know, they say, well, we're adding Og Evokers because fuck you, we don't care that you guys value parses. And yet all it does is force the people who do care about parses to now say, okay, I'm going to stack Og Evokers, or at least who care about performance, right? Maybe not their own personal uh, play. But now it forces people to min-max and bring Og Evokers, but it also pisses off anybody who cares about their own personal play, because now suddenly if they don't have, um, uh, or, like, I, I don't know, it, it muddies the waters, right? It's, it's hard to say whether, like, from any given day, whether the damage is being, like, taken away from the player or attributed too much, depending on whether or not you have an Og Evoker in your group, but we don't know for sure, because it's just, like I said, muddies the fucking waters. You don't know, and that sucks. It just sucks. Og Evokers suck. Um, they should never have been added to this game. Not really a hot take. Uh, but doing anything even more intrusive than what Og Evoker has already been doing is just a recipe for disaster, and it would completely ruin any remaining competitive elements within World of Warcraft. Whether or not you think there is or should be or whatever, I, I don't know. But as somebody who does enjoy you know, measuring my own performance and trying to see, like, hey, am I doing well? Um, Og Evoker is, like, the single worst thing that has ever happened to WoW for me. Uh, and it's also, I mean, hell, it hasn't even been happy, or, or hasn't even been healthy for group comps or anything like that, because it's just been at this point, do you have an Og Evoker or not? If you do, you're you know able to clear the content. If you don't, you're fucked, at least for high, uh, for higher end M+. Uh, but let's not pretend that stacking Og Evokers doesn't make this raid infinitely easier. Quite frankly, if you want to see whether or not stacking Og Evokers makes the raid easier, just go watch Ghost Gaming. Ghost Gaming has no business clearing some of the, the bosses they do, and they do it because Blazon just grabs any Evoker with a pulse and adds them to his raid whenever he's building a comp. And, I mean, hey... It works, so. Speaking of which, there has never been a better time to watch Ghost Gaming because, holy shit, the guild is, like, actually collapsing on itself and it's so fucking funny to watch. And... Well, should I leak this? I think, you know what? I think it's worth leaking because this this is... it. It's going to be prime content. So... I have talked in the past about how back in Sepulchre of the First Ones, one of my friends, Zanquan, stole Blazon's mount in, uh, like, off the Jailer. So he trialed for Ghost Gaming, and he was one of the people on their first Jailer kill who got the Xerath Overseer, and he was supposed to trade it to Blazon, and he instead learned it on the spot, and effectively ninja looted it. Now, he, my friend Zan, maintains to this day, he has like a very communist approach to loot distribution. And he's like, ah, you know, I believe that the mountain belonged to me the whole time. Like, we all had equal chances, therefore we, I, sh I deserve the mountain just as much as everybody else. And like, it, in a vacuum, I don't even disagree with him. Like, that is how my guild handles a lot of like mount drops and stuff like that. Um, that is how most guilds I've been in handle mount drops and stuff like that. And yeah, I can understand thinking it's bullshit that you're told to give the mount to Blazon when, you know, you're the one who got it. But what I told him is, hey, look, I am no fan of Blazon, right? Like, I have always, I, I, I'll admit, I, I hate watch Blazon, like, constantly, I don't think he's a good leader, and I think the way he runs his guild is hilarious to watch in terms of how bad it is. And yet, I told my friend Zen, you sign up for a guild, you accept what you sign up for. If you didn't want to trade over that mount, you should not have joined Ghost Gaming. It was clearly communicated to you, you know, you, yeah, if you get the mount, you give it over, that's how it goes. Um, and I was even telling him up until the last second, do not ninja loot the mount you're going to be known forever as the guy who stole Blazon's mount. And he said, I don't care. And guess what? 
Uh, he has been known forever since as the guy who stole Blaze Hans Bout. So, I was right. But, uh, I mean, he doesn't give a shit. And, like, every time it comes up, he basically says, I'll fucking do it again, right? Like, if, if that situation arose once again, same exact thing, and I already knew the consequences, I'd steal it a second time. Who gives a shit? So, at least he owns it. I'll give him that. Um... So, the reason I'm saying that is because recently my friend Xan returned to the game and he was looking for a guild to raid in. And as it so happens, over the last year or so, a lot of his friends from older expansions, one of them has now become an officer in Ghost Gaming. And he has another friend who is also raiding in Ghost Gaming. So, Despite the fact that he stole Blazon's mount, Blazon is so down bad right now that his friends actually managed to convince Blazon to give him a second trial. So, in a Mirdrasil, we're going to get to see the return of Xan in Ghost Gaming raiding in their progression team in a raid where there's a mount drop off the final boss. And he has already told me. I, I hope that this doesn't, like, affect his chances, but he has straight up told me, if the mount drops off Mythic Farrakh, he's fucking taking it a second time. <laughs> At this point, he thinks, like, it would be bad for him to not steal the mount a second time. He has to stand by principle and ninja loot it if it happens. And I'm pretty sure that Blazon even knows that he's willing to steal the mount again. And he, he sent me his application to Ghost Gaming, there's, like, anybody who's applied to a guild before knows this. There's always a section where people will say, like, you know, show us a screenshot of your UI in a raid environment. And he linked in his Ghost Gaming application a screenshot of him learning the Zerith Overseer <laughs> in his trial raid with them back in Sepulchre. So there is, like, no misunderstanding or miscommunication or whatever on Blazon's part. He knowingly reinvited him, or Zan, to his guild, knowing that this is the guy who stole my mount. But he is, I mean, at this point, what are you going to do when basically every single good player on your raid team has quit? <laughs> you have no options left. So it's going to be peak fucking content next year. I, I think Blazon has already said he's given up on, like, you know, his whole we're gonna get Hall of Fame, blah 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 shit that he does, like, every single tier. I think he has at least said that he knows it's not gonna happen. But this is Blazon we're talking about, right? Like, there is absolutely no chance in hell that when push comes to shove, he's not gonna say, you know what? I actually think we can get Hall of Fame, and then he's gonna day raid like every single day during a Mirdrasil to try and get Hall of Fame, despite saying that he's not going to. So, I cannot fucking wait. It's going to be the most fun thing to watch for me for like an entire month, and god, I I'm really gonna thoroughly enjoy uh, that. And, and so, that is something to look forward to if you are like me, and you also enjoy watching Blazon's Guild crumble. It's so much fun. It's actually peak content. <laughs> really hope the mount drops for your friend. Well, to be honest, he needs to be able to get in on Mythic Farrakh first. Which, um, knowing Xan, he is not the most motivated person at times. So, what I'm going to try to do is, like, basically build it up for him. Of, like, you need to give it your all. Because wouldn't it be so fucking funny if you actually did manage to steal the mount again? And I think maybe if I get him to like be in that mindset of I could create the most legendary moment of all time if I get on a mythic Farrakh and steal Blazon's mount a second time maybe that'll give him the motivation he needs to actually like really keep going but I worry because right now he has already been offered a trial and he isn't even max level yet and I, I'm like dude it takes of course, you know, asking me of all people, or telling this to me of all people, I, I mean, like, that you're not max level, and he's like, I'm too lazy to do it. I'm like, it takes, like, two hours. You know, he has his hunter, 
or he already had his hunter at level 60. It's like, okay, maybe it doesn't take two hours for, like, Zan, but, like, brother, it takes three to four hours. Come on, just get your hunter to 70, and you can start doing, like, turbulent timeways and stuff to at least get a lot of really good gear. And then he's like, well, next patch in Amir Drasil, I can get 450 gear from the open world. And it's like, like, I guess, but... It's not like you just press a button and get full 450 gear, you know? You're still going to have to farm a little bit and farm rep. And I guess if you want to spend the entirety of, you know, weeks or November 7th week, like, grinding gear to get caught up from fresh level 70 to pre-raid ready, I guess? But, ah, it, it just, it bugs the hell out of me, especially considering how fucking easy it is to level up. But whatever. Uh, I'm just, I hope he doesn't blow it because we have the potential to have one of the funniest fucking things ever in this entire universe happen next raid tier. And if Zan blows this opportunity, I am going to be so mad at him. So I want him to get caught up so he gets that trial and keeps that trial. Why do you hate, I, I don't, I don't actually hate Blazon. Like, Blazon is. I think Blazon is incompetent and over like overestimates his ability, and I think it's it's one of those things where it annoys people like me who at least know actually like how this shit works. But um, what's it called? Blazon embraces this shit, right? Like literally everybody who watches his stream is watching it to see his guild implode. That is, like, the reason to watch Blazon in the first place. So. I do not hate Blazon as a person. Right? I, I have nothing against him as a human being or whatever. I think he is a bad guild leader, and I think he makes routinely terrible decisions for his guilds. And I think it is funny to watch the consequences of that unfold live on stream. Um, which is, like I said, why literally everybody watches him, and he knows that. Right? He's, I, I, I don't know what a lol cow means in this context, but I guess kind of? I, I think one of the other maybe slight problems with Blazon is he isn't entirely self-aware. He is somewhat self-aware. But a lot of times he annoys the hell out of people because he will confidently say things that are just complete bullshit. Right? Um... It's one of those things where if you know nothing about Blazon, it's a little bit harder to explain. Uh, but the the biggest one, I would say, whenever I try to explain to people, like, why why does the average, like, Mythic Raider not like Blazon? Uh, the easiest way to look at it is go look up Blazon Competitive WoW. And there is a really good example of Blazon writing... He wrote a large post on competitive wow titled something to the effect of like insights from a mythic or cutting edge raid leader or something like that and he basically tried to advertise this post and he posted it a bunch of places it, effectively this was like marketing for his guild and his twitch stream basically i am a really good raid leader you should watch my stream if you want more insights like this and i am going to talk about the way that my guild progressed through nihilotha to teach people the problem is the entire thing was just complete fucking nonsense. It contained a lot of blatant misinformation, and there's a really good response in the comments just completely eviscerating everything that Blazon says in the post. And stuff like that, I also, I forgot to use my champion's honor. Stuff like that is generally, admittedly he's been a little bit better about it recently, about like not confidently acting like he is the best raid leader ever. Um, which that kind of annoys a lot of people, but like I said, it, it is one of those things where when you know something or when you, you are like good at something and you see somebody confidently being wrong about it and then trying to teach their confidently wrong information to other people, it gets a little bit annoying. And at this point, admittedly, it's uh, a bit more of just like, I've been following the ghost gaming saga for a while. And from my personal perspective, right? As I just explained, I have personal investment in Ghost Gaming. I should add that 
Um, uh, th this is something where people who have been around for a while may remember this. But I raided in a guild called uh, Stormrage GG for part of uh, Sepulchre of the First Ones. Now, Stormrage GG was a... It, it was basically a boosting community that was basically being disguised as a guild. This is where I met my friend Zan and a few of my other friends from that tier. Basically, the, the raid leader was pretending that it was an actual guild, but he was actually just using the guild as a front for his boosting community. And basically, when my guild that I was in before imploded at the end of... Uh, or the basically, end of Sanctum of Domination, start of Sepulchre, the first ones, I joined this guild unaware of what it was, and I found out, like, about a week after joining it. And I took no part in, like, the real money trading bullshit that was going on, but it was one of those things where I talked to my friends who I joined with them, had it just been me, I probably could have found a different guild. But I had joined with a bunch of different friends from my previous guild who were not, like, as able to find, like, a guild that, you know, were raided at, like, their specific times. And this guild really worked well for their times, and we all kind of wanted to raid together. So it was kind of like, we either stick it out here and at least hope the progression is good, or we each individually find new guilds that we can't raid together anymore. And unfortunately, we did have to do that eventually, because... This guild is a powder keg waiting to explode, right? It eventually did in spectacular fashion. One of the nice things is almost all the friends that I made in that guild, including Xan, I have still been talking actively to this day. I made a lot of good friends in that guild, despite how much of a shit show it was. Now, the thing about that, and this is an interesting topic I've talked, I've mentioned before, is the guild leader of that guild, like I said, who was using it as a front for his boosting community. He actually scammed Blazon, apparently. I I still don't know exactly, you know, how that whole thing played out. The gist of what I've heard is that he was doing, or he was getting, like, boosting runs organized. And Blazon volunteered at the time Anvil Gaming to do some of his boosting runs. So he was looking for guilds to basically run some of that on his own. He provides the sellers, or the buyers, I mean... Um, let me, uh, real quick, just take some talent points before I forget. Fail Concoction is good. I'm going to go with, uh, Sanguine Blades, and then let's grab Systemic Failure. And for other talent points... I think maneuverability is probably worth running. Um, so he basically outsourced a lot of his runs to Ghost Gaming, or at the time Anvil. And the one thing that I know for sure, because this has been corroborated by both sides, is I know that part of it is 100% true. You know, he ran a boosting community, Blazon volunteered to do um, some of the runs. And it was a Sanctum of Domination run, and they took two hours to kill Sylvanas. I think, somewhere in that range. The exact number I have heard different ones. Because I have also, for the record, I've gotten both sides of the story. Because I there are actually people within Ghost Gaming who watch my content. And w when I when they found or when they found out that I was like involved in a lot of this stuff tangentially, and like they started messaging me, I was like, fuck, I have an inside source in Ghost Gaming now. I'm just going to ask them questions about this. So I asked them about this thing that I had heard about, and they gave me their side of the story. Um, but I, uh, like, I I know for a fact that the boost did not go according to plan. It was supposed to be, like, a one-shot, and they wiped multiple times. Now, the way that my former guild leader, the one who, like, ran the boosting community, tells it, it took a very long time. Like, it was a disaster of a run. It was, like, three hours over schedule or something crazy like that. They just could not kill Sylvanas to save their lives. You know, Blazon was just completely shitting the bed, etc., etc. I need to vanish. I fucking hate that chain ability. That completely fucked me there. Actually, I'm kind of little bit in trouble right now general i need to i need to switch consumables for starters before i forget that because i hit level 40 
I'm gonna grab Bear Tartar. So refresh these buffs, switch to Bear Tartar, and then I get Hyper Augment Rune. Right. So, like I said, the way that the story was told by uh, my guild leader at the time is that it was a complete disaster. Blaze on had no idea what he was doing. Um, it was one of, like, the biggest PR disasters that his boosting community had faced in a while, because suddenly they had all these people who paid for a run that was going to be done in two hours, and it was taking, like, five hours because everything went wrong. So, he basically told Blazon, you're garbage, fuck off, never do boost again, and he refused to pay Blazon. So, Blazon, or, or the people in Blazon's guild who were there for that run will say it was not nearly that bad, and yes, the run did not go according to plan, but it was only slightly off schedule. Are you fucking kidding me? This fucking mob was running, or flying over me as I'm doing Fan of Knives shit. Oh, this is so bad. Uh, I actually think I'm dead here. Unless I can get out of combat. I guess I got out of combat. That was just... What are the fucking odds? As I'm doing that pull, it flies directly above me. That's really fucking annoying. Um, yeah, so... Apparently, it was... No matter how you slice it, it was not a good run. That is, nobody has tried to say, Oh, yeah, no, it was a pristine run. Everything went well. They shit the bed. For, like, a, a regular Sylvanas boost. And... Then, uh, personally, this is where I actually do side with Blazon. I think that no matter how bad the boost went, you can offer, like, a discount or something like that. But if they completed the, the Sylvanas kill and everybody got their kill, everybody got their loot, you can't just refuse to pay the people. And this is where, like I said, the, the guild leader at the time, known scammer, uh, he scammed millions of gold for my friends. Guy's an asshole. I've told that part of the story so many times. Um, but he refused to pay Blazon, no matter how you slice it. Yeah, that's a dick move. He should not have done that. He should have at least given Blazon part of it. You want to take off 50% of the gold for like a really bad run? That's fair. Give people like a 50% refund or something like that. And honestly, the part about, you know, you can't do sales for us ever again, that one, I also completely understand. If you fuck up a sale that badly, makes complete sense to be like, you're not allowed to do sales in our community again. Okay, understandable. Um, so the main con issue was, A, the degree of severity of, like, how bad the run went, and also whether or not he should have been paid. I don't know which side is telling the truth. I don't have logs of the run. I don't have video footage of the run. I don't know whether it was a complete and total absolute train wreck or if it was just a slightly bad run. But either way, uh, Guild Leader didn't pay out, and Blazon got pissed, and they went on a crusade. So all that to say, after this, since they were both on the same server, uh, Blazon started, Blazon and people in his guild basically started harassing the shit out of Stormrage GG, which, after I joined, by extension, meant me. Uh, now, it let up a little bit because one of the things that was kind of amusing is one of the people who was doing a lot of the harassment was one of those people I mentioned who watches my stream. So when he found out that I was actually in that guild, suddenly he was like, oh, okay. And he didn't do it as much, uh, especially because I started like feeding him inside info on like the fact that I think he was initially under the impression that everybody in that guild was aware that it was a boosting community and was like going along with it. When, as I said, that was very much not the case. Uh, we were all kind of blindsided by the whole thing. Also... I forgot to pick up the Iron Horde orders, right? So I think with, with that context, he let up a little bit. But for a while, when I was in this guild, we had to deal with a lot of bullshit from both Blazon and other people in Ghost Gaming. So I had already known about them. This was right around the time of like the whole, that's how we read the boys clip. So Blazon was just becoming like a meme within the community. And alongside all of that, I was having to deal with this bullshit, right? So, that obviously was a little bit annoying and made me dislike their general guilt a lot more. Um, but, in fairness, the guild that I was in was not 
really that great either. And it was mostly because of that one particular person uh, who, yeah, really sucked. And eventually I, I quit that guild. I Did I really DC? Fucking lovely. Um, okay. So completely restart the game. Lovely. Um, but yeah, I would say that is like the reason why initially I was not a big fan of um, of Blazon. But definitely it's one of those things where the more you learn about it, the more annoying it gets. Like, yeah, Pepperjack, you even said you've seen that post. The guy replied with a bunch of good info and he was very dismissive. Yeah, exactly. That That is like the general reason why people hate Watch Blazon. Um, the main reason, the main thing that annoys a lot of people and, and, and like I said, I don't really hate him as a person. He did not directly participate in a lot of the individual, like, harassment when I was in that guild. Um, it was more so, like, I, I don't know if he encouraged people to do it, or if it was just one of those things where a lot of other people also hated the guild because they had been burned by it as well. But he definitely didn't condemn it, and he knew it was happening for sure. Um, and I think that is kind of another issue with Blazon. Uh, and, and this is like, this is borderline kind of shitty person stuff, but I think he's at least recognized that a little bit and tried to like curb it. Like quite frankly, recently he, um, he kicked sucker mode out of his guild and anybody who followed that drama is, uh, probably aware that, yeah, like Sucko said, uh, a lot of pretty weird stuff on Twitter and Blazon, admittedly, probably not because he's like, ah, I, I... <laughs> Blazon tried to, basically, the, the other thing that this is why it's like a little bit funny to me is Blazon lets Suckamode say a lot of, frankly, gamer words, you know, in his guild for years. And there's a lot of other people who are still on the team who have said some pretty bad stuff, gamer words, levels, uh, for years. And Blazon knows about it and does nothing. And he doesn't, he turns a blind eye to all that because he obviously doesn't want to deal with it because he already has issues recruiting as is. So he just tries to completely ignore when people are like, hey, why do you have this guy in your guild who said, like, you know, racial slurs? Isn't that kind of a bad look? And he just doesn't address it. Okay. Um, but then suddenly Sucko Mode goes off on like a rant on Twitter saying like, you know, mildly misogynistic stuff, not trying to like tone it down, but it, admittedly it was more just him being kind of stupid more than saying anything really egregious. And then this is what Blazon chooses to hyper fixate on, on like, this is unacceptable behavior in my guilt, which despite the fact that, like I said, he's let this go on for a while. Why? Well, because this time when Sukumo did it, he actually got a pretty hefty amount of backlash for it. And there were people basically tweeting at Blazon, like, you know, how can you allow this behavior in, a, in your guild? And it went beyond the usual of just a few people calling him out. Suddenly he had a lot of people calling him out. And then the moment it became a bad look for him to have this person in his guild, especially now that he's considering himself part of an org, right? Now he basically demands, and, and I happen to know the behind the scenes stuff, because like I said, I know people in that guild. Um, he demands that Succomode apologize to him and apologize publicly. Succomode tells him to stuff it, and Blazon then kicks Succomode from the guild. Now, completely honest, I don't really think he did it because of what Succomode actually said, which is why I find the whole thing a little bit amusing, because he will 100% paint that as he did it because what Sokomode said, like, whatever his tweet is, like, this is unacceptable behavior towards women, blah, 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 which, like, yeah, obviously, it's it's misogynistic crap, it's not okay, but that's obviously not why Blazon cares about it. He cares about it because people are talking about it, and it makes his guild look bad, and because when he demanded that Sukko make a public apology, Sukko told him to fuck off, basically, to his face. And then at that point, well, now it's an attack on him, and it's an attack on his ego. If he can't control the members of his guild and make them do what he wants to keep this, like, I mean, he tries to have, like, a squeaky clean, ugh, words, squeaky clean public persona when that is, like, so far from what he's established over the years, but he still tries to act like he's some serious guild, 
So when he tries to demand that one of his members make a public apology and they tell him to fuck off, he kicks them, as he claims publicly, because he does not value that stuff within Ghost Gaming, but it absolutely was not really because of that. It was 100% just because Sucker refused to publicly apologize and refused to do what he wanted. So that is kind of, I guess, the gist of some of the issues that I have with Blazon. Now, admittedly, as I said before, do I despise the dude? No. Do I think he's like a terrible human being? No. Do I think he's a poor judge of character and makes a lot of stupid decisions within his guild? Yes. Do I think it is entertaining to watch him stream the implosion of his guild? Yes. I Like, I am not forcing him to stream that shit, right? Like, there are certain things where... God, you would not catch me dead live streaming half the shit that Blazon does. I mean, there's like clips of him arguing with his wife, like on stream. And it's like, brother, turn the camera off. Like, God, why? It, it To a certain degree, like he has no shame and he's willing to like literally keep streaming despite everything that goes wrong to him. And you got to respect that a little bit. Like it, it is so... Uh, embarrassing almost that it's commendable he's willing to keep going through that but i mean to be clear a lot of it he kind of opens up on himself because of that hope that was at least a, a thorough explanation on that um but yeah i mean you could definitely call it toxic if you want and admittedly there are a lot of people who i think take it too far a lot of people do harass blazon right like i am i am watching from a distance I have uh, talked to people within the guild. I now have, you know, friends within the guild. And I will gleefully message them and ask them, like, questions about what's going on and, like, get the inside scoop in the drama. But I have had zero direct interactions with um, Blazon or, like, mostly just Blazon. I've actually talked to a few people on that team. But any time I've talked to people on that team, even if they've done some stuff that I quite frankly don't think is super great i'm not gonna like give them shit or be mean to them or anything like that i think that is obviously taking it a step too far um so i definitely there are levels to it obviously harassment is not cool as i've said that was kind of one of the things that even spurred me on uh disliking it in the first place but i think it is perfectly fine to watch from distance and like the schadenfreude of like seeing somebody's guild implode after they do a lot of dumb, arrogant bullshit. I think that's normal. But to each their own. I know a lot of people who probably don't like it. Let me make sure I don't die here. This pull's a little bit sketchy. Uh, Probably just in Venom here. I think I want the instant damage. And then... One more Canyon Boulder Breaker. Anyways. Uh, let me... I'm While I was talking about that, that was a long discussion, so I missed a few things in chat. So I'm going to scroll up a little bit just to make sure I caught up on everything. Um, oh, I actually, yeah. I, I missed a lot of stuff during that uh, discussion. I'm missing one Gorin Egg. And oop. Yeah. Uh I am here. Everybody There we go. Okay, I found where I left off. Uh rogues either have to be nerfed a ton or their default meta and keys. Yeah, that that Aug Evoker change would be disastrous for balancing reasons. this and then we can fly back down to beast watch uh miss the class race discussion but vulpera paladin please yeah that would be pretty cool too uh, anything paladin there's a lot of cool races for paladin um let's see you personally love rogues, mostly sub, but you might try assassin. I think there's a very big difference between rogues in endgame content and rogues in leveling. So, 
none of my comments on rogues for leveling should reflect how rogues feel or play or whatever in endgame content. You gotta separate that. Because endgame content, I've heard a lot of good things about rogues. I think a lot of people feel they play very well, and uh, most rogue players I know seem to enjoy it. But leveling, it has some clear problems. And, you know, maybe you still enjoy leveling rogue, but just... From an objective standpoint, Rogue is very problematic uh, for leveling, just because it has a lot of issues. Okay, so I have five points left to spend until I reach the bottom section of the tree. I'm going to go with Lethal Dose. Then I'm going to go uh, Doom Blade, And then I need two more points. I'm going to take... Probably Seal Fate and Improved Poisons, I think, is what I was planning on. These two seem better. Alright. Uh, where do I want to go first? I think I'm going to head out this way, and I'm going to do Miscreet Mire. We're just going to do the usual loop, and then I can set my Hearthstone to the Talador place when I get there, and then I will go back and do the rest of Hillsbrad. I think that's probably a good way to do that. Um, Caustic Spatter requires mobs to be stacked. Yeah. Thing is, I don't think either one is super great, but I think Caustic Spatter... I, I could be wrong in this. I think it may be at least a better option. There's honestly also an argument to be made, maybe about just not even taking either talent and just going Seal Fate early on to access Deathmark, and then instead of taking this, running like Master Assassin. I could see that, really. In fact, that actually, the more I talk about that, I think that may be a generally better way to build it. Uh, it doesn't feel too bad overall, though, so it's not like I really need that. It just the Fan of Knives stuff in general makes this at least feel playable. Whereas, like, Outlaw, it felt really janky. And, like, it just fundamentally didn't work. Do Fan of Knives. White Deathmark. Crimson Tempest. Grote. I do wish that some of the other, like, really strong talents, like Poison Bomb, were a little bit earlier. Obviously, I get why the capstones are there. You know, if you could access Poison Bomb in the midsection of the tree, well, that would be kind of broken. But it's, uh... It is unfortunate that it feels like a lot of your endgame power, from what I've seen by looking at logs and stuff, is kind of tied behind capstone talents. Whereas, generally speaking, for a lot of other specs, the capstone talents are more modifications to your existing things. I suppose you could argue that Poison Bomb is technically a modification to an existing talent, but... or existing ability. It's a little bit different when you consider that, um... The, uh... Like, and Venom prior to getting Poison Bomb is a pure single target spender, which is significantly weaker than having an AoE spender. Start this. Let me also take one moment. I need to drink a bit of coffee, because I'm, I'm starting. I still have, like, a full mug. I haven't really touched it much. But I, I need to take a moment to just... Breathe, and I'm going to reach out a little bit. You started playing retail in BFA, never finished leveling in the day until Dragonflight was out, night and day changes? Oh yeah, definitely. The Shadowlands changes were the main ones. Dragonflight had just kind of expanded upon that a little bit. Uh, they should go harder into storytelling in new dungeons. You never have any idea what's going on in the game until the cinematics in the raid and trailer. Yeah. I guess. You think them saying we fucked up or complete hacks would be a, an improvement? Um, I agree with that statement. I definitely agree that Blizzard admitting they fucked up would go a long way towards restoring people's trust in their ability to like tell a story. And if they were to say like, we are we fucked up, we're going to start the story from scratch. I would at least be willing to hear them out. The problem is I don't really think that would work out super well. I think it would definitely be better than the alternative of just 
continuing to go down this road of having a lackluster story that nobody really cares about. But I think, first off, they're never going to admit that they it's actually not good, because I think that they genuinely believe that, you know, their farts don't stink, right? As I said before, they genuinely think that the story is good. It's the, the classic thing that I've talked about before of, like, before, um, before Dragonflight, they were saying, like, oh, no, Dragonflight's story's gonna be good, it's Steve Denuser's baby, and the all those older expansions, they were all the work of the evil of Frasiabi, right? You know, that that guy, like, he's the, the guy who did all, like, the evil shit at Blizzard. It's his fault that the story's bad, and I think that's a very easy scapegoat to make, but it's just bullshit. Like, there's absolutely no way that one person fucked up the WoW story as bad as it is. That is not, like, a a one person made a rogue decision that completely ruined the WoW story. Like, do they maybe want to argue that he was the one who pushed for Sylvanas to go in the direction that she did? Uh, sure, I believe that. But it's, like, one of the classic things that I learned early on in writing classes is a good writer can make an interesting story about poop, right? If you actually know how to write and you're actually able to tell a compelling story, it doesn't matter, like, the elements within your story or what you have to work with you can still make it interesting and they just failed to do that completely so i don't know it's also dragonflight is actually i think the opposite dragonflight i think could be very interesting and they have just told the most boring milk toast story ever i mean i this is something that i think i've had to argue a little bit with people because there's a lot of people who, for whatever reason, do enjoy the Dragonflight st story. And I guess if you do, cool. I'm glad you do, because I do not. And I cannot find it interesting whatsoever. And I will acknowledge that a lot of that is probably because I am jaded by how poorly the storytelling has been for a while. I'm not going to pretend that I am completely without bias and, you know, oh, I, I am not at all influenced by their previous storytelling. I'm you know, reviewing it completely independently. No, I, I'm definitely even subconsciously biased, though I did at least try to... I, I, that, on, honestly, that's not even completely true. I was really heavily biased from the start, but admittedly, going into Dragonflight, seeing what they had to offer, I was very quickly unimpressed, and I, I just didn't really have any interest in continuing to pay attention. Um, uh, I, I guess it could be argued that I technically did not give the Dragonflight story as fair of a, you know, test as I could have. I didn't go in with a completely open mind. I didn't, like, watch every cutscene through and through the entire story thinking, maybe this cutscene is the one that changes my mind in Dragonflight. No, I did make up my mind about it pretty early on, and my opinion hasn't changed, but admittedly, and, and this based on the like, the average people that I've talked to. Like, there are some people who do tell me they think Dragonflight's story is good, um, but most people I've talked to have agreed with that sentiment. And, yeah, I, I, I just don't think it's very interesting. Uh, admittedly, one of the biggest things that made me completely check out from the story is how nonsensically garbage the Waking Shores questline is. And just generally speaking, like, Sendrax, whoever thought that Sendrax was a good NPC to put in at the start of the Dragonflight story, I, I mean, I'm sorry, they're a fucking idiot. Like, Sendrax has to be the worst starting NPC we've ever had to deal with, and it's for nothing. Like, I, I don't want to, like, criticize the voice actor because I don't know what directions the voice actor was given. But the voice actor for Sendrax is terrible. They did a terrible job with it. Now, they may have been given terrible directions, and that's what led to it. Maybe they were told, act like a dumb, goofy, aloof dragon that doesn't know how to do anything, and is like the typical, like, goofy, oh, I, I, I hope I don't mess up, I hope Alex Straza-chan, like, notices me, or whatever. Like, if that was the direction they were given, then it is no fault at all of the actual voice actor. But it is easily the most miserable performance of the expansion, and it's the first thing you see in the first zone. And the entire story is just so nonsensically pointless. 
I just, I could not get interested. So I was already checked out by Onarin Plains. And admittedly, Onarin Plains actually had, in my opinion, one of the stronger stories of the Dragonflight Zones. Uh, I also, I quite liked the Thaldrazis questline just because they embraced the goofiness, right? The Thaldrazis questline with Kuromi, lore-wise, it was complete nonsense. But, like, they kind of knew that. And, you know, it wasn't like trying to tell what they thought was a compelling story. You kind of knew that they were just embracing chaos. And it's like, you know, you're running through different time ways. It's meant to be goofy. And for that reason, I can cut it a bit more slack and be like, yeah, I actually enjoyed it somewhat. But the quest lines where Blizzard is clearly taking themselves really seriously. And it's just so bad. Those are the ones that make the current Dragonflight story so hard to sit through. Where it, it is just nonsense like honestly the whole emerald dream plotline is so boring and uninspired that i can't even really be excited about an emerald dream patch i just fundamentally from like a thematic element like i get that they're trying to mimic firelands but really that's the best you could come up with as a premise for a patch big angry fire dragon tries to burn down tree real that is all you got and it's not even like there's any nuance. It's literally just big angry fire dragon wants to burn down a fucking tree. There's no deeper meaning or anything like that. And it's the typical, like, unfortunately, kind of the way that World of Warcraft is structured in terms of its storytelling. They, they like, undermine themselves where I'm sure there is some MacGuffin reason why Farak can't just immediately go and burn down the tree. But the structure of the raid is literally, you're going through a Mirdrasil, Farak is like floating in the air above Smolderon's room, the entire raid, you kill Smolderon, and Farak's like, ha, mortals, this was all part of my master plan! I needed to become even more fire-empowered through the Firelands, so I could become a fire dragon that is now also part fire elemental! And, like, at the end of the fight, Smolderon's like, No! You've tricked me! I will get my revenge, dragon! And then Farak flies off, and you kill Smolderon. And then, like, the the line that Tindril Sage Swift uses when you pull the boss, so you have to listen to this every time you pull him in raid testing, is like, uh, you mortals have outrun your usefulness, or whatever the fuck it is. Basically, like, ah, oh, you are no longer part of my master scheme. And, like, now that he's become even more fire-empowered, he can finally take down the evil tree and burn it to a crisp. And then you have to go and finally, in some epic climactic finish, stop Farak from setting the tree on fire. Woo! Amazing storytelling. It's just painful to like sit through that shit it's the most juvenile like i said high school fanfic garbage of like who writes this shit who thinks this is actually interesting it's like this stuff is passable when it's like a cartoon that you watch like you know in the morning for 15 minutes and it's you know batman beating up some generic evil villain of the week or whatever the fuck but like you, you have all the time to think of, like, an interesting way to integrate the Emerald Dream into the story, and you're like, what if the Fire Dragon wants to torch the tree? Wow. And that's as far as it goes. It's like... I don't know. I just, I genuinely struggle to understand how people can really convincingly argue to anybody that this is, like, a story worth paying any sort of attention to. I just find it dull as hell. But anyways, I've probably already ranted about that enough. Uh... You didn't mind Sendrax at all? I guess Teach Throne. I, I found it grating. Um, admittedly, the original voice actor was even worse. So, there's an improvement from the beta version, which is what I played through. Uh, I still think the general writing of the character was terrible. She's useless, and then she dies being useless, and you're supposed to feel sad for her, despite knowing her for a grand total of 30 minutes and her doing literally nothing of consequence. Um, 
How do you brew your coffee and how do you take it? Uh, black coffee and I have a Keurig. So I have a Keurig. I also have a big, uh, like mug, no, like sealed mug thing. So it stays warm for a really long time now. And just, I have a, the type of uh, Keurig pods that I use are called Donut Shop. That's like the brand. I've had Donut Shop, Keurig pods. Oh God, has it been over 10 years that I've been having the same type of coffee almost every single day? It's good coffee. Um, now, admittedly, I used to have some uh, cream and sugar with my coffee, and I still don't mind it every now and then. Like, to me, cream and sugar with my coffee is like a rare thing that I use sometimes when I just... I, I'm kind of in the mood for it. Uh, but I would say almost all the time, like every single time, if I'm just making coffee for the sake of it, you know, it, I, I like coffee, it helps keep me functional, then it's just black coffee, nothing special on it. It would be pretty unhealthy otherwise, but, you know, I, I don't, I just have black coffee. I like black coffee, honestly. That's another thing. So many people always say that they don't understand how I drink black coffee because black coffee is disgusting. And it's like, I guess like the first time I ever had black coffee, I probably also thought it was disgusting, but it really grows on you, I think. I, I mean, personally for me, I love black coffee now. Like, it, not even like copium of... Oh, I yeah, I actually do like it and stuff. Because, like, I know some people who don't really like it, but drink it because, you know, it's it's convenient or whatever. I initially started drinking black coffee because it was convenient. Because I didn't want to, you know, have have to, like, prepare coffee beyond just, like, making it and then adding shit to it. Like, that was too much effort. I was too lazy. But at this point, I genuinely just prefer black coffee most of the time. There's something about the taste that, like, just I really... Really, really, really like. So. Um, with the mention of Firelands, you hope Cataclassic is confirmed? Yeah. Uh, Cataclassic is basically confirmed. There's a funny little, like, semi-leak that they did. I don't really think it was an intentional leak. And I'm sure that if anybody a actually calls them out on it before BlizzCon, they're probably going to be like, whoa, you know, it could be anything. Like, there's literally Deathwing shirts in the BlizzCon store. Um, and of course, right now, they're branded as, like, generic Deathwing stuff, but it's not something that they normally have, at least to this degree. So it's pretty obvious that yeah, Cataclassic's coming. Um, also, I completely forgot to use my, uh... Completely forgot to use my Champion's Honor ability before pulling all those orcs, so... I don't get Orc Thorn or Ancient Branch, but... Whatever. Not that big of a deal. Uh, at this point, I just need one more Infested. I guess I have one chance at Orc Thorn if this guy happens to give it. Uh, but yeah, Catac Cataclassic is coming. It, it is, there is absolutely no chance that we don't get it. Fuck, I got it off the first kill. No shit. All right, that's actually pretty nice. Uh, I, I will be extremely surprised and extremely disappointed if we don't get Cataclysm Classic. It's like all but confirmed. The only thing I'm curious about is the details of it. I think they're probably going to remove LFR as a way of posturing, which I think is stupid. Um, they've been kind of doing this like whole posturing nonsense for a while of you know we're listening to the classic community and we're like taking out the things that ruined classic and i hope they just realize nobody gives a shit and just like there were issues with the cataclysm version of imp of lfr fix the implementation of lfr and make it similar to the retail version of lfr and it literally is not even a problem and i don't know but i have a feeling that I said it before, if they put, if they remove LFR, then they get to, like, have news articles that, like, clickbait the fact that, you know, Cataclysm's most hated feature is being removed in Cataclassic, and then it's, like, a PR win for them, even if it is actually kind of stupid in concept. But that is, like, the only dumb thing that I suspect they will probably do. There are a lot of potentially good things that they could end up doing, mostly with, like, quality of life shit that I'm very tentatively hopeful for, uh, mostly because they've been doing a lot of really good stuff in Wrath Classic. A lot of the recent quality of life changes in Wrath Classic are, they are fantastic. 
And if they keep down that train of just taking retail stuff and adding it to Classic, I will be a happy man. And I think Cataclysm Classic kind of is the perfect place to do that, because a lot of the Classic Andes aren't going to play Cataclysm anyway. They all think Cataclysm is like the death of WoW. So the entire reason why Blizzard has had to kind of watch what they add and stuff with random Dungeon Finder and that bullshit, because they, they know all the vocal idiots in the classic community are going to be like, oh my god, Dungeon Finder ruins my game, my classic experience, oh! Uh, but now that they're gone, because they're going to either play Hardcore or like Vanilla Era or Wrath Classic, whatever, it's it's Cataclysm. Just go wild. Add whatever the fuck you want from retail, and I'm all for that. I hope that's what they're going to do, because the whole you think you do what you don't, or, or what completely confused my sayings the whole um hashtag no changes thing made sense for original classic and they carried it on all the way into wrath beyond the point where it made sense and at least now they're finally starting to realize that it was a dumb decision to listen to the classic andes for as long as they did so we'll see how that goes please do the classic andy voice line but read out centrax's lines <laughs> Uh, that could be interesting. Um, yeah, oh, we're almost certainly going to get the transmog tab. That one, considering they've already added the mount collection tab and the um, like the toy box and stuff to Wrath Classic, there is almost no way we don't get the transmog collection tab. Like, uh, everything in here, which at this point, literally the only thing in the collection tab that we don't have is the appearance collection. Obviously, because transmog doesn't exist. So, transmog being added in uh, Wrath or uh, Cataclysmic launch, I would say, is almost a no-brainer. Because obviously, transmog wasn't added until uh, Dragon Soul, but it would make absolutely no sense to not include transmog with the launch. So, they almost certainly will do that, and they will probably include the appearance collection with it, because everything else in Classic right now is already. Uh, part of the collection tab, which is fantastic, by the way. It is the best thing they've done for Classic. The fact that I can use Grand Expedition or um, Traveler's Tundra Mammoth on my alts, oh, it's so good. I love it. And I have, like, easy access to infinite heirlooms. Absolutely amazing change. It's also just nice, because now I get to fill out my toy box and heirloom collection stuff. It's just really fun. So, yeah, there have been a lot of good changes for Wrath. So I'm hopeful... Uh, actually, a while ago, I did say that I think they're going to do the whole LFR bullshit. I actually think that with the direction they've been taking uh, Classic now, there is maybe a chance that they don't remove LFR. And they say, you know, we're going to improve it so it's not as bad as it was initially, but we're keeping it in because I think giving casual players like an easy way to experience the story was conceptually always a good idea. It was just that LFR's implementation has always had so many problems over the years, and Blizzard has struggled to figure out what the hell they want to do with it. They don't remove LFR, it has unique appearances. I'm sure if they did remove it, they'd find ways to reintroduce those appearances. But yes, I think it would be way too much effort to cleanly remove LFR from the game. So, personally, what I think they should do is just add it to all of the other raids. And at least, like, don't add new appearances or something, but just make it so people can experience the story. And I think LFR should have always been a story mode. It, uh, you know, it had problems in Cataclysm in its original launch, but even right now, I think LFR is just in a really weird spot. We technically, like, still kind of are encouraged to run LFR, to get, like, tier bonuses at the start of the tier, especially now with the accelerated LFR release schedule. And, like, that doesn't feel good. Like, I had to run LFR, and I I actually got my two-piece on my Demon Hunter at the start of Avarice by using an item I got from LFR. And the fact that it exists, I'm effectively forced to do that, right? Because what am I supposed to do? Just not have my tier bonus for raid if I can? And, obviously, Vengeance Avarice two-piece was broken as hell, so... I definitely need to get that. But, um, like, the thing is, I replaced that piece pretty quickly because, obviously, LFR is not my, you know, endgame content. So if they had not 
I don't know, if they had not dropped, like, tier... I, I don't exactly know how you solve that in, like, a satisfying way, but I think the fact that, um, like, endgame raiders are still in some shape or form encouraged to run LFR to get gear upgrades sucks. And it just leads to disappointing situations like that. Yeah. Take a moment to not die here. And then we're just gonna do a little paint of knives. And Jesus, my auto attacks hit like wet noodles. It is like painful trying to do any damage whatsoever. Uh my experience potion fell off. You think three or four Four of your DH's first four tier pieces were also LFR appearances, yeah. I think making there be a large item level gap between LFR and normal is maybe something they could do. Uh, personally, I think they should just make it so LFR doesn't drop tier. That might be like a bit of an unfortunate thing for like casual players, but like you have the creation catalyst, right? Um, that way, at least you don't have like mythic raiders coming in and taking part of your loot I, I don't i really don't know i honestly think though lfr should probably be like in a perfect ideal world lfr should be a dungeon and it should drop like mythic zero level loot and it should be doable in a group of five people and it's literally just like a massively toned down story mode where none of the mechanics can really kill you where the only point is if you want to complete the raid quests and you want to see the conclusion to the raid, you can do LFR. Uh, since we have the catalyst, nothing should drop here. We should just convert it. Um, I, yeah, it's an interesting mindset of, while I agree with you in terms of I would prefer that Goose Comics, I understand why Blizzard doesn't do it. Obviously... Would I love to be able to just get easy four-piece at the start? Yes. I think everybody does, and definitely one of the nice things about playing later in the season now is you very easily just get your four-piece on your alts and stuff. However, it makes sense why they don't do that, because then it would mean people are able to just, like, very easily get a full set of uh, tier without any effort. And at least now, you kind of need to, like, allocate your tier pieces to, like, the people in your raid who you want to get four-piece early. And one of the biggest loot decisions at the moment in early raid is who gets their tier bonus first and stuff like that. Whether that's good or bad, I don't know. I personally would rather not have to deal with it, so I can uh, relate to that. But I understand why Blizzard does it at the very least, is I guess what I was saying before. Okay, now I will do return to camp so we can go do some Hillsbride Foothills. I'm good, Seth Shelby. Hope you're good as well. Thanks for stopping by the stream. We still have the last boss that awards the Omni token. Keep that in. Yeah, I mean, the Omni token isn't going anywhere. They're keeping that for Amir Drissel. So, yeah, that's definitely good. You don't know if you'd like that. It would also specifically time gate everybody's tier. Yeah. Oh, this rare has respawned? And the time that I was doing the other stuff. It's actually kind of neat. Didn't expect that to happen. It would definitely be different. I don't know if it would be good. Uh, I've used all of my new items, right? Yeah, yeah I, I disagree, Goose Comics, that the time getting everybody at the same time would be great. I Like I said, it's different. I don't know if it's good or bad. Personally, I don't think I would prefer that, but... Uh, where are my quest items? Oh, they're in the other bag. Let's see. That's just WoW players in general, nothing is a good change. I, I think the better way to describe it is that people don't trust Blizzard to make good changes. So, generally speaking, now... I think... The problem with that situation is there's only two ways it can go. One of them is everybody gets very easy four piece, in which case, yeah, I'd honestly be fine with that. Right now, getting access to your four piece is meant to be like an early, you know, roadblock in the gearing process. 
and that is intentional design, but you could argue that, like, it's not healthy and it should be removed. That's fair. The thing that I dislike and that I personally think would not be great is everybody is, like, heavily time-gated and you unlock your tier bonus by, like, week whatever. Um, I do think the fact that you can, by clearing content, get your tier bonus earlier, I think that's good. I think the idea of the creation catalyst is eventually everybody will get their tier bonus online at a specific date, but if you are, like, doing the entirety of Heroic Amirgisil or even Mythic and stuff, you may be able to get your bonus really early. And I think that is good. I think, you know, being able to get, like, an early advantage by clearing harder content is something that should be encouraged. Um, so, I don't know. It's my personal opinion. Like I said... I wouldn't say one is worse or better or worse than the other, though, if, like, in the grand scheme of things. I can definitely say which one I would prefer, um, but I don't think one is, like, super duper bad, like, objectively worse. I think it would be different. I think I would prefer the current system, but I would not, like, hate it if you told me that, you know, Blizzard was changing it to be XYZ. I'd probably complain. I'd probably, you know, rant for a little bit about it on stream, as I usually do, but, you know... Uh, it wouldn't be, like, a huge deal to me. It would just be, like, your run-of-the-mill, this-bugs-me type of thing. Um, well, I, I choose to go in LFR to get tier, for starters. Uh, there are ma they are making good changes to tier acquisition outside of the LFR stuff. I think what I was more highlighting is an issue with LFR where it's meant to be a story mode for casual players and not actually meant to have a challenge, and yet they put relevant gear behind it so it has absolutely nothing to do with whether i think tier acquisition should be better or worse i was specifically speaking on whether or not lfr should even be able to drop gear like that they could make tier acquisition infinitely easier and i would still go into lfr for chances at tier if it gave me even a small damage increase right and i just don't think that should happen i don't think there should be any situation where people should feel encouraged to go into LFR as, like, Mythic Raiders to take loot that could potentially go to a casual player because that should be the entire point of LFR. So let's separate those topics. Um, I, I, I don't really understand what you're saying here, Goose Comics. You choose to go and you do not have to. I, if you want to play semantics, but I, and we both know it's a bit of a silly argument, right? I choose to go in because the design encouraged by Blizzard is that I need to get my tier set as quickly as possible so yes obviously i'm going to take any advantage i am saying that i wish that that advantage did not exist so that the entire mythic player base in general did not feel the need to do that uh, it, it is a weird perspective yeah um it, it's it's like this is basically the same type of argument as if you don't like the game don't play it especially like you're arguing with somebody who right is is trying to min max rate it and frankly, anybody at like a cutting edge level is obviously going to take any advantage that they can get. So telling them, well, it's your choice to do it. Y yeah, but obviously I don't really have much of a choice. It's like, do I take the damage increase or the chance at a damage increase or do I not? <laughs> Hard decision, right? It it's a bit of a weird argument to make and that it's not even really the entire point. Um, saying that like, Arguing for changes to tier acquisition has anything to do with whether or not you should be taking every advantage at your disposal. It's just a weird thing to say. Um, sounds like a fun topic, I guess. I, I thought it was a fun topic until now I've kind of lost any interest in talking about it because it stopped being fun and started being weirdly semantical. Um, so, I don't know. I, I was more than happy to discuss the hypotheticals until it became like a random like you know but you choose to go into lfr for stuff when my entire point was that i don't want that to happen and i think it's my entire argument which i i will just clear up right is there there's a constant saying that a lot of people use of players will optimize the fun out of everything blah 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 blah, blah. it is the developer's job to make sure that the most fun path forward is the most optimal path forward if developers are using the statement, oh, players are optimizing the fun out of our game as a way to defend their design, they are idiots. 
because if there is a really unfun or not well designed or like poorly designed path in your game to get an upgrade and players feel like to be the most optimal way or most optimal possible they need to take that advantage you have failed as a designer so my entire point is lfr why does lfr exist lfr exists as a way for like new or casual players to experience the raid and experience the story is anybody going to disagree with that hope not because it's pretty obviously the entire reason why it got made hope i don't need to defend that point so if we agree lfr is designed for casual players new players people who are not hardcore raiders who would otherwise not be able to raid then it stands to reason that all of the rewards from doing that content and all of the incentives for engaging that should only appeal to casual players. It shouldn't be, you shouldn't be encouraging cutting edge raiders to go into uh, LFR by saying, you, ne you need to do this. And I say need, if you want to sit here and say, well, it's your choice to go into here. We both know what I mean by need people who are trying to optimize their performance as much as possible, if you want to do the thing that you want to do, namely, get as much gear as possible and optimize your performance as much as possible, LFR is a part of that. There are things that you can get in LFR that would theoretically improve your damage. Well, then anybody who is obviously trying to min-max their damage is going to take that advantage. That's a no-brainer. And if there are things that could benefit those players, then uh, I think that is poor design. And I'm saying that I think it should be discouraged because at the same time, um, making LFR players feel like I need to compete with you know, people who aren't casuals to get rewards from casual content, well, they're going to feel discouraged. Like, why should I be losing this role as a casual player um, to a mythic raider who has 20 item levels overall on me? That feels bad. As a casual player, if I was in that situation, I'd probably feel bad, and I'd probably tell the player, come on, like, why are you taking this loot away from me? Like, you don't even need it, right? And to the casual player, that guy who's, like, you know, in full Mythic Raid gear probably doesn't need that item. He's like, ah, he, he already has so much gear, I have no gear, like, why is this guy taking my gear, right? But obviously to the Mythic Raider, they're like, I mean, hey, I wasn't able to get my tier bonus from Raid. I did, let's say, all of Heroic Amir Drasil and, like, first three Mythic, and I still only have three piece. So obviously, if I am expected to remain competitive in my raid, I need to try to get four piece. I need to do everything in my power to get four piece because it is a massive upgrade for me. So they are going to basically feel like if I'm not doing LFR to get a chance at getting a 10% in many cases DPS upgrade, I mean, I'm not really committed to this raid team and I'm not putting in my all. So they're just by nature of the way that the game works going to feel compelled to do that if it drops rewards that could potentially be an upgrade for them that was my entire point i feel it was a pretty obvious point but i am spelling it out because i don't know semantic arguments right which like i said like are a little bit silly to hyper fixate on stuff when I, I think we all know what i was trying to say um and, and like i said i i think it's a win-win right i think it's a no-brainer point because obviously it, you know, if there are, if there's no rewards in LFR that benefit Mythic Raiders, Mythic Raiders are happy. If I don't have to go into LFR, I would be super thrilled with that. I would love to have literally zero compelling reasons to do content that I have no personal interest in. And it would also be good for LFR players. If the only people that they were raiding with were people who were around their skill level, who were also there to just experience the story, and they all got to have a chill experience where they all have a fair chance of rolling on loot, that would just be better for them. Basic. Simple. Easy to understand, I'd hope. Doomblade. Uh, take this stuff. Um, what do I want to take here? I should probably take tight spender and maybe a trophic poison. I think for Yetimus especially, that could be a better non-lethal poison. Please make me not have to enter LFR. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, I'm going to scroll up a little bit because I still didn't finish reading a lot of messages before. Uh, I'm also, at this point, I'm waiting out the cooldown on Evasion before I do Yetimus. Because I definitely want to make it uh, balanced. Uh, honestly, I might be able to fight Yetimus right now, though. Uh, yeah, Evasion will be up. Rupture, death mark. This. Yeah, as I thought. Extremely clean Yetimus kill. Because that's the thing, right? Like, well, Rogue may struggle on, like, sustained survivability. If I can just burst Yetimus within cooldowns, you know, while I'm in Evasion and Cloak of Shadows, there's no risk. Just super duper easy. Never any concern. Um, honestly surprised you didn't start it in stealth since you can shadow step the knockback. Uh... I considered starting it in stealth, but I think the only thing that really I would have gotten out of starting it in stealth is, like, I could have opened with Ambush, I guess? The reason I didn't start it in stealth is just because I wanted to take him to the cave. And I technically could Shadow Step the knockback, but I'd much rather just negate it. It's not like Warrior where it gives me damage. Shadow Step does nothing for me. You know, in terms of, like, actually boosting my damage. I'd much rather just be sitting there. Because also, think about it this way. If I get shadow or if I get knocked in the middle of... Uh, oh, nice. Chordix is back up. If I got knocked in the middle of evasion or something like that, even if it takes me, like, only one or two seconds to get back into melee range with Yetimus, that's one or two seconds that I'm not hitting him while I have evasion up. So, maximizing my uptime during my cooldowns was very, very important there. That was kind of my logic. Whether I should have started in stealth or not, I think you could go either way, but one thing that is very safe to see, uh, or one thing that is very safe to say, is that whatever I did there worked perfectly fine. So, uh, that was more than sufficient to get a very, very, very clean Yetimus kill. Um, okay, let me scroll up. Uh, also, I kind of completely passed level 50, so I can immediately jump into Shadowlands Consumes, which is nice. Grab this. Actually, Bear Tartar I still need. And grab this, and then one more Shadow Core Oil, and Phantom Fire Potion. And then Drums of Deathly Ferocity. Alright, believe that is everything. I technically should have put Abyssal Healing Potion on my bars. Doesn't really matter. Okay. Where was I? Okay, I found where I left off in chat before we got into this whole discussion. Uh, you started playing retail and BFA. Oh, I, I, I read that already, actually. Um. Actually, I did read a lot of this. Fuck the last story. Maybe they do, like, a yeah, we're going back and all of this for a spinoff. Um, but don't actually change it in-game. Yeah, at this point, it's kind of difficult to, like, make any meaningful changes to the WoW story in-game, for sure. Without, like, severely fucking things up. Uh... You have your own game theory that 11.0 will set up the Azeroth egg being born in a reboot for the 11 or for the 12.0 expansion after the events of the next expansion fuck up the universe. Uh I definitely think they're building towards the Azeroth egg thing and have been for a while now, but um Yeah, I I don't they I don't think they're going to do a reboot. 
They're going to probably update, like, older world zones, which they've been slowly doing for a while, but I don't think they're going to do, like, a complete revamp of the world. Not to mention, there is uh, one thing I, I can say 100%. It would make absolutely no sense for them to completely remake the world just from a, you know, uh, like, design and marketing and whatever standpoint. If they completely remake the world, it's being called WoW 2. It is not going to be part of this game. Uh, they, and it's not going to happen anytime soon, right? They, there is no way that they are making a second MMO. They are still 100% continuing with World of Warcraft because it would make no sense to completely redesign it. And the amount of words, the amount of development time that would go into redesigning the entire world is not something they are going to just do on a whim. It's something that they have said they're doing slowly over time, and I don't really think it's going to be any more than that. I know you said that was just like your headcanon, right, idea for what they may potentially do, but I hate to be, you know, the ruiner of Christmas there. It, it's not going to happen. Uh, I think there's a lot of people who really would want something like that, but unfortunately there's no way that, the way that a lot of people want it to uh, be done will actually happen. Uh, okay, acrobatic strikes, echoing reprimands. Okay, so... Now that I actually have something that benefits me starting in stealth, I kind of need to do that. So I'm going to start in stealth, and we're going to open with Garot. And then Echoing Reprimand, get Slice and Dice up. Uh, I already used Garot, right? And in Venom... I should also, at this point, now that I have a lot of nature damage stuff, I should be using Shiv to give myself the nature damage buff. Probably should have started doing that a little while ago, but it's fine. But yeah, honestly, single target? This feels pretty good. Definitely Rogue's issue. Oh, nice. There's a chest over there. Rogue's issue, or at least Outlaw's issue, was AoE. This has felt pretty good. On single target, at least. I think Yetimus is a very good example of the potential strengths that... Um... Potential strengths that this class or spec can have. Right? You know, when it works, it really can actually work. Without, like, what does Deathmark do exactly? Yeah. Does, like, a shit ton of uh, extra damage from dots. Makes sense. Um... Toth about Steve Neusser said he can do whatever the fuck he wants, but I'm out. Yeah, I feel that. Um, Just make Gnome Evokers Whelp Links. That would be amusing. Definitely gonna Cloak of Shadows this. This mob could be a little bit problematic. Yeah, I got part of that in Cloak of Shadows. I should note that I honestly don't think Outlaw could have done these rares. Uh, the one problem is there is no chance that Assassination can solo this without at least Evasion and Cloak of Shadows for tanking. This mob does very heavy melee damage. Rogue may actually be one of the only classes in the game that cannot do this solo at all. Like I, I think I've shown that basically every single class at least can do this if you swap to like a tank spec. Like some struggle. Like Boomkin might struggle with this a little bit. Although I think I actually did this with Boomkin. Um, but rogues don't really have any great options. So... I, I'm going to chill here and read chat for uh, one minute, actually 70 seconds, because I want less too. I need all my cooldowns for this. Um, Did I already drink all my coffee? Oh no, I still have some left, thank god. You can skull the Mad Chief at the end of the WAD intro instead of glider gun shoes. Means you... Huh. Um... That's interesting, Naomi. I didn't consider Skull the Mad Chief. 
That said, I don't know how useful that would be because, like, one of the nice things about the Watt intro at the end is there's nothing really afterwards that you desperately need gun shoes or glider for. Maybe on Alliance side, but Horde side has a lot of unskippable RP that you kind of need to sit through. You just don't really need it by then. It's a good idea, though. You should run time locking. It's fast to level. Um, I am on the PTR. I'm not going to be fighting time locking groups in the PTR. Uh, but also, I have an entire video discussing time locking. Uh, time locking is not fast on its own. Now, if I was leveling on live servers and I wanted to be like hyper efficient, I would grab the experience boost from time locking dungeons and then I would return to questing. But A, I'm not on live servers, literally can't do it. But also, part of the point is to test rogues in open world setting. Like, rogues, honestly, if you really want to level a rogue and you want the easiest time possible, it may actually just be spamming dungeons. Because in a dungeon, a lot of rogues' weaknesses are kind of, as I said before, really not noticeable when you have a tank and a healer to support you. May arguably be faster than trying to, like, do solo questing. May actually be the only class in the game where that's true. I am curious to test with sub, because I think sub, when played well, will actually be pretty good. But I can't say for sure until I've actually tested it. Um, oh no, YouTube's buffering. Did I run into... Oh no, it seems it's good now. You enjoy leveling on retail and classic. Doesn't matter what it is, leveling is just a vibe. Uh, for me, it depends. I've also done it so much that... I don't know. I think um, leveling is definitely like a fun chill thing to do when there's a reason to do it. At this point, I have literally no reason to level for myself on retail anymore. I have every class that I could ever want and more. It's why I do a lot of these runs in the PTR. It's like, what the fuck do I need another character for? Um, but uh, I, I used to feel that way, I guess back when I actually needed different characters. Nowadays, I mean, there's a purpose for the runs, though, so I guess that helps. Okay, let's try this. This is actually going to be unironically harder to do than Yetimus, so we shall see. Both of these are... I'm going to do Cloak of Shadows first, I think. Oh, and I can build up Dagger in the Dark up to 12%. That's actually kind of huge tech. Probably used my second evasion a little bit too early, but it's fine. And now I need to start kiting. Oh, that still hits! Oh my god! <laughs> well, I got cheat death! Uh... Yeah, actually, the Ross Breath hitting me through the wall almost fucked me up. I was not expecting that. Because what I was... My plan there... I don't know if it was completely clear. I was going to line of sight the Frost Breath, Shadow Step, and with the speed boost, quickly reapply my dots and then run to the back. But because I got hit by the Frost Breath and I was slowed, I could not outrun it, so I ended up eating those melees to the face. And that nearly cost me my life, but it was kind of fine. Uh, let's see, I am also going to have to do a bit more stuff in WAD, it seems. I hate having to do extra shit in WAD, but uh, it is what it is. When you do no dungeons, you have no Darkmoon Fair, etc., etc., that's what the final part of the route is for. Um, let me scroll up so I don't have to keep scrolling. I'm going to catch up to at least where I was before. That way I can scroll down the chat and not have to continually reread it. I also, I don't even know where I have room on my bars. I guess I just put this in six and it doesn't even matter. Uh, okay, let's pause a moment to just 
Um, I'll even, I'll pause the timer because I'm just going to read chat for like at least five minutes. And this time I technically have no reason to wait. I have all my cooldowns and stuff. So I will just pause the timer because there's no advantage. Um, you think you should have to do the quests for the zone that leads into each dungeon at least once before you can do the dungeon? Eh, I, I disagree. I mean, I, I think that is, that just adds nothing. Uh, oh, I guess I, I misread that. At least once per account? Uh, maybe. If it was account-wide, I could see that, actually. I think the problem is that would be really annoying to do for all of the older expansions. Like, imagine in order to do, like, TBC Chromie Time Dungeons, you needed to get TBC Lore Master. That would be very bad. So, I could maybe see that being a thing for the new expansion, just so on your first playthrough you can't just immediately spam dungeons. I actually think that might be a good idea. But I think you should automatically unlock them for all old expansions. Um... Let's see. You play both Assassin and Affliction Lock. You love that from the Seed Bomb. I'm not sure what that means. You said Og shouldn't be in the game when it was initially uh, teased. You have an Og that's almost full bis. You got to like 3.1k or 3.2. I mean, that's still pretty good, yeah. Uh, how would you feel if instead of removing support specs, they added a spot for it? Uh, nope. Nope. It is fundamentally unhealthy for the game. Yeah. Um, exactly what Naomi said. It would mean you have to tune all content to have support specs. That would be even worse. <laughs> that would be, yeah, just even worse than the current situation. Let's see. Remember when people were crying about power infusion? Here's a class that is power infusion. Yeah, exactly. I That is kind of what I'm talking about, where I always say that Blizzard thinks they know better than the entire community sometimes. And it's shit like that. It's like the, the power infusion and the Og Evoker stuff, where everybody hates it and they keep it in. Og Evoker, I know some people are attached to it now, but fundamentally it should not have existed. The problem, the thing about Og Evoker and why it annoys me whenever I talk about how, generally speaking though, like here, whenever I talked about how Og Evoker is cancer for the game, most people agreed with me. Um, but every once in a while, when I talk about how Og Evoker is a cancer on this game, I get people who are like, but I like Og Evoker. You're mean for saying that my spec should be deleted. And the thing about that is I would say 99% of those people if Og Evoker was just a fun DPS spec that had cool earth abilities and just was fun to play and you like kept up this buff, like if it was all about ebb and might uptime, except it only affected you and your entire rotation was about like maintaining this buff that gave you like powerful benefits, it would still play basically the same. You'd have to tune it, of course, to make that work. And the people who enjoyed it would in many cases still enjoy it, but it would be infinitely healthier for the game. The whole, it affects multiple people is the problem. And that's why it annoys me when people try to defend Og of, oh, but I find it fun. And it's like, I'm glad you find it fun. It has nothing to do with whether or not it is fun to play or not. It is how it impacts the rest of the game that is a problem based on its core design. Uh, people like the bard aspect of it. Yeah, Final Fantasy XIV is the classic example people make. That game is fundamentally designed for it, and it does not work. Especially, it doesn't work when you only have one. The thing about Final Fantasy XIV is a, a lot of people compare it to Bard. But the thing about Bard is, like, Bard doesn't even always run. Because every single Final Fantasy class, with some exceptions, like Samurai. Like, Samurai is pure DPS. Black Mage is pure DPS. Summoner is, for the most part, pure DPS. You have pure DPS. But they are actually the exception, not the rule. Most specs in Final Fantasy as damage dealers have some utility that they sacrifice damage for. And that is how the game is fundamentally designed. You have combat reses for Red Mage. You have Dragoons. I don't know exactly what it is, but they used to have like a slicing debuff. Um, ninjas have a million different utility things that they provide. Uh, there's a lot of different little utility things. Bards obviously have... Uh, buffs like that. But ironically, bards actually 
at least for a while, I don't know if this is still the case, were actually not really that viable because uh, technically speaking, Machinist was the worst because Machinist was only a marginal damage increase over Bard in terms of personal DPS gain, but it was also a pure DPS like Samurai and Black Mage, but it wasn't even close. So everybody brought either Bard or Dancer, but Dancer for a while there was actually just strictly better than Bard. Uh, Dancer was kind of like a single player Og Evoker, right? And when every single spec in your game is designed like that, and it's fundamentally accepted that, okay, most of our raid is going to be built around bringing all these different debuffs, then, yeah, that's fine. But when you have, like, one random spec where it's like, this spec buffs everybody, and I guess two if you count priests with power infusion, but it, to a much lesser degree, obviously, it just does not work. So... It's one of those things where Blizzard clearly doesn't understand why Final Fantasy is able to get away with that because it's built into their design, right? And that's why they added Og Evoker because they think that that's what people want because they see people saying, I like Final Fantasy's design and they don't know how to implement it properly. And the only way is if you fundamentally rework the way that World of Warcraft works to account for that or you just take it out. But and it like the thing is Blizzard is like, there are companies stupid enough to fundamentally rework a winning formula just because some other game is also being relatively successful with a different formula. And that's what Blizzard's doing. A lot of people, myself included, countless players over the years, love the way that World of Warcraft's endgame dynamic works. And Blizzard's like, okay, we're going to completely change that because fuck you, right? Why? Why? It, it's so, it's so fucking dumb. It is so fucking dumb. I'm not, I'm going to stop ranting about this. It's, it, it, it's yeah um let me skim there there's some uh let's see why don't you do questing it uh this is not an xp buff it's only a reputation buff it's not an xp buff uh i don't know if remy drew glot i don't know if you're still reading or still watching this but yeah this is not a 50% Wrath of the Lich King SP buff. It is purely for reputation. That is why I am not doing Wrath of the Lich King stuff. Uh, okay, let me skim. Uh, Penta Saltare said, where can I see that? Like, what's the YouTube or Twitch? I forget what that was in reference to. Sorry. If you ask again what you were asking about, then um, let me know. Do we know what item level early Mythic Plus will start at yet? Uh, early Mythic Plus, no. 450 is the item level at which... So, 450 in Amir Drasil is equivalent to 408 item level in Avaris. And they've been pretty consistent about the upgrade paths. So, you can kind of use that to extrapolate the rest of the item levels. That is the only one that I've really looked into... Uh, as far as, like, early game catch-up gear is. I know what the raid item levels are, obviously. But as far as catch-up gear goes, the only number I know for sure is that 408 in Avarice equals 450 in Amir Drasil. So, you know, extrapolate from that what you will. Um, lots of discussion around item levels and stuff. The Saltari said, I love this kill drama. I'm glad to hear it. Um, do I use a talent guide or something else for talent placements? Uh, I do a lot of research before starting the run. I, I don't use a singular talent guide. I do research into multiple different websites. I read guides. I look at logs. I then obviously look at the talents myself and say, okay, this is what people in like high logs are running. This is what the guide recommends. Let me see what actually makes sense from a practical standpoint for this run. And then a lot of times, case in point, Orbital Strike, I will kind of change the talent decisions, even go against what the guide suggests if I think that, you know, it's recommending something not ideal for leveling. I also didn't even realize Jaken was the one who asked about uh, the coffee question. That was cool. Um... Dra uh, yeah, Dragonflight was better than Shadowlands from a story perspective, but that is a low bar. Shadowlands was one of the worst stories ever written, so I mean, everything is better than Shadowlands. 
Um, what the fuck is up with Smolderon being here? He was kind of on our side before. Eh. Uh, I didn't play through the Shaman quest line, but I read a synopsis of it. I don't really think Smolderon was ever on our side. I think he was meant very clearly painted as the lesser of two evils. Either way, I don't think Smolderon is a very interesting character, nor do I think he's used well here, so whatever. Um, currently playing your first Druid in years, about to hit 10. What's the best spec currently? Guardian is the best spec for leveling. As for the best spec overall, they all play different roles, so can't really say for sure. Uh, with mention of Firelands, oh yeah, I already read that. You can get some real ass-tasting coffee. Oh, yeah, there's definitely bad coffee, for sure. But it's, um, you know, I, I generally like most coffee that I try. Someone said retail boo. <laughs> Why are you watching someone? Like, I predominantly cover retail World of Warcraft. It's just baffling to click on the video of somebody who predominantly covers retail WoW. The thumbnail and title show it's retail WoW. Like, there's a Volpera in the thumbnail. There's no Volpera in Wrath Classic. Then you click on it and say, Retail Boo. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> oh, man. Um, Let's see. Let me... Uh, yes, so my favorite color is pointed out that, yeah, there was a... There was a, a big chunk of time there where, in, in WAD, LFR dropped completely garbage gear. I think that was a bit too much of a swing in the opposite direction, but I think it at least made it so retail or mythic raiders weren't encouraged to run LFR nearly as much. Uh, Rhea said, tier sets do appeal to casual players. Yeah, so to be clear, I never said that casual players should not be able to get tier sets. My entire point was that casual players can already get tier sets with the new catch-up mechanics that Blizzard is introducing. So... I fully understand that casual players like tier sets. I completely get that. My entire point was that either find some way to... Uh, the There's definitely some complicated solution that I haven't thought of to um, make it so casual players can still get interesting loot that Mythic Raiders wouldn't care about. I don't know what it is. Um, it, like I said, it, it, it could technically exist, but I ha can't think of it off the top of my head right now. But the one obvious thing is that you still get access to all of that as a casual player. You still get your tier set with the Catalyst. And I think that's great, right? So I'm more talking about ways where, you know, generally speaking, retail or Mythic Raiders, I keep saying retail because just saw the whole classic complaints. Also, now that I have Poison Bomb, this should actually feel pretty good. Fuck, I forgot to restart the timer. Whatever. There we go. Um, I'm, I'm going again now that I've, like, kind of caught up in chat, by the way. Um, you get the need to do LFR. Most guilds will try to do it together after normal heroic and get people who are close to tier two piece the last piece they need. Yeah, exactly. It's one of those things where like acting, acting as if you know there's no reason to do LFR is just silly. But I, I've already kind of beaten that topic to death, right? Um. Also, how do I activate Poison Bomb exactly? What's a 4% chance per combo point? Interesting. <laughs> um, interesting question, I guess. Uh, I think this is maybe a little bit personal, so I'm not going to go into like a ton of detail, but I guess... Uh, do I have kids no i definitely don't have kids i am 25 uh so i mean i guess there are probably some people who have a, i'm not saying probably there are definitely people who have kids at 25 but i think it's way too early to have kids so i definitely don't have kids no um do i want kids that's maybe a bit more of a controversial topic that i like i said i'm not gonna go into super detail on all i will say is no Nothing wrong with wanting to have kids. It is something that I have no plans for at all and actively do not want. So if you want kids, more power to you. Um, I personally never plan to have kids. But that, it's one of those things where, of course, I, I don't want to talk about it just because 
if I ever bring it up, it's it's the type of thing where you get people who are like, ah, I just waited till you're older, you'll change your mind, and nope, I do not think I will. But it's kind of impossible to have that argument without those people uh, coming out of the woodwork, and I hate fucking dealing with that. So, yeah, that's all I'll say on the subject. Um... Let's see. Do I need still uh, one more shredder and this should hopefully be enough lumber? Yeah, so then I just need this one shredder left. And how does the anima charge thing work? Rogue's fifth combo point is anima charged. Oh, I see. So it increases in terms of which combo point is the one that is charged and then eventually it expires after it reaches the maximum one huh that's kind of neat i had no idea how the anima charging thing worked um there's intalon that increases garrote damage when used from stealth um yeah improved garrote yeah, I've been using that for, like, single-target mobs. I'm not going to stealth up after every single pull, but for, like, all of the elites, I opened with Garrote from stealth. The only reason I didn't do that for Yetimus is, like, obviously, you know, wanted to kite him into the cave. But you could argue that maybe I should have shadow-stepped and opened with Garrote or something like that. Um... Let's see. I'm just kind of skimming like a, a few messages, so if I miss your message, just like type it again, and I apologize, but I'm trying to stay like mostly caught up so I don't like fall too far behind again. And anything that is more like general discussion that doesn't involve like a specific question I have to answer or a topic that I find interesting to discuss, I'm just uh, trying to skim over. But maybe I, I missed something, so. Yo, 54. Uh, your main issue is the idea they keep focusing hard on the idea of unreliable narrators, something Warcraft hasn't actually used for most of its run. Yeah. That's actually an interesting thing. Um, I, I know exactly what you're referring to, Rhea. It's... So, the thing about unreliable narrators, and it, I completely agree, fundamentally, the way they're doing it is terrible. Uh, I think unreliable narrators as a concept is usually bad, unless it is used, like, very, very well. But the problem is, a lot of times when people use unreliable narrators, it is specifically for the reason that WoW is using it right now. Which is obviously to cover their asses in case they need to write themselves out of a corner. The thing that I find especially just baffling about their use of unreliable narrators is the fact that they retconned their own bullshit within one expansion and they got away with it by saying well unreliable narrator and that one was even worse because they hadn't established it as a concept at that point in time like having the official source quote unquote for wow lore suddenly be like oh what the heck hell is going on what the fuck was that <laughs> um but yeah I, I know exactly what you're talking about like warcraft chronicles right like that is the classic one of just what the fuck do you mean unreliable narrative like that was stupid and the fact that they did it retroactively too like it was never established that the writer of the warcraft chronicles was an in-universe unreliable narrator Within one expansion of making it, they're like, yeah, actually, we decided we want to take the story in a different direction, so we're just going to make up some bullshit about it being an unreliable narrator. That was like, I, there are a lot of really stupid story decisions that they've made. That was up there in terms of their most stupid decisions. But it, it's kind of par for the course, right? Like, uh, I could, I agree with you. 
it's absolutely stupid that they're doing that shit, but it's all for the same reason. They just can't stop themselves from retconning shit. Instead of actually trying to write a story that makes sense, they are entirely doing whatever the fuck they think would maybe seem cool in a story. They're just going to shove it in there, consistency, continuity be damned, and they are going to try and solve whatever problems it creates retroactively, which is like literally the worst way you can write a story. Everything else is a symptom of that problem. Them using unreliable narrators, them blatantly retconning shit. It is just because of the fact that they have put no thought into continuity or consistency. Uh, I think the unreliable narrator one is a bit of a more amusing way in which they've done that. I will agree. But it is it is not like an actual storytelling decision. Like, if it was one of those things where they genuinely believed that, oh yeah, this will be an interesting story thing uh, to make there be unreliable narrators, uh, and they just kind of failed in that, misjudged what the community actually wanted, I can maybe like say... Yeah, no, they just, they went in a poor direction with that, but we all know why they're doing it. It's not because anyone at their team actually genuinely believed, oh yeah, this will add intrigue or mystery to the story. It was literally just a, we gotta cover our asses in case what we write is garbage and we need to change it. And I think that is just the laziest fucking thing you can do. So, it's unfortunate, but that's the level of writing that we're dealing with. It, it is really depressing. I hope, honestly, that Chris Metzen can turn something around in terms of the writing, because, well, Chris Metzen, I, I'm not going to say he was the greatest writer of all time. A lot of people are, are, like, I think, overreacting a little bit in terms of what they think Chris Metzen can realistically accomplish. But one thing that I will give Metzen a lot of credit for is he cared a lot about the exact problem that I'm talking about of consistency and making sure the world was believable. There's a, a really good post that I saw somebody linking fairly recently where in the wake of the Eridar stuff, where the Draenei uh, were like kind of recontextualized to be now like actual like Eridar escapees, which at the time was completely different than what the Draenei were supposed to be. Uh, Metzen wrote like a really good forum post about... I uh, even admitted, by the way, that he fucked up, which is something the current writers have not done. He literally says, as for why this conflicts with existing lore, I messed up. Whoops, my bad. Literally says that. Like, that is something the current writers desperately need to figure out how to do. But he says, I think that for XYZ reasons, this will make the story more interesting. I think it still aligns with, generally speaking, the direction we want World of Warcraft story to go, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I mean, I don't, I wasn't really following the whole lore discussion back then. Uh, I was six years old at the time. But yeah, it made sense to me, all of his reasons. If I had read that at the time, I probably would have been like, yeah, that checks out. But the thing about that, I think the most important takeaway from that post from Metzen is that anyone reading that at least knows that he gives a shit because he very clearly addresses all of the concerns that the community had and is like, I hear you. I know that you have these problems with the story that I've written. Here is why I've written it this way, and here are the, you know, the plans that I have, so you guys know why I'm doing these things and what my plans for the future are. And regardless on whether or not you hated the way that Metzen was handling the Draenei or not, I don't think anybody could have walked away from reading that forum post going, God, these writers have no fucking idea what they're doing. You could maybe say, I don't like the way that Metzen is, you know, kind of... And one, one thing that admittedly... I didn't even love reading that post, and I think it is maybe a little bit symptomatic of the way that WoW has gotten um, to this point in general, is he kind of says something to the effect of like, I don't know how we're going to get there just yet, but I'm sure it's going to be cool. And I think, while I, I think it's at least good that Metzen was very honest about the fact that he had no idea what he was going to do with like the old gods, he even says a little bit funny at one point that like, um... Oh, uh, yeah, it was how Sargeras got corrupted. He literally admits he has no idea how Sargeras got corrupted. He just decided to write, yep, there's a corrupted titan who's destroying worlds, and I have no idea why. I just think it sounds cool. And he says, uh, you know, who dares me to make it that the old gods corrupted Sargeras or something like that as a joke. And 
that's the kind of thing where at least I appreciate the honesty of like, you know, as a storytelling, you know, as a writer, like in my story, I am not actually planning ahead. And I'm going by the seat of my pants on whatever I think looks cool. That level of honesty is welcome. But admittedly, I hate when stories are written that way. And uh, I never read that post before recently. But when I read that, I'm like, actually, so many things in WoW's writing make a lot of sense now. Because... I think when you write a story without any clear idea for like the world that you're building and you kind of approach it with a mentality of, you know, we'll figure it out when we get there, you're just asking to run into issues like they've been running into recently. And like I said, credit to Metzen, he at least clearly tried to spend a lot of time looking for potential plot holes, spotting that ahead of time and fixing it where possible. But I think the problem is when you clearly have no idea where you want your story to go and you're just flying by the seat of your pants, you're writing things before you have any idea of why it happens. While you can still try to do a really good job at, you know, keeping continuity, eventually it's just going to spiral out of control. And eventually you're going to have to write yourself into a corner like they've done numerous times and then come up with a lame ass explanation as to why it's not actually a massive plot hole. And admittedly, their explanations to wave away plot holes was a lot better in older expansions of WoW than it has been lately. Lately, they just gave up even giving a shit. They're just like, yeah, the story is whatever we say it is now. Um, before it was, they at least cried a little bit. But it's still not ideal. Uh, so, I don't know. It, it's... I don't think Metzen can seriously fix anything with WoW, but... I mean, hey... He can try. If he manages to accomplish anything, that would be cool. Anyways. Um, they're not good at setting them up retroactively. Oh yeah, I mean, that that's the thing. They don't set it up. It, it's not that they're not good at it. It's just they don't even try to set the stuff up. Uh, the recent interview painted the team in a really bad light if that's their philosophy. Yeah. It's, I don't know. I think they're just very amateurish writers who don't really understand what they're doing. And it's a little bit telling, you know, people will joke about the whole Steve Denuser thinks that um, the ending to Game of Thrones was good. Like, that is obviously something that a lot of people have joked about as, like, a way to show that WoW's story is poorly written. But there is some truth to it. When you look at the ending of Game of Thrones and you say, yep, that's good storytelling, and you're, like, the lead writer for a game, oh boy. There's some problems, like, especially because I don't even think the guys who wrote the ending to Game of Thrones thought it was a good ending to Game of Thrones. Like, there are countless memes about how little the writers for Game of Thrones actually gave a shit about it. Like, there's the whole, Danny kind of forgot about the Iron Fleet and you're on Greyjoy's forces. Whoops! Oh no, I completely forgot that that was a thing. And, like, that was the line that that guy said in the fucking interview that people have memed to hell and back. And it's clear they do not give a shit, right? I forget their names, the, the people who wrote Game of Thrones. They do not care at all. They're just like, fuck this franchise, get us out so we can do something else. And the fact that even they, the people who wrote it, don't give a shit, and Steve Denuser is out here like, I actually thought it was a very good ending. Like, fuck off. No fucking way. Uh, so, uh, people joke about it, but it actually does say a lot about, generally speaking, his priorities as a writer. Uh, let me grab archaeology. I actually, I genuinely can't even remember the last time I've done Archie, or uh, done Spires of Rock in a speedrun. I'd actually be curious if somebody was able to go dig up the last speedrun I did that included Spires of Iraq, what date it was. Because it's gotta have been, like, a very long time ago, right? At least, um... I can't, I'm trying to even think of potentially... I can't even... I don't remember the last time. I mean, and I mean actually doing Spires of Iraq. I've come in here and turned in, like, one or two quests and grabbed treasures, but... I don't think I've gotten this far in the Spires of Rock quest line in like almost a year. Pretty much ever since I started doing um, dungeon leveling, and even then, even before dungeons were really heavily routed in, at least early on with TBC, 
It's been such a long time since I've actually quested here. So I'd definitely be curious if somebody was able to find the last day. Okay, I need to go underneath the bridge. And boom. Uh... We back on this fuck Agavoker. <laughs> yeah. A lot of these discussions kind of go in cycles as I read the older messages. And then it's like, oh, we're talking about this thing again. Oh, where can they see Ghost Gaming implode? Uh, ah, yeah, we were kind of... That's what we were talking about. Yeah, well, generally, Blazon streams most of the time, but... I don't know. I don't even... I, I'm not even sure if he is streaming today. Because I think they gave up on killing Sark this week. But who knows. I'll have to catch up on all the juicy drama later on. Um, speaking of which, let me double check something real quick. Uh, well, apparently he is actually going for Sark. Fairly recently, too. So I guess we'll see how that turns out for him. Uh, Blizzard put official patch notes out a few hours ago? Yeah, I think it was right after I started my stream, so I haven't gotten a chance to read them. I'm curious to see if they have any, like, new information in there. So, if there is stuff in there, let me know, Naomi. And that would be, uh, something interesting. Or if there is anything interesting to discuss, then I'd be good to know. Uh... And I'm gonna charge this combo point... Just gonna drink a healing potion here. The abyssal healing potions are actually pretty solid. They scale pretty well too compared to a lot of the other um, consumables. All right, one illusion charm. I'll grab this one real quick before I get in combat, and. As soon as the second mob jumps on me. Oh, apparently the other thing I did didn't spawn a mob. Uh, just vanish here then. Do poison dagger. And they're all grouped up. Crimson Tempest. And, unfortunately, no Poison Bomb proc there. I kind of wish Poison Bomb was guaranteed. Even if the damage was lower, that would feel a lot better. Um, a lot of people who enjoy Aug Evoker are honestly people that get by doing harder content than they should because an Aug can be absolutely talk shit and still be useful. I, I don't necessarily disagree with that, but... I have a feeling that uh, committing to that statement would probably piss a lot of people off who play Agavoker. It's like the classic Agavokers would be very offended if they could read. Um, how about LFR specific tier sets that are maybe 80% as effective as normal tier sets? Yeah, I actually, I think that would probably be, like, a fairly good solution. I think there would still be complaints from LFR players about that. I don't know. And it may still, as long as it was, I don't know, maybe if there were items that were better than, like, a 424 piece, but not worth more than, like, a certain amount of item level. If there were special set bonuses specifically from LFR, um, that could be interesting. So... It would give you, like, let's say, just a stat bonus. So if you get your two-piece, you get, like, 10% agility or so. That's probably too much. But, like, 5% increased agility if you get your two-piece or four-piece or something like that. 
that is likely not enough to outweigh like a 20 item level difference, but it's uh, at least a nice bonus to the point where LFR players would feel good about getting like that tier set, but Mythic Raiders would not really care about it. That is actually, yeah, I think something that could be a potentially good idea. Hard to say for sure. And it, I still think, obviously, everybody long term would be able to get the main full tier set bonus by doing Creation Catalyst stuff. But that would actually solve the problem. Whether or not it would be a good solution to the problem, that's debatable, but I think that would be a workable solution, for sure. Uh, don't worry about not wanting kids. You don't want them either. Fur babies are better anyways. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Um, definitely, like, if, if I wanted to take care of something, right, I have my cats. Which, I know you said you were partially joking, Naomi, but yeah, it's uh, absolutely true. Anima charge equals if you spend exactly that amount of combo points, you do more damage. Interesting. I was not aware of that. I thought it was just as long as I have higher than that number. It's if I spend exactly that amount. Okay. I'll have to try and play around that then. There we go. Um, that's a little bit weird then. Huh. Uh, owner said, man, fuck YouTube. You can't watch anything with our, even with ad block disabled. Um, really? What is the problem that it's giving you, owner? I did hear that they were cracking down on like ad block stuff more heavily, but I don't know if that's causing like problems for other people who aren't even using it. That that is, Casey. That is a very weird question. Uh I'm not even going to answer that. Um. Yeah. Uh, definitely a very odd thing to ask. All right. Uh, I think next I want deeper stratagem. Won't really matter. Discriminant Carnage. I have to wait for the RP. Um, something that infuriates you is the idea that they actually take care and consideration when making these choices. Yeah. Completely agree. Them pretending that they give a shit is, I think, the most annoying part about the story. Because there's absolutely no way that any self-respecting writer would, like, write the crap that they've been writing. So I completely agree with that. Fuck. Here we go. Alright. I wonder what the best thing to do left in Spires would be. Avadra said, have a good stream, I'm off. Appreciate you stopping by. Uh... Earthfire Tavern. Mop Story was probably the tightest through-line writing you've had in expansion. Completely agree. Yeah, Mop Story was actually very good. Honestly, I don't even think the Kata writing was that bad. Like, some of the Deathwing stuff was a little bit goofy, but the individual zones were actually fairly well-written. Especially compared to, like, when a lot of the Kata revamp zones were really good. Um, uh, Hell, honestly, I think Wad had pretty good writing, for the most part. Wad actually had maybe some of the best quest lines in terms of, like, the actual story and, like, their considerations with that. Uh, hell, I I don't know. I, I think very clearly the point where I stopped caring about the story was BFA, though. Um, BFA... BFA was when I stopped really taking some of the story seriously. I was still interested in it because it used a lot of familiar characters that I cared about, but I was definitely a little bit more frustrated with the direction that it was going. But I was at least willing to be like, eh. Um, 
you know, it could be worse, right? But honestly, it wasn't until Shadowlands when I really stopped caring at all. And I think they at least tried. Like, I would genuinely believe that they tried to tell a good story all the way up until Shadowlands, they just stopped caring at all. BFA, I think they very clearly stopped giving a shit about actually writing like interesting character driven stories and were more caring about like the grand spectacle of things. You could argue they did that in Legion too. Legion definitely had its problems. Wad, I think, was a bit unfortunate that like the regular story was good. It Wad fell off hard towards the end. Like 100%. The Hellfire Citadel story was hot garbage, but that I attribute more to just obviously it kind of was floundering by that point as an expansion. It's a little bit tricky to judge that. How goes it? You passed out for a bit. Um, you're such a good and attentive bot. It's all good. I appreciate whenever you are able to help anyway. Uh, and it's going pretty well. I think all things considered. So far, this run, I actually think it, um... Oh my god. Uh, I'm just gonna vanish. I, I'm not even risking that. I guess I get to keep most of my damage. Because... Actually, oh wait. Yeah, applying AoE Rupture and Groat, I need to be starting in stealth from now on for this. I forgot that that was a talent I literally just picked up. Uh, narrowly avoided procking cheat death there. Technically, it could have proc cheat death and it wouldn't matter. But I should be starting every pull from stealth now that I have uh, indiscriminate carnage. At least, especially every AoE pull. Single target, it's like, whatever, but... Like, this, I should definitely start from stealth. Ooh! That almost hit me. And I'm gonna heal up a little bit. Legion was cool in isolation. Wad was cool in ice. Yeah, I think the premise... Honestly, the thing that's so impressive about Wad is Wad had, I think, one of the worst concepts for an expansion. And it actually was not terrible, considering it was kind of a very janky concept. And they actually managed to make it pretty good for what it was. Nice, Poison Bomb. Yeah, right now, that felt insane. Indiscriminate Carnage is a busted talent. I think at this point, Assassination really comes online, like, fully. If you had stuff like this for most of the leveling process, it would be a genuinely good spec. Let's see. Ah, oh, fuck. I barely missed my window for AoE Rupture. We got Poison Bomb there. I should still be using Crimson Tempest. That was just good. Like, that was really solid AoE damage. Survivability is still a bit of a concern, but uh, could be a hell of a lot worse. Could be your Hunter World Record speedrun that went on Wowhead. No, it hasn't been that long. I have done uh, the Hunter World Record speedrun. That was my first ever speedrun. I've done Spires of Rock a lot of times since then. Uh, definitely wasn't the Hunter speedrun. Um... It, it was within the last year. I did Spires of Rock at least, like, once. But I don't remember exactly when it was. Um... What order do I want to do this stuff in? Let's grab these treasures. Most likely before the dungeon changes? Yeah. I, I agree with you there, Chori. I just forget exactly which one it was. Which run specifically. Pandaren had precedent, and the whole main world building to integrate it was really well done. All the cool mythologies, the Thunder King setup as early in 5.0 plus Garrosh's plot. Yeah. 
That's true. A lot of the stuff in Pandaria was really, really well done. I don't know. I, I genuinely think Pandaria was just a fantastically written expansion overall. Definitely, if we're looking at like the oh, like individual in isolation, um, how all of the stories came together, I think you are absolutely correct, Rhea, that Mop was probably the best expansion in, from a writing standpoint. I mean, Mop was maybe the best expansion overall from an everything standpoint, but especially that. It did that really, really well. No poison bomb, but what just killed all that stuff? Is that just Fan of Knives and Crimson Tempest just doing boatloads of damage? Jesus Christ. That's pretty good. Of course, now I get Poison Bomb after it's all the mobs and I'm just fighting one target. Uh, I can go back and... Eh, I can turn that in when I turn in the Wanted quests. Owner is not having a good time dealing with YouTube's anti-ad block stuff. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm curious what uh, problems you're running into, Owner. Uh, okay, yeah, you're banned. Thankfully... <laughs> Uh, I scrolled down to the bottom of chat right after they said that, I think. So, yeah. I, I Thankfully, I caught that pretty early. Um, I, I don't know what's wrong with people. Why people are just fucking weird for the sake of being weird. It's like, congratulations, you got yourself banned in my chat. If that was, like, your ultimate goal, you accomplished it. But, like, why? Maybe they find it fun? Or something? But I, I just, I don't really... I guess the end goal is to probably try and get a rise out of somebody, but like that that isn't even funny. Like there are people who will like say funny stuff to try and piss me off. And at least it's like, yeah, yeah, that that's just fucking weird. Okay, I'll take alacrity again. I guess it doesn't really matter. I keep forgetting I need to be starting in stealth. Um. Oh. Blazon is streaming. He brought in Mercs to get the kill. Oh, man. Why did it have to be today when I'm streaming? I really want to watch that. I might have to watch the VOD. Oh, that actually sounds so fucking entertaining. Did he actually kill Sark? I guess I can see... Um... Let's see. <laughs> they have like 10 mercenaries in? <laughs> oh my god. It's ten fucking mercenaries. You leave for two seconds again, it, it's all good. Yeah, that was just uh, unfortunate timing. Yeah, I'll, I'll look into long-term solutions for that stuff. But it's, um... that Those ones are also harder to catch, because, like, the people spamming the N-word, if I set up, like, a chatbot to filter out things like that, well, that's easy enough to do, right? Um, but for weird people like that, who are, like, clearly trying to say, like, specifically targeted weird shit, like, I just, I also just don't get that one. Yeah, went from too personal to weird to straight up bannable. Yeah, the second, second question was, like, I, I didn't want to ban them, even though it was excessively weird, because it's, like, some people just ask really weird questions and don't understand boundaries. And it's like... Um... I didn't want to, like, say, hey, that's too weird, you're banned. Because, like, I usually like to give people at least a warning. If it's not, like, like that bad. Um, if it's just, like, kind of a really weird, edgy question. Because I get that there's some people, maybe, who like that kind of humor. And, obviously, I'm not one of them. I think it is just not normal 
and I'll be like, hey, I don't really like jokes like that, please don't make those here. But if it's just straight up, like, racist shit, it's like, no. No. Get that shit out of here. It's just like, why? Okay, let's do that and Venom. I think after this, I need to do a big pull with, um... Nice, Poison Bomb. Uh, after this, I'll need to do a big pull with, uh, Stealth. To make sure that I get the most value out of my, uh, indiscriminate carnage. Uh, let me just eat up real fast. Uh... There's nothing you saw in the patch notes that was new, but there's maybe something in there about one class in spec that you didn't notice. Uh, owner was saying, just checking, wanted to say hi before you go to bed. Awesome. I mean, I appreciate you stopping by regardless. Um, owner said, you had to remove most of your extensions, some Java JavaScript extensions, agent changers. Interesting. Um... What's the price for the token in Dragonflight? Uh, there's a lot of websites. If you just Google WoW token price, there's like a million um, like websites that will show you. A really easy way to find that out. Okay. Nice. Uh, this is 100% a health pot angle. Without a health pot, I probably was dead there. Actually, I maybe could have rock cheat death, but still would have been a little bit spooky. Um, how many more shattered hand orcs do I need? Handful. This is a little bit problematic. Maybe with Crimson Vial healing, I should be fine, but... There we go. Uh, I just used Echoing Reprimand. So I kind of don't want to stop and eat, but... Actually, you know what? I'm gonna... God damn it. Uh, that was probably a bit of an aggressive pull. I shouldn't have done that. I also, I forget that the stupid Ravagers have a ranged attack, which is just the dumbest shit ever. They can spit thorns at you from a distance, like, okay. Great. Um, yeah, I, that's kind of the problem with Rogue, though. I, I don't really think anything in the rework meaningfully changes that. Like, Rogue is pretty much the only class in the game that doesn't live that pull, quite honestly. Which is the main reason, I think... Do I still give them C-tier overall? I think Assassination and Outlaw at the moment, I think, still get C-tier. I don't really think anything has changed to bring them out of that. Because there is just... Like, Outlaw probably dies there, too. Um, you can maybe play safer, but then you, you're, like, infinitely slower. Whereas every other spec has easy ways to deal with that. Sub, I think, has maybe more sustain, which is what we'll see. Maybe puts it a little bit ahead. But... Based on everything I've seen, I'm pretty sure that um, Outlaw and Assassination are maybe two of the worst leveling specs in the game, even with the rework. So, unfortunately, I think they probably still go in C tier, just because shit like that is even possible for them. Okay, let's go turn in these two quests, and then I'm going to go turn in that stuff.
And I don't know where I'm gonna get my last like level or two. This curse has not broken me yet. The Ganar storyline and his sacrifice during the Horde story was so good. Oh yeah, absolutely. Let's go turn this in. We also have the Icky quest. So I think gets me to 59. And I want to go for the final bit of experience. Uh, Talon Watch is probably my best bet. Uh, you know what? I think actually the best thing for me to do is to do the elite quests. How much experience do I need? 92,000. These give 13,000. So elite quests, treasures, and the bonus objective for the Saberon is probably what I'll be doing. Uh, hey, Negan. Good to see you. Uh, BFA had a ton of major characters that were out of character and in general was just ass story-wise. Um, oh, I always forget I have to stop with the fucking broom. You hate it more than Shadowlands because of its impact story-wise? I, I don't like BFA, I agree with that, but I think Shadowlands was still worse. I understand why you dislike BFA more than Shadowlands, and I think that is a perfectly valid reason, and I understand it. I hated BFA for the same reason, but I think the damage that Shadowlands did to the world building as a whole was worse than the damage BFA did to a lot of individual lore characters. And I think it has, like, the thing about the BFA stuff is, while it sucked, you could have kind of ignored a lot of that stuff, and even... Like, let's say you ignored a lot of the quote-unquote character development that happened for those characters in BFA, and you just made them act like they would have normally in the past, nobody would have really cared, right? Because, sure, you could argue that they are acting out of character compared to how they were characterized in BFA, but nobody would really give a shit. It would still result in a better story, and you could still argue that they are in character compared to how they were for the vast majority of the time, and BFA was just a little blip. And obviously people change, so it's not even like that would be a plot hole. You'd just be like, yeah, the people change, blah, 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 whatever. Um, and it wouldn't matter. The problem is, while that stuff could be written away by a good writer, as I've said before, there is absolutely no right, way to unwrite Shadowlands. It is permanently scarred into World of Warcraft's world building, and there's no way to fix that. So I think it did way more damage overall. Um, was it the lock run where you were in Spires? What, did I go to Spires for the lock speed run? Possibly. Um. He was testing the waters, trying to find the band spot. I mean, like, <laughs> like, it, I, I, th yeah. I guess congratulations, if that, if that was the case. Congratulations, you found the band spot. But that one was, like, so far over the line, like, I guess they just gave up. Like, if you're trying to find exactly where the line is in my chat, there's, like, a, I, I'm pretty generous. Like I said, I'm pretty lenient. But, like, blatant racism is so far over the line that I think, it, hopefully, in literally anybody in the world's, like, Twitch chat, unless they're, you know, actual scumbags, it should be kind of obviously over the line. Um, but hey, I guess if that was what they were looking for, they found it. So, congratulations. Yeah, I will say, anima charging the third combo point feels weird, because I feel like I should be saving up more of them. But it's a neat idea of anima charging, like, the later ones. Chronically online, people tend to be like that. They forget how to speak humanese. Yeah, fair. No, you're not wrong. Uh, I think it's right that has the treasure. Yeah, it's this one with the treasure. Oh no, I'm lagging. Oh god, no. 
Please. I don't want to run into fucking DC connection issues. There's no deadly or- oh, I fuck, my poisons fell off. Uh, can refresh my augment room. And then we can do the Sabron bonus objective. Is... I have to go further down. Uh, yeah, Undermine Exchange is a good site. You really want to see an optimal demon only, or as many demons as possible for the Lightforge racial passive of 20% XP when killing demons. Um, yeah, I, I'm not even sure where you would go to, like, optimize that. It's an interesting thought. Crimson Tempest, and then I'll do an Invenom at three combo points for that. Deathmark. Rupture up. Garrote again. I think one of the other minor issues with um, the general playstyle of Rogues while leveling is pretty much every single rogue spec is incentivized to banish or like shadow dance to get like benefits from coming out of stealth and the problem is vanish can literally not be used as a damage button while leveling just fundamentally because obviously it would take you out of combat so it is kind of a weird thing where when so much of their design is built around that and like that's part of their like damage cd stuff it really hurts when you're just unable to benefit from it at all. Oh, fuck, fuck, fuck. AoE rupture. Oh my god, I can't hit anything. The mobs are just constantly... That was miserable. Uh, at least I got it off in time. Uh... Oh, lots of poison bombs back to back. Oof. Okay. Rules here pretty much don't be a dick and don't be weird. You're not soft by any means, but it's straightforward to not say that kind of stuff. Yeah, it wasn't even troll stuff. Uh, the second message doesn't even show for you, yeah. Uh, it's 5.30 a.m. for you, owner. Damn. Um, good luck with the rest. Hopefully you'll catch the next streams. Awesome. I mean, it was good to have you here. Uh, I will say uh, the, the stream is not over. So even after this run, uh, in case you didn't see the schedule, I am going to... It won't be super long, because we'll be continuing it uh, tomorrow. But I am going to be playing Warcraft Rumble for at least like an hour or so at the end of the stream. We'll basically get set up, get through the tutorial, and then once we are like out of the main tutorial area, I'll stop for today, and then the rest will be tomorrow. But uh, yeah, we'll, we're doing the start of the fresh account Warcraft Rumble playthrough after this run. And like I said, probably it'll only be an hour. Not super long. Uh, okay, there's two more mobs that I need to kill for this. Let's do... And we here. Another in Venom. And I might need to eat really quick before pulling the next mob. I don't know if I'll need the health. You decided to go to bed and watch from bed, so you're comfy and waiting for Warcraft Immortal to start. That's a good way to put it, yeah. Just won a tier 3 druid shoulder from the BMH for... 10,500 gold. Oh, that's cheap as hell, nice. Uh, Negan said, My grandfather is saying that murlocs are ugly and your grandmother has been screaming at him all day because she is a murloc. <laughs> Interesting. 
That is a plot twist to the story. I did not expect your grandmother to have been a murloc this whole time. There we go. There's my poison bomb. Ooh, and another one? Nice. Uh, what am I missing? Free one captured mob. And then it's done. Alright. And then I go turn in the quests. The wanted quests and stuff. And that is enough XP. There's a few things you can cast in stealth. Oh, I actually didn't know that. That's interesting. Uh, makes sense. It's much cheaper now since you can craft T3 with a bit of investment, but 10k is definitely, yeah. That's very, very, very cheap. And hey, beats, uh, spending however much of the gold it is. And honestly, Druid, especially. I think, personally, maybe this is a hot take, I think Druid has the best, um, T3 set. By far. Alright, so, 5 hours, 19 minutes... I actually think this is a good time, because you have to keep in mind, this is 5 hours 19 minutes without dungeons. So, when we completely take dungeons out of the equation, and I have to do, like, extensive time in Spires of Iraq, honestly, not a bad run. And I didn't have, like, any special XP modifiers. This was pretty solid. So... That is uh, pretty good. Obviously, I still think... I've talked about this extensively, so I won't go into a ton of detail. But I think um, it has a bit of an issue, right, with survivability. And the AoE is definitely better. But this was... I think overall, this was definitely stronger than Outlaw. But I, I don't know by how much. Whether this puts it into B tier or not is a tough call. Uh, okay, so... It, since it is pretty late overall, I'm going to quickly move into the Warcraft Rumble stuff. So, let me um, close the game. Uh, let's see. Need to figure out i so the other annoying thing about warcraft rumble which i mean it's just stupid design and blizzard's end it's impossible to play it on the pc so i had to go figure out like get the software that lets me uh stream my phone onto my computer is this working? Hello? Yeah, uh, good point, Naomi. I was about to do that. Um, okay. Ugh. Man, it's just my fucking luck. Literally, before the stream and the other day, I tested this shit to make sure it was working, and now it is giving me problems. Um... Come on, fucking work, please. Why are you not working? God damn it. Um, hold on. Maybe there's something I need to edit in Task Manager. Uh, thanks for coming to the stream, James. So bear with me a moment as I figure out why this stupid program is not working the way it's supposed to. I'm literally clicking it to run it, and nothing is happening. Do I have to manually enable some... Allow access to your data. Yes. Allow... Yep. There we go. Got it to work. Okay. Uh, I don't know what BlueStacks is. I am using something called Screen Copy. To get this to work, so nope, that's not what I want. 
What the fuck? Why is this not working? Ha! Okay. Is it... All right, I don't... This... Can everybody see it at least? Obviously, it's not perfect, but... <laughs> Looks like it is at least displaying. I also... Settings, it's kind of loud. Is there... There's no way to change the volume on this stuff. Classic Blizzard UI design. Help and support, but no volume settings. So, whatever. It's going to be a little bit loud. Let me actually just... I'll at least turn it way down on the like actual output thing. Yeah, the volume is either a yes or a no. Blizzard failing to design proper UIs. Amazing. Uh, okay, you guys can see it just fine. Yeah, so... I'll talk a little bit about the game as we progress through it. But obviously I have a lot to say about Warcraft Rumble. Uh, so we're going to start the timer. This is from how long since I started playing the game, and we'll hit start. So this is the basic tutorial mission. Uh, it's so hard to even... I can't even hear myself think over the fucking volume. So bear with me a second. I hope it's not too loud. At least for now. I know that there's a volume setting later on. It's just annoying that you can't access it just yet. First Warcraft Rumble speedrun, yeah. Oh wait, this can't even kill ranged units? Oh, well that makes this easy. Alright. Uh, can you just turn down your phone? Oh, would my phone's volume have an impact? Oh, fuck. Um... Didn't mean to close my phone. Let me reopen it. Hit the wrong button. I hit the lock button instead of the volume button. I didn't even think of that, but you might be right, Naomi. Um. Okay, so a few things to just quickly address. Yeah, okay, that actually completely fixed it. In fact, I'll even turn it a little bit up now. There we go. Uh, basically, there is a semi-rock-paper-scissors format, which it makes sense. You can see there, they kind of explain it like melee beats like uh, ranged, and then range beats flying, etc. It's a little bit more complicated than that. I actually do feel the basic design of the game is actually quite good. And this is kind of why I said one of my biggest problems or frustrations with this game is it has a lot of potential that is completely squandered by a desire to just get as much money as possible. Uh, I think it could have ended up being a good game had they not decided to go like full Omega Greed mode. Yeah, see the thing Naomi is I didn't realize that my phone's volume was carried over through the screen copy thing. Okay. Um, and as we can see here, there is a, like five missions per zone. This is the general structure for the game. You have to defeat all of these four missions in order to unlock the final one. And then upon defeating the final one, you unlock the next zone. And they get progressively harder, though some of them are outliers. Uh, the final mission is always going to be significantly harder than the other missions in your zone. Obviously, Elwyn Forest right now is more of a tutorial than anything. Um, but... Let me just make sure audio is good. I'll, I'm going to turn it up one more pip, because... Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I think audio should be good now. Alright. So, yeah, the game's going to give you starting tips. Obviously, I've already played this. Just for reference, in case anybody didn't hear me talk about this in the past... Um, 
I've already completely, yeah, I've already completely beaten this game, so obviously I know all the missions, I know all the strategies, blah, blah, blah. I'm more just trying to showcase how pay to win this game gets. So I'm not going to be sitting here thoroughly explaining all of the mechanics. Uh, we're going to kind of be blitzing through this just so we can get to the microtransaction stuff and explain why it is so predatory and why it is so bad. It's also, I, I am right now currently playing through the emulator, so it's a little bit janky. Technically speaking, I could play it on my phone if I wanted to, but I figured this is easier from like a streaming perspective than trying to figure out like how to play it on two devices. Um, and here I'm just going to wait to generate a bit of golds. My tower is just going to take care of that, and then I can drop a kobold to farm some more. Especially because I want my tank to be in the front there, then I can put a range behind it. I want to space them out because this mob's attacks are AoE. Fuck me, the screen scrolled. Yeah, that's a little bit of an annoying thing. When I'm trying to place things, the screen scrolling is fucking me slightly. That can I... Oh, I can zoom this in for myself. I don't know... Oh, wow. Yeah, that actually completely changed the... Um... Here, let me adjust this real quick. Oh, fuck, I'm losing. <laughs> actually lost my tower because I was adjusting this. Um... There we go. That should be fixed. Uh, bubble there. Get the most out of Chain Lightning. Uh, Warcraft Rumble seemed decent at first and then turned into the inevitable money grab. Yeah. There we go. Uh, so one thing that you'll probably notice me doing a lot is just beelining for the boss. A lot of times, in order to beat each mission, all you need to do is defeat the boss at the end. The boss's health reaches zero, you've successfully beaten, uh, you know, the end. You don't actually need to have map control, though that can sometimes help towards getting the boss completed. Um, in fact, actually, it might... Let me see. I think it might be easier for me to just play on my phone, because... I'm having some issues targeting. Yeah, this is actually just easier to just play on my phone. Um, I'm just going to ignore the little tutorial thing there. If there's any issues with like the audio because I'm looking down at my phone, let me know. But I'm hoping that this will be uh, easier. Your dad accused you of having an unclean keyboard and you disagreed, so he ran a surface test and discovered... <laughs> Negan. Jesus Christ. Ugh... <laughs> All right, so here I'm going to drop. Meeting stones are basically little forward summoning points where you can put minions. So I'm just going to put an unbound minion. Basically, the way that deploying units in this game works, there's two types. One is bound by these little blue boxes you see. And then the other type of minion, which is... Fuck, that's actually kind of bad. Uh... Safe Pilot, the one where I'm dropping right now, is an example of an unbound minion. It can be placed anywhere in the map. Safe Pilot especially is pretty broken because it does a crap ton of damage when it's landing and it also does a ton of damage after the fact when you are just like having it run around in the map. And especially the reason why it's really good to grab the high ground here is the way that a lot of this stuff works is minions who are on the high ground can target minions in the lower passage, but not vice versa. So any of my guys chilling on that bridge can just freely hit anything running below them and they can't be attacked. So it's just kind of overpowered. And that is what like half of these maps are about. 
It's just get the high ground and then hold it. That's the murloc in you? <laughs> True. Yeah, Negan is, I guess in that case, what? A quarter murloc? All right. Um, interesting choices here. Okay, so this is something I'm actually going to put up to a poll. So, engage with your audience. Start a poll. Which starting leader should I pick? And I will give some details about each one before I start the poll. So, no matter what people pick, I, I will go with the decision here. But I will try to slightly influence your choice. Uh, this is definitely better. I actually, I did the math on this a while ago. It is possible to get completely garbage options as your starting leader and have none of them be really workable early on. Uh, two of these options are very good. Blood Mage Thalnos. I don't know if he's been hotfixed. Actually, I, I can check his spells. Uh, never mind. I It does not show me his talents. Um, so, Blood Mage Thalnos looks like he has not been changed at all, which does not surprise me. I, yeah, you can't see talents just yet. Talents are pretty important, but it doesn't show up. Um, in the previous version that I played, and I believe still right now, he is the most overpowered hero in the entire game. The way that your army builds work is you have one leader, and then you have six units, and you can pick any six units you want. They had a pretty terrible system in the beta where you were kind of locked into a few unit types, depending on which leader you picked. Generally, it was like stuff within your faction. So the different factions are Horde, Alliance, Undead, Blackrock, and Beast. And Thalnos is one of the two Undead leaders. And honestly, both of the Undead leaders are very, very powerful. Uh, but Thalnos was just broken. Primarily because he... He has a talent that he picks up later on that just makes him kind of unkillable. And he can just solo entire missions. Really powerful. He is weaker early on, though. So if I pick Thalnos, or if you guys vote for Thalnos when I post this poll, uh, I will have a slightly weaker start, but a much higher potential once I eventually get his unlocks that make him ridiculously powerful. Um, but I've tested the start with Thalnos a bunch, actually, so it's the one I'm most familiar with. Um... Was that uh, two mana one one that gives plus one spell power and death rattle draw a card? Seems pretty good for Warcraft Rumble. Yeah. Um, so Karen Bloodhoof is the worst out of these three options. He has a kind of pretty weak uh, passive ability. Horde troops have twenty percent increased health. Horde units are usually some of the worst in the game. There are a few good horde units, but overall, on average, they are the weakest faction. Um, and his, like, he doesn't really do anything other than he has a frontal cone stun that he periodically does, but it doesn't really add a lot. Karen's just not very good. He doesn't really bring anything special to the table. His stats are pretty shit. Um, not super great overall. Tyrion is interesting. He is, I don't know if I would say the strongest alliance hero. I think all alliance heroes are good. Tyrion, I generally is considered to be, I think, the strongest, but there's high potential for all of them. He is one of the few units that can actually heal. It is not a common thing. There's like one or two healing abilities. Thalnos gets one of them, but it's a self-heal. Uh, Tyrion is pretty much the main healing unit for other characters. And that makes him really, really, really good with certain setups. He's honestly fairly weak in the early game because you're not going to get a lot of units to actually synergize with him. But once you actually get like a good build going with Tyrion, he can be very powerful. Uh, so honestly, aside from Karen, which is kind of bad, Tyrion and Thalnos both provide fairly different playstyles. Tyrion buffs his army, Thalnos is very selfish. Thalnos wants your entire build to be around making him as overpowered as possible. So, Karen makes the game cost more money. In a sense, yes. Uh, I'll put this poll up. And another thing to consider, which we'll see very shortly, one of the first... Um, one of the first, like, money packs that you have to buy in the store is directly based off your choice here. So, your early decision kind of matters. It's not just which hero you start with, but it's also, like, this hero kind of influences your store packs. 
it, technically speaking, it doesn't make a huge difference. I would say picking a horde hero is usually the worst option because the horde unit pack that you get offered to buy in the store has the worst choices because generally horde units are bad. Um, but the other ones, it really could go either way. I would say Undead probably is the strongest store pack. The three units that you get offered are all pretty good. And Blackrock also has a lot of good options. Uh, there's no Blackrock option here. It only gives you three out of a potential four. Uh, beast heroes cannot be gotten off random options. You have to buy Beast heroes in the store. There's only three of them. There's Old Murkai, there's Hogger, and there is... Uh, Charga Razor Flank, and none of them can be, a, or none of them can appear in these options. Uh, you get three out of a selection of uh, the four other factions, and also, um, whichever one I don't get here will be one of the options in the next one. Because if let's say if we pick Thalnos, who is currently winning the poll. I will not be offered the other undead hero with my next free hero option. You get two free heroes at the start. The rest you have to buy off the store. Um, it is a mix of targeted buying and loot box stuff, as we'll see, Naomi. All right. Uh, so there are seven votes. I will close the poll in, like, 30 seconds or so. So vote now. Right now it's a tie between Thalnos and Tyrion. So, it, it would be up to a coin flip. Oh, now it's a tie again. Now Tyrion's in the lead. Uh, when the when my clock hits ten fifty eight, I'll close the poll. So, any last second votes? I think it definitely is clear that people don't want Karen. Which honestly, thank you for that because playing Karen would have been fucking miserable. It just wouldn't have been a great way to start off the game. Thalnos and Tyrion are both interesting in different ways. Ah. There we go. Track lock icon. Uh, still showing 10.57 on my clock, so poll's not closed just yet. And unfortunately is now back to being a tie, which means it would be up to a coin flip. So if anyone has a last second uh, winner changing poll... Playing Karen would have been expensive, true. Yeah, it would have been not the most fun. Uh, I mean, I'm not spending any money on this regardless. So, 10.58, and... Alright, well, it is a tie. So, yeah, we will do a coin flip for... How do I want to do this? Just to make it fair, coin flip. Um, move this on my screen. It listed Thalnos first. We take it. No, 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 no. Just to be fair. Uh, need to find this. Oh no, that's live split. I don't want that. Okay, so. Gonna be clicking flip again. Heads is Thalnos, tails is Cairn. Or not Cairn, fuck Tyrion, you know what I mean. Okay, tails is Tyrion, right. Uh, almost fucked myself there. Uh, there we go. Alright. Tyrion wins. Honestly, I'm kind of glad because I haven't done a Tyrion start yet. I've done a Jaina start for Alliance. But, and I've obviously done multiple Blood Mage Thalnos starts. But never a Tyrion. <laughs> your grandmother voted for Thalnos and your grandfather voted Tyrion and now they're yelling at each other. <laughs> your grandfather just cast Rossbolt on your grandma. Holy shit. Oh no. Alright. Okay, the next few missions we can kind of blitz through. It's going to be maybe not the fastest with Tyrion because Tyrion is definitely more of a slow grindy playstyle. Uh, I tried this, so I did a test run again the other day, just to make sure all this stuff was working. And I used uh, the other undead leader, Baron Rivendare, who is my personal favorite. And it was ridiculously overpowered. Baron Rivendare's start is kind of ludicrously fast. Alright. I'm 
gonna put Tyrion in the back line as a healer. Now, the annoying thing about this map is you'll see in a second that little ogre in the back up there patrols back and forth down the lanes and is about to do a lot of damage to my units. Yeah, he just nearly one-shot Tyrion. That actually was a really well-placed chain lightning, though. Yeah, so I kind of need to wait for this ogre to fuck off. There we go. The ogre fucked up. And now that he's in the other lane, I can safely push this lane without worrying about getting blasted by his, like, one-shot barrels. I'm going to carefully position safe pilot, and then the wolf walked right out of it. Fuck. Uh... That's fine. Alright, so I think, yeah, that's one hit away from dying. A lot of times towards the end when the boss is almost dead, you can just kind of completely ignore any defense and just go full on for offense and just make sure the boss dies and it's kind of whatever. These early missions are, are not really going to be terribly interesting. We just kind of got to get through them. There are definitely some more interesting mechanics later on, like that one had the whole ogre patrolling back and forth, which is kind of neat, I guess. It's something. Um... Morgan the Collector, he has like a special mechanic where he goes into stealth. So most of the bosses are attackable at all times. Morgan will stealth, so you have to get up really close to him. He always gets like the opening hit on you, which means you need to make sure that you have a tank, but even your tank is going to take a beat. Alright, so I'm going to quickly drop a chain lightning on them. I'm going to grab that chest. Send that to go for the kobold. Put my tank down. Actually, wait. Morgan is not going into stealth. They must have changed that. Oh. Uh, that's not good. Tyrion's getting blasted. And take care of that wolf. Throw down another kobold. And... Alright. Tower is secured. Now, my tank died here, so I'm going to have to drop down a new one. And unfortunately, it means my units are probably going to be a little bit screwed on the front lines there. Uh, actually, wait. The boss is kind of melting. Tyrion's kind of really strong, huh? All right. So, something interesting about Tyrion is he has an armored effect, which means he takes, like, massively reduced physical damage. So, apparently, for any boss like Morgan the Collector, which has no magic damage whatsoever, Tyrion can basically just solo him, apparently. That's actually kind of nuts. Um, haven't really done starts with Tyrion, so that is interesting. Did not expect that. Okay, let me quickly see... Um, uh, Naomi said, do you have to have a 1, 2, 3, 4 cost? No. The highest cost is 6, I think. I, I think the highest cost is 6. And you can have any combination of any units you want, technically speaking. Uh, do you think Morgan the Collector could graduate medical school? I mean, hey, with enough effort, sure. Okay, so this is the start of the microtransaction stuff. So, we'll do another poll here to pick the unit. This one will be shorter. But basically, the main way in which you unlock new units is something called the grid. It is a set of random units that get like added here later on. There'll be upgrades, talents, etc. Uh, so I'll quickly just throw in a poll for start a poll. The options we have here, we have Ghoul, Stonehoof Tarin, Harvest Golem. Uh, interesting thing, they've fixed this now, so which units should I pick? I'm not going to pull everything, it's just the starting unit and the um, starting hero are actually kind of important. And each one will change the way you play Stonehoof Tarin and Harvest Golem. So before I throw out this poll, real quick about them. Well, obviously they have different factions, they're all tanks, the ghoul moves kind of slowly. 
it will eat the corpses of enemies, kind of like the undead cannibalize racial, and it heal itself, but it is animation locked while it is doing that. It is fairly cheap. It only costs um, two gold. So it's a very, like, cheap tank that can kind of sustain itself. It's not terrible. Stone of Tarin, I'll be honest, is the strongest of these options. It has a charge effect, you can see here. Uh, the charge does a pretty hefty amount of damage, and it means it can gap close against any ranged units. So that makes it really nice against, you know, dealing with stuff that's shooting it from a distance. Uh, Stone of Tarin is really good at sniping weak units. It also, while she's in melee, if another ranged unit starts to come close to her, she will peel off that unit and charge to the incoming ranged units, so it's pretty flexible. Uh, it is a bit costly, though. I think it's the most expensive out of these options at four gold. Harvest Golem is three gold, so actually perfect mix in between the two. And after it dies, it comes back to life with, like, I think 30% of its health. Um... It's not terrible, but I would say it is definitely the weakest of these options. All right, start pull. Uh, the main thing, though, is previously, this is at least one small good change, it was possible to not always get offered a tank. And that was something that I kind of noticed while doing tests here. Sometimes you would get offered random DPS units, and you kind of need to have an extra tank early. So I did a few test runs back when, uh, before they did that, where I did not pick a tank unit, and it went horribly wrong. I got stuck in the second world, and I just could not beat certain missions without, like, a m ridiculous amount of trial and error. And that is before you're supposed to hit a wall. So now they've at least made it so you always get offered a second tank, be it Ghoul, Stone of Tarina, or Harvest Golem, which, like, even the worst one of these will be infinitely better than, like, a generic DPS unit. The 2-3 Harvest Golem comes back as a 2-1. Yeah, they have used a lot of iconic Hearthstone cards for these. Chat, remember to tie it so he has to coin flip again. Oh, God. Um, I definitely do think I... I am slightly influencing it a little bit by... I did say Stone Hook Tarin was the most broken one. The pull is kind of a landslide, so... I'm just going to end it. Yes, yeah, Stone Hook Tarin wins by a million votes. Like I said, we're trying to go a little bit quickly here, so I'm not going to be like, oh, pick whichever one you want. Giving you at least the choice, if you guys wanted to troll me and pick Harvest Golem, you absolutely could have, but I did say this one was the strongest. And you know what? Stone of Tarin is my favorite unit in the game, so I'm kind of glad that I did slightly rig it by explaining that it was the stronger unit. Uh... There's also, this I noticed on the other time, there's a little ping here that says there's like one unread something. Never goes away. It's always there. Alright. So, Hogger, this mission is slightly harder. It's like one tier in difficulty up, quote unquote. But it is still relatively easy. You should have said that Harvest Golem was the troll option. Honestly, Harvest Golem wasn't even that bad. The ghoul is claiming that the election was rigged. Yeah. Just pick the second best everything from now on so it's not Giga Troll. Yeah, you could do that as an option. Crash that down, take out the ranged unit. Uh, I did lose my tank, which kind of sucks. But Tyrion should be able to keep them alive. I'm going to send Stone of Tarin... Hopefully it gets there before the gnome. No, nah, the gnome's going to get in tower range first. Yes, but it hits some of the um, chickens. That helps. Drop this on top of the tower. Alright, so a few other things. Uh, Angry Chickens is a unit that you're going to see a lot early on. It is, technically speaking, the highest DPS unit in the game. Maybe a little bit surprisingly. But that is only if they're not able to be killed with AoE effects. So I guess it's kind of fitting that they are really high DPS because obviously one Chain Lightning, one anything, and they are just done. But there actually are a handful of missions where using Angry Chickens as the player, once you unlock it, is quite good because... It will, uh, like, it let you cheese mechanics. There's, uh, later on a mission, like, much later in the game called Gorklaw, 
Gorklaw is a raptor that one-shots every unit he hits. So Angry Chickens is really good because the amount of time that it takes him to slowly turn around one shot, one shot, one shot every single chicken, they are outputting like a massive amount of damage onto him. So it's good for that. Okay, uh, fuck. Uh, you know what? I'm not going to pull this one. Plague Farmer is the best option. All of these are good options, but they are so comparable that I it's not even worth it. Plague Farmer is just slightly better. So we're picking Plague Farmer. And get to give out XP. I'm going to give it to Stonehook Tarin. Tyrion. Plague Farmer. There we go. Uh, so the thing, the XP little box that you saw there, that is the main way in which XP is rewarded for units. You get the tiny amount after beating a mission, but then there's like daily quests to get like a large chunk of experience. And it always gives you an option of two minions to pick from and you get to pick which one gets the experience. Gives you a little bit more control, but there are certain problems with it. Uh, namely, it favors your weakest XP units. So later on, when you have every single unit in the game and you're trying to specifically power level one unit, the game kind of makes that hard to do. Um, it's interesting how you choose where the XP goes. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, can you put multiple of the hero at the same time? Yes, you can. Yeah, if I wanted to put multiple Tyrians, I could. The way that it works, though, is you fully rotate through your entire thing. So the... If I wanted to play Tyrion a second time, I would have to play at least, like, half of my other roster for him to show up in the initial four options again. And there's a lot of units called cycled units. Cycled units are anything that is two gold or cheaper, and the entire point of them is they're weak, but they cost very little. So you can quickly throw them out there and get to your bigger units uh, easier. So, like, Blood Mage Thalnos, for instance, really wants to play, like, a ton of different spells. So, Thalnos will play a lot of different powerful spells, and then a bunch of really, really cheap units that you can just throw out there and then cycle to your good spells, so you can keep buffing them over and over. Okay, Voltros. To push this tower. Uh, now... The way that, um... Oh, fuck. That's actually kind of bad. The angry chickens are going to shred my stone of Tarin. The way that these vultures work is whenever the vultures kill a unit, they summon a new one. So Vultures' entire boss mechanic is basically built around the vulture unit. There's a bunch of random chickens that spawn in the middle. And the idea is that um, his vultures will quickly kill those chickens and summon like an entire herd. Uh, doesn't really have too much danger though. Oh, and that time the angry chickens just got blasted by the AoE effect. So, rest in peace. I'm gonna try to get a really big chain lightning. Ooh, that's a lot of value. Throw Tyrion in here to heal up my units. So, these chests... The way they work is, whenever they get destroyed, whichever, like, enemy, either you or the opponent, is closest, gets credit for it. So even though that chest was behind enemy lines, I was able to drop an unbound unit, the safe pilot, behind it, and snipe the chest before my opponent could get over there and grab it. Also, this is why the safe pilot is one of the most broken units in the game. You can see here, it is behind the boss, it is free casting, and it is doing a bajillion damage. It also deals splash damage, so it's just, uh, like, doing a ton of DPS to Voltros, and whenever he summons new units to help him, it just blows up the nearby ones. So Safe Pilot is ridiculously strong. Uh, Negan said, I really hope your grandparents don't play this game during Thanksgiving. You can already see the whole week getting ruined. Yeah. Uh, ah, here we go, the first store bundle. Okay, so this one's fun. Now, let's take a moment to look at this one. So, uh, yeah, you can see all of the little bundles down here for refills. Now, it's worth noting that 
in the original days when Blizzard was advertising this game, they said that they were going to have anti-whaling features where you could only buy a certain amount of gold per week. So you could only spend like $10, $15 in gold, and then you had to earn the rest by playing the game. They have given up on that. Now you could just literally swipe your card and get infinite money and get all the upgrades and shit you want. So it is fully pay to win, just to be absolutely clear. There is no transparency on that now. Uh, you could, in theory, I guess if you wanted to right now, buy like $5,000 worth of gold and immediately just start buying things off the grid here until you had a fully maxed out max level army. Uh, live ad, this is the opposite of a live ad. This is a live anti-ad. I am telling you to stay away from this. I am playing this so you don't have to. That is the entire point of this. I hope that's clear. Uh, while I do enjoy some parts of the gameplay, this game is not worth it for how greedy it is. Now, this is... Okay, so this is the first of our Diablo Immortal bundles. Uh, you're sorry you just hopped in? Yeah. Um, this is... There's there's a lot to unpack with this alliance pack here. No pun intended. So, as I mentioned, the starting faction leader you pick influences which bundle you get. It'll always be your faction's bundle. It'll always be the same three units. Um, and yeah, not knowing how much money you're spending. But this is one of the funny things. Uh, assuming nothing has changed, later on they will start doing the Diablo Immortal thing of like X percent value, 800 percent value, 500 percent value, blah 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 blah. Here, they can't even justify it. They put mythic value, which I think is hilarious. What what defines mythic value? Uh, well, we're gonna take a look and do the math live on what defines mythic value. So let me go ahead and add another window capture to my obs window oh god what what did i just do no um i i don't want to actually here i i need to fix something obs just oh god why does why is this taking up like my entire screen obs what are you doing hold up You're not even kidding you would buy this kind of pack? Exactly. Exactly. But that's the thing. It's deceptive. It's fucking shady marketing bullshit where it wants to trick you into buying because it's $2, right? Like, of course I'm going to buy a pack that's only $2. So I have the, um, I have this thing here. I have a second timer. That's just because I had to pick one of my open windows for, um, this thing. Window capture. And we are going to bust out, where is it? The calculator. All right, so we can clearly see what constitutes mythic value. And, and that is exactly what Blizzard does. And I should note one thing that almost certainly has not changed. The further you get into the game, the larger the bundles get. You get offered a bundle after beating the final zone in the entire game that is worth or that costs $60. So it is like 100% the boiling frog thing. It starts off with $2. The final bundle you get offered is fucking $60. And each one gets progressively worse and worse and worse and more expensive. And they're all like the value always goes up. It starts off at like 250% value. By the end, it's like 650% value. This one is mythic value, right? Um... Mythic value is higher than LFR normal heroic value. Yeah. So that's kind of the problem. One of the biggest issues, right? Let's just address it. Naomi even pointed out one day, 23 hours, you're losing money if you do. Yeah. The fucking timer bullshit is the most egregious part of this design. This is completely fucked up. Mythic value is a real thing and very rare, and basically you should buy it immediately. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Diablo Immortal obviously has this. And this is the biggest problem. This is why if you, so I, I, I will probably use Honkai Star Rail as an example in my final review for this game, but Honkai Star Rail and a lot of other gacha games and stuff like this, which this technically speaking falls into the category of a gacha game for reasons we will see. Um, they usually have set bundles, but they are like 100% uptime. I don't know. There's probably some really greedy gacha games out there. The whole... The moment you unlock the pack, it has a limited time. That is 
garbage. That is so fucking scummy psychological bullshit. Because this is not like everybody only has two days left. This is literally the moment that this pack becomes available to you. There's a ticking timer that the moment it expires, you can never buy the pack again. And there is a really bad one coming up that is the most egregious offender for this. Um, this is a, a bit more innocuous. Eh, it's just a small bundle of three units. Um, but the timer basically puts a clock on your decision. And of course, one of the, the things that a lot of these companies will do is by limiting the amount of time you have to make informed decisions, you're more likely to make a poor decision. So let's take a look at what mythic value means. So one unit in this game, this is a pretty set cost, costs 90 gold. Right? This is the general cost for any regular unit, and this is three regular units. There's no heroes here. So 90 gold is the cost for a single unit. Okay. So you are getting, what is 90 times three? You're getting 270 gold worth of value out of this pack for $2. Now, if we go down here to if you were to actually spend that money on gold, at the lowest conversion rate, 90 gold is $1. So in theory, you're saving $1. Now, at the absolute best case, mythic value could mean $1 saved. Now, realistically speaking... If you are actually going to wail on this game, which, God, please do not, pick a better game. If, you, you're, if you're gonna wail on a game, wail on fucking Honkai Star Rail. At least the characters there, you, you're getting, like, actual interesting characters, right? Not this fucking trash. Um, so, I, I already did the math before the stream starts. It The conversion rate goes up a little bit better with the $5 bundle, and the conversion rate used for the $10 bundle is the exact same one that is used for all the others. You can quickly do the math yourself. Um, once you buy this bundle, if you don't keep buying other bundles, you might as well stop playing. You wasted your first purchase. Exactly. That's how they get you. At least gotchas, you can get anime girls. Exactly, Chori. That's pretty much what I was looking for, the words there. You're surprised there isn't some kind of promotion, um, with, like, double for first purchases? Yeah, that's actually, I'm surprised they don't have that. Uh, even Honkai Star Rail has that. Whatever, Blizzard's greedy. You know how they are. So, basically... If we look at the the highest possible conversion rate, which is what any actual whales will be buying, it is ten dollars for one thousand two hundred gold. Okay, so you're getting two hundred seventy gold for three dollars. So one thousand two hundred divided by ten is one hundred twenty gold. So effectively, if you're buying an infinite amount of gold, one dollar equals one hundred twenty gold. So if you uh, were spending $2, that's 240 gold. So, this bundle is worth 270 gold. And the amount that $2 worth of gold would get you is 240 gold. So, in reality, mythic value is 30 gold. I don't know if I would consider 30 gold the amount that you get for beating... A single one of these missions, I, I really don't think I would personally call that mythic value, but hey, apparently, according to Blizzard, that is what passes as mythic value. So, now that we've gotten the first store thing out of the way, we can continue until we reach the next bundle. Um... I'll probably have to play through this again with, like, a timer because I'm spending a lot of time starting and stopping, but, you know, you get the idea. I think putting the timer up here. Yeah, 25 cents is mythic value. Pretty much. Yeah. Uh, that is actually a, a much better way to visualize it, I would say. Okay. So, old Merc Eye. This one isn't too bad. Tyrion over here. One of the other important things with games like this is, you can see there, I was able to one-shot all three of those Murlocs um, with my uh, my Chain Lightning. Understanding important breakpoints like that, where I know that at this level, Chain Lightning is a one-shot on Murlocs, is important. The problem is, because of the way that leveling in a lot of these games work, it's a similar thing in Clash Royale, which is kind of what this game was based on. 
it's kind of not always the easiest to determine... Oh, fuck. That's actually kind of bad. I'm gonna get shredded by those angry chickens. There we go. Okay, should be good. Uh, because of the fact that stats will scale up with every single level you get, it becomes difficult to actually really understand like, damage breakpoints like that, because it changes depending on, like, whether you're below or above the recommended level. And a lot of times that can make it a little bit tricky to play around everything. And that is kind of, like, the artificial difficulty in this game. Now, anybody who has, like, listened to my gigantic rants that I posted about the main problem with this game, which we will still get to, we haven't even seen the main issue with this game. It's, it is technically the microtransactions. But there is a specific part of the microtransactions that I have a problem with in terms of how they kind of incentivize you to, um, to play. Stonehook Tauren needs to put in a lot of work here. Unfortunately, it's about to get stunned. This mission is really annoying. I'm gonna have to end up chipping away at it bit by bit towards the end. Alright, uh, I also... Yeah, I'm just going to zap these murlocs. Defias mobs. Alright, this is fine. I win. Yeah, Stone of Tarn putting work. Um, is Brawl Stars pay to win? I'm not familiar with Brawl Stars, so I can't comment on that. Uh, while the monetization is dumb, do you think it's worth to play if you, um, pay zero dollars? That is kind of what I'm going to demonstrate. The thing is, it's the game deceives you into thinking that you can kind of get away with not paying money because the early difficulty curve is not too steep, which is the entire thing that I kind of want to demonstrate as we go on. You're going to notice that, like, over time, I am going to start hitting walls where I am forced to grind. And this, you know, I'm going to end Westfall here, and I think ending, well, r roughly around the time when I end Westfall or Duskwood, I forget when, I'm going to hit the first major, like, scummy thing, and I think that'll be a good point to end the stream on. Um, but you'll notice that the the gaps in terms of, like, how far you can get without spending money are going to very quickly spiral out of control to the point where, no, I do not believe this game is worth playing at all if you are not spending money. It is. It gets really, 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 really bad. Because right now... Yeah, I haven't spent any money you can scrape by, and it doesn't feel like you need to spend any money. But the main issue is it the scaling on experience. That is the biggest problem. Because the scaling on stats, that, that was kind of why I was talking before about breakpoints, right? It's very important to understand that if I use Chain Lightning on Angry Chickens, or Chain Lightning will always kill Angry Chickens. If I use Chain Lightning on Murlocs, the Murlocs will die. That is a very important thing to understand, because otherwise you can have situations where I use, I spend, um, there we go, my minions just finish it off. I can spend two lightning to try and kill murlocs, and because they are so overleveled compared to where I am, it just doesn't kill them. And then, you know, units are obviously, as in, as, like in many of these games, the same strength at one health as they are at full health, so I've effectively wasted gold to do nothing. So, you need to keep your units leveled up. Leveling up your units increases their health, damage, etc. It is mandatory. And the scaling is pretty egregious, right? Like, the difference between a level 4 unit and a level 5 unit is, like, pretty noticeable. But especially level 4 and level 6, level 6 units will destroy their hard counters. That is how big the scaling gets. So, aside from a few edge cases, like Thalnos, where, like I said, Thalnos is ridiculously overpowered... Um, generally speaking, it is the case that having, um, higher level units is mandatory to clear anything. And if you don't have higher level units, the only way to clear cer certain missions later on are just by grinding. 
You have to grind and get those higher level units. You just cannot pass. And it's not great. It feels really bad. Uh, here, it kind of forces us into PvP. Real quick, before I do PvP, I'm going to... Uh, buy Skeleton Party, because Skeleton Party is one of my favorite units. Very strong. It'll help. Quillbore is also good. Right, made a few minor swaps there. Uh, get Thalnos or pay money, kind of. Honestly, Thalnos will probably be nerfed because of that. Uh, he's one of the few that you can kind of cheese with. And even then, you still need to level up Thalnos. So the problem is, even if you get Thalnos, the only thing with him is you just have to grind a ridiculous amount just to get experience on Thalnos. And that still takes a lot of time. It just means you don't need to level up the rest of your army. And you still kind of need to level up a few supporting spells for Thalnos, but it is the fastest and cheapest army to build up, at least currently. Just because you know, of the way it works. It is also very hard to play, I should note. The Thalnos build is really fucking difficult to manage, because if you don't protect Thalnos at all costs, you're just dead. So it's not exactly easy. Um, similar to Hearthstone Mercenaries, yeah, I, I remember that game was pretty bad in that regard. Uh, if you can't choose a specific unit to level, you could get super time-gated by just never being able to upgrade something like Chain Lightning. Exactly. That is kind of the problem with it. You, you cannot target farm something. You have to farm experience, and it gives you for the XP packs. But I should note, the XP packs, these things, the tomes, they are not the norm. You get them either by paying money or as daily rewards. So yes, that gives you a little bit more control over what you level up, but not exactly. Uh, and then, as we will see, there is later on a way to farm experience, but the way it is done is so garbage and random that it effectively becomes like pulling teeth. The best way to farm experience is PvP, which we can do here. Uh, the end match reward, especially if you win for PvP, is significantly higher than anything else in the game from repeatable sources. And that means that effectively, if you don't PvP, you really cannot play this game free to play, even remotely. The problem is PvP is even more pay to win than PvE. So, it basically, it, it, the only free to play way to level your characters efficiently is PvP. The worst thing to do as a free to play player is to play v PvP. So, yeah, you might be able to see the problem with that. Um, this is also a bot, for the record. Um, drop Skeleton Party there. Drop that there. Uh, so, at least on the beta right now, I doubt this will carry over into live servers. Hopefully it doesn't, because that would obviously be even worse. But right now on the beta, you can queue into bots on the ladder because obviously there's not enough players to fill regular queues and they still want people to be able to test PvP. So this, uh, this is not like an actual player. This is definitely a bot. Usually you can tell by like the capitalization and the names and stuff like that. Uh, oh, there is now a barrier around towers that you cannot drop unbound units on. That was actually not, did not used to be a thing. Oh, shit. A skeleton party is a ridiculously good unit. It summons a group of five skeletons. There are two casters. You can see it's like the little guy with the purple robe. That's a mage. It uh, does pretty solid DPS, considering it's like a generic small unit. And it also uh, slows targets. So, you can drop it anywhere in the map, and it's just overall really, really, really nice to have. And then drop a kobold and collect those items. I drop skeleton party in the middle of the bridge to help support my stonehoof tarn that's about to get there. Drop a thing on that guy. Also going to put Tyrion up there. Plague farmer. And then drop Skeleton Party to kind of distract them. I also baited out the Banshee. Blizzard is pretty unfortunate. Cobalt there. 
Um. Let's see. There we go. Uh. Is there any reason to have specific types of units like full undead, full alliance, or something? Yes, kind of. Um. That is a much more advanced thing that is a little bit difficult for me to explain. Wait, what? OBS. What the fuck? Uh, okay, is the stream okay? OBS disconnected for a moment, which was not great. Not thrilled about that. Uh, but let me know. I hope everything is working now. Uh, you also get rewards at certain breakpoints for PvP. Uh, good here, stream hiccup, but it's all good now, cool. Uh, so, to Umbral's question, you can rerun previous missions, but at the moment, you get nothing out of it. You get, like, a tiny bit of XP, it's not worth doing. Later on, there is an option where you can rerun previous missions with a leader of a different faction. So, I'm completing all of these missions with Tyrion, an alliance leader. If later on, once I unlock that feature, if I go back with Cairn or Thalnos or stuff, I can get credit for beating those missions as Horde or Undead. And you basically get a small amount of additional gold. It, it's a pretty pitiful amount, though, if we're being real. Uh, the early zones, you can only do that twice. The later zones have rewards uh, for completing it with every single possible faction. So there is like increasing amounts of gold that you get it is one time only though once you've beaten it with a specific faction you cannot get gold again by rerunning the mission uh to naomi's question there is in some cases situations in which you would want to have specific units so eventually you'll get an upgrade system where the specific units in these slots that you see here have like a little icon above them where if you match the icon uh, with the unit type, you get a plus one level bonus. And you can upgrade that level bonus to be all the way up to plus three. And as we've already said, level scaling can be pretty aggressive, and keeping up with it really matters. So having a plus three level bonus on a unit is pretty huge. So, for instance, every single faction leader has the first two slots. So where I have Plague Farmer and Skeleton Party now, it is tied to their current faction. So these two slots, there would be an alliance icon above these two units. Which means I would want to have a uh, safe pilot in that slot to get the bonus on it. And that would mean I am incentivized to run a second alliance unit on Tyrion at all times. Because otherwise I'm missing out on a level bonus. Uh, every single leader also has a predetermined uh, bonus for this slot. For Tyrion, I believe his bonus is tank. Uh, Tyrion has to have a tank unit in this slot to get the bonus. And then the other three on the bottom row, you get to pick what the bonus is. Now, the problem with that was, in the beta, once you selected a bonus for one of these slots, you could never change it again for the rest of the game. It was locked in. So if you made a poor choice, you were fucked. And the other problem with that, and why I think it was a bad feature in general, is you can, since you can never change it, and even if they do give you ways to change it, it required a lot of investment. And the... Like, the problem with this game is, uh, problem, strength, weakness, etc., depending on how you look at it, is you need to flex between different units for certain missions. So sometimes you would need a lot of unbound units for a specific mission, and if that meant you needed to break one of your bonuses, it would still effectively be mandatory, but then you're losing out on the level bonuses, which really sucked. So it felt bad. Um, the first deal bundles are real currency only. Oh, every single bundle is real currency only, to be clear, Naomi. Uh, you can never buy the later bundles with gold. Also, real quick, spider on my wall. So let me just take care of this. Goodbye, spider. Uh, yeah, all of the bundles are real money only. The only thing that you can buy with gold is stuff on the grid. So gold is specifically used here. This is the only place where you can spend gold. Every single other thing in this game can only be bought with real money. Which, of course, yeah, it's another issue, right? Um, and the grid has its own problems. One of the biggest issues with the grid, which I guess is worth talking about now, is you'll notice I have a random selection of units here. Now, as it so happens, some of these units are quite good. Quillbore is quite good. Harpies are quite good. But 
one issue that I ran into when I was playing is I really wanted to get a specific talent, because later on, talents and upgrades will appear on this thing. I really wanted to get the overpowered Thalnos talent. It took me, I shit you not, two weeks to see the Thalnos talent appear in my grid. And the only way to move this is to wait. Uh, I think I'm actually very close to the daily reset, which is why it's 19 minutes. This is a 24-hour cooldown. You only get a shift in your grid. You only get a new offering of units either every 24 hours or if you spend money, it moves. So you can see here all of the stuff that is like depressed down into the back that's like darkened. When I buy this quill bore, all of that stuff will disappear and new things will have a chance to take its place. So it is literally a system where in order to unlock all of the units that you want, you either have to wait a pretty long amount of time or you have to keep spending money on things that you don't want to have a chance at being able to spend money on things that you want. It is awful. Absolutely awful. Anyways, let's keep going. To Faux Reaper 4000. I, I'm admittedly... I wanted to get to the first egregious bundle, but I think it's at the end of Duskwood, which is the zone after this. And that's going to be like another 30-45 minutes. So I think I might stop after Westfall for this stream. But whatever I don't finish on this stream, just to reiterate... We will be finishing it tomorrow on the Twitch stream, in addition to raid testing and 10-man ICC. That is what is planned for tomorrow's stream. Or on Saturday's stream or something. Whenever I have time for it. I'm gonna send a Kobold down that lane, and then throw Tyrion here to support my units. Uh, how did the sim leveling go? It went better than I expected, but... Also, still not great overall. It, Rogue is still a little bit problematic for leveling in general. Be it assassination sub or, or assassination outlaw, etc. Um, I think sub will go better actually. But overall, Rogue still has a lot of problems that even the rework hasn't really managed to fix. God damn it! The stupid enemy kobold is stealing my loot. I'm just going to drop that to finish it off. Um, I'm going to be able to get this tower, because the poison will finish it off. Nice! Okay, safe pilot actually kind of cleaned up there. Uh, just, I kind of won here. But, just to be safe. Nice. And then I'm going to put the Skeleton Party just outside of its range. Oh yeah, I forgot. Skeleton Party is actually three mages and two warriors. It's even better than I remembered. Pretty easy overall. Uh, Alright, and then the final mission for Westfall. I don't know if it's going to do another store pop-up here. Loading. Loading. There we go. Okay, no, the next big pop-up isn't until after Van Cleef. And we'll see. Um, this mission, mission is a little bit interesting. Instead of fighting Edwin Van Cleef directly, you fight his Dreadnought, which is beached on the ground. And it uh, has this little targeting reticule, which rotates between the different lanes and bombards them and deals heavy AoE damage. I'm going to immediately capture this meeting stone. I'm going to send a kobold to start gathering gold along the left side. And then I'm not going to place down anything until this targeting reticule is passed. Because if I put things down on the right side at the moment, it's just going to immediately die. So I can put it just past the targeting reticule, sneak Tyrion past, and put Plague Farmer down. The moment, yeah, okay. Stonehoof Tarn has aggro on the tower, so I can immediately drop my skeleton party to start doing damage. Drop a safe pilot to finish off the tower really quickly. And now that I control the tower, the enemy can't put any more units there. I'm also getting kind of blasted by this wolf, but I'm gonna put Stonehoof Tarn to clean that up a little bit. 
Ideally, I should be able to put in a lot of damage here. Yeah, this stacking poison from the Plague Farmer is going to do a lot of work. It's like half the health of that right are taken care of. Take Plague Farmer here, finish off the wolf before it has a chance to do anything. Kobold can get some gold in there. I'm gonna drop Skeleton Party. Since the cannon is fixated on my Stone of Tarin, I can sneak in a ship. Okay, never mind, it's just dead. Wow. Yeah, Plague Farmer does stupidly high damage, uh, especially in the earlier missions, when you're allowed to just sit there and stack up like poisoned really, really high. Um, I think after this I get offered a random cycle unit. Uh, let's see. Alright. Pick this. Yeah, choose a squad troop. So, this, all of these minions are things that they're unbound. They can be dropped anywhere. They contain multiple units, which is why it's called squad. Uh, but they're also, actually, Ch Angry Chickens is not unbound. That is incorrect. Actually, Skeletons is, I I'm stupid. These are cheap units that are, like, come in large groups. I already talked about Angry Chickens. Uh, it comes in, like, a group of one, two, three, nine, I think. Uh, and it's really cheap, and it does a ridiculous amount of damage if it's not taken out with AoE. Uh, Defias Bandits is what I'm going to take here. Defias Bandits is really strong. Skeletons is not terrible either, but Skeletons requires a specific upgrade to actually be worth taking. By default, it only so spawns uh, three Skeletons. It is basically a weaker version of Skeleton Party. It has a few upgrades that makes it decently worth taking in certain situations, but... Until I get those upgrades, it won't be worth taking, so I'm just going to take Defy's Bandit here. Uh, Alright, leveled up. You unlocked guilds, blah blah blah. And I could, in theory, take something out of the store. I'm going to take Quillbor. Quillbor is very good. And we can see here how the grid works. So, I buy Quillbor, and then everything in that section drops down. And now I get new random options. And... Yeah. Uh, I can spend my last bit of experience here before I uh, take a break. Definitely want to upgrade Skeleton Party. While you still have a relatively small collection, you're able to target the experience a little bit better. But, like I said, that kind of becomes a bit more difficult. That's why, like, a lot of the stuff in this game is a little bit deceptive. Because it seems really easy to level up your units early on until you start getting a lot of units. And you stop getting offered a lot of XP things. And the pool becomes ridiculously diluted. Um, if Detective Pikachu asked me for $500 to start a hot sauce company, would you give him the money? <laughs> what a question. Um... I guess if I thought it was a worthy investment, I'd probably do some market research for Detective Pikachu's $500 hot sauce company before I was making that investment. Uh, okay, so... In order to get, like, a lot of the next big upgrades, I would need to finish Duskwood, but that's going to take a little bit longer, so I will be pausing for now, and that is something that I will be doing tomorrow on Twitch. So, the full streaming schedule you can see is pinned uh in the stream chat if you want more information on that you can find it there and i will be streaming on twitch tomorrow saturday and sunday but we'll be doing different things every one of those days so uh yeah uh that is it for today uh i so far i mean i think the start of warcraft rumble is definitely better uh than the rest of the game so I've maybe made the game seem a little bit fun, and that is kind of what a lot of people, I think, have been, like, kind of deceived by. And I kind of want to clearly show how hard it falls off later on, because a lot of people look at, like, the early stuff, and, like, previews and stuff, and they're like, oh, this seems, like, at least slightly enjoyable, but you get really, 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 really fucked. Uh, pretty much around here. The Barons, Ashenvale, 
Dark Shore, and especially Thousand Needles, is where the game basically just says, fuck you. It's uh, pretty brutal. And then it, by the time you get to like the much later missions, Hinterlands, uh, Plague Lands, yeah, that is when it's just really, really, really not great. I actually quite like Ungoro Crater. Uh, most of the higher end zones are a little bit tedious. Ungoro Crater actually has a lot of really cool missions, but it is kind of a uh, a unicorn compared to the other ones. Uh, game actually looks fun at the start, but most shitty mobile games do that. Yeah, it takes a really special mobile game to actually keep that fun going, and one of the only ones I've really encountered is Honkai Star Rail, which is why I will be heavily comparing to it, because I'm still enjoying that game months later. Um, but yeah, that's it for today's stream. Uh, thank you all for coming. I hope some of you show up to the Twitch stream tomorrow, but if not, it's all good. Uh, but either way, I... Man, I can't wait to get to the parts of this game that really fucking suck so I can absolutely tear into them and go on some juicy rants about how garbage the microtransactions is. There is a, a really, really bad bundle coming up in the shop that is like one of the worst things I've seen out of Blizzard in a while. And oh man... I can't wait to talk about that one because it's it is just on a different fucking level of how bad it is. The game looks tough. You should consider starting a hot sauce company with Detective Pikachu. Yeah, maybe that would help. Anyways, thank you everybody for watching. I will catch you tomorrow.